from the tragic deaths of three Girl Scouts in 1977 at the hands of one disgusting prison escapee to this unidentified man who took the lives of three teenagers before leaving a sole survivor behind to tell this terrifying story. We started covering mysteries on this channel in October of last year, and since then we have accrued over 100,000 subscribers. So as thanks and to celebrate this amazing milestone, we'll be covering 100 mysteries in today's video. Some of the mysteries here are truly disgusting, such as the Nigerian organ farm, while others are much more tame, such as the enigmatic Loveland frog. And since this video is so long, you can leave the timestamp of where you left off in the comments as a way to come back to exactly where you left off previously. Because with a video of this length, YouTube always pushes you back by about 10 to 20 minutes from where you actually left off. So all that being said, thank you all so much for 100,000, and I hope you all enjoy this video. The Belmez Faces refers to these odd stains that appeared in a home in Belmez de la Moraleda, which was a village tucked away in Andalusia, Spain. What made these stains so interesting was that they appeared to take the forms of human faces, hence the name. This all began in August of 1971 when a woman named Maria Camara was in her kitchen and saw a stain taking shape out of the corner of her eye. The stain gradually spread through the concrete kitchen floor and once it was complete, the stain resembled a scary looking face. A little creeped out, Maria tried to clean the stain. Using a towel didn't seem to work, so she tried other unconventional ways. Maria yelled for her husband and son, and they proposed the idea that they'll destroy the face with an axe and then re-cement the floor. And you would probably think such extreme measures would get rid of the stain, and it did, but only for a brief amount of time. Not even a week later, the face in the kitchen reappeared, and this time there was more than just one. Word quickly spread and the home eventually earned the name The House of Faces. Neighbors and experts in parapsychology began to flood the house wanting to see the phenomenon with their own eyes. There was a rumor that the house had skeletons inside. Apparently, some people offered to excavate the floor to remove the faces. And once they dug it up, they discovered that there were indeed skeletons underneath the house. That same group then casted a new floor, but again, the faces showed up. This time, it took about two weeks for a fresh face to spawn in. The family ultimately gave up on removing the stains as it was clear that they weren't going to go away. There are many people who believe that the entire incident was a hoax and that the family simply painted the stains with special material that couldn't be washed away. If true, they obviously did this to try and make a profit. I've always known that when you're on the internet, you're vulnerable to having your private information and data stolen or simply exposed, but I had no idea just how easy it was. I simply searched my name on Google and I pulled up so much information about myself. I'm sure most of you are like me and want to protect such sensitive information. And thanks to today's sponsor, Aura, you can do just that. Aura is a specialist when it comes to protecting your identity. They sweep the internet for sites that are listing your information including your address, relatives, phone number, etc., and they remove them. There are data brokers all over the world trying to get their hands on your personal information so that they can sell it to robocallers, spammers, and whoever is willing to pay them money. Data brokers are legally required to remove your information, but they make it very difficult to do so. Aura can do this for you. I was a bit skeptical at first because I thought the setup process was going to be extremely tedious, but I couldn't have been more wrong. Aura Aura is so easy to set up and they have everything located in one place so you don't need three to five different apps or services for your antivirus, password management, identity protection, and did I mention Aura doubles as a VPN as well. They provide an easy to understand comprehensive view of all your private information and how you can protect yourself. I really want you guys to give them a try because privacy just becomes more and more important by the day. You can either let people continue to exploit and profit off your private information information or you can use my link to start your two week free trial today. The link is available in the description or in the pinned comment. Give it a try. After two weeks, if you like it, go ahead and keep using it. Thank you to Aura for sponsoring this video. On December 27, 1991, four-year-old Nikki Campbell went missing after leaving a friend's house. Nikki was accompanied by her five-year-old brother, Matthew. 
They decided to leave at 4.30 p.m. on their bikes to another friend's place, but Matthew said that he was tired and wanted to go back home to bed. Nikki said, okay, that's fine, and went to visit this other friend all alone. Nikki and Matthew's mother, Anne, got home about an hour later and noticed that Nikki was missing. She asked Matthew where his sister was and he told her that Nikki went to play with a friend. But at 7 p.m., there was still no sign of Nikki. Anne began to worry, so she went out to search for her. Matthew took his mother to the house that Nikki was supposed to be at, and once they arrived, they learned that Nikki was never there. Anne called the police and reported Nikki missing at 8pm, and police were able to find her bike in a small area covered with grass. This particular spot was just a couple of blocks from the Campbell family home. Then on the street nearby the bike was a pair of blue socks that appeared to belong to a child, but it was never confirmed whether or not these belonged to Nikki. Using Nikki's scents from the bike, dogs were able to lead investigators to a nearby McDonald's, which then led to Interstate 80. And briefly after entering the highway, the scent was lost. Authorities announced to the public that four-year-old Nikki Campbell was likely abducted, and not long after this announcement, tips started to flood in. One witness said that they saw a screaming child inside of a vehicle that looked just like Nikki. Police scoured the area where the car was seen, but found no trace of the girl. While there wasn't much evidence to work with in Nikki's case, investigators suspected that it may have been tied to other missing children's incidents. You see, Nikki was the fourth girl to disappear in the San Francisco Bay Area in the last four years. Before her were Amber Swartz, Michaela Garrett, and Eileen Michaloff. They were 7, 9, and 13 years old respectively, and they all went missing between 1988 and 1989. And if you take a look further back in time, in 1983 in Antioch, California, a 5-year-old girl named Angela Bouguet, who was found murdered. And here is the interesting part. One of the bloodhounds led investigators to Angela's grave when they were trying to track down Nikki. There was this man named Tim Bidner who visited the grave over 90 times a year. The scent then led from the grave to Tim's car. After further investigation into Tim, police discovered that he was sending weird letters to a 12-year-old that lived in the same neighborhood as Nikki. Additionally, he sent a Christmas card to an FBI profiler that had an image of a girl holding up four fingers, possibly hinting at the age of his next victim. Tim was named the prime suspect a year after Dickie's disappearance. His home was subsequently searched and he chose to remain silent throughout the entire procedure. However, officers took note of his violent shaking. Investigators discovered dog tags with the names of the missing girls etched onto them. And although this is very suspicious, there wasn't any evidence that would 100% without a doubt tie him to the actual disappearances. Tim later filed a defamation lawsuit against the city of Fairfield, where he settled for $90,000 out of court. While Tim was the most likely suspect, he was never charged for Nikki's disappearance and maintains his innocence. Nikki's kidnapper and her whereabouts are still unknown. During the 1990s in Japan, there was a trend where shows based on mysteries surged in popularity. The show that we'll be looking at today was called Tante Night Scoop, or Detective Night Scoop. This show in particular didn't niche down to a particular subset of mysteries, but instead, they encouraged their viewers to send in requests of pretty much any mystery that they would like to see get covered. These mysteries could be about ghosts, murders, or even scams. One of the strangest requests was for the group to investigate a lost Colonel Sanders statue that was apparently dumped in some river. One episode that aired in March of 1992 was focused on a seemingly uneventful topic. A comedian named Masa was selected to be the host of this episode. The request took them to Osaka and described a creepy arrangement of packing ropes tied to guardrails and telephone poles. At first, there were only a few, but as the weeks went by, more and more of these ropes just appeared. The residents began to speak amongst themselves, asking each other who left these ropes and for what reason. But it seemed that nobody knew the answer to either of those questions. Which is very odd since this particular area in Osaka was known to be pretty dense and busy, so how exactly was the culprit avoiding detection? Masa gets the idea to ask some hardware stores in the area if they had any packing ropes left. However, the shop owners had no idea who the person was. When examining the ropes, Masa noticed that they seemed to be grouped in one general area. But then he realized that they almost acted as a trail which, when followed, took Masa to a dark alleyway where thousands and thousands of ropes covered every inch of visible surface. 
If he had to guess, he thought that there were 300,000 or more ropes in that spot alone. This really shook Masa and he turned to leave immediately. Afterwards, he said that he did not want to continue the investigation and on screen right before the video ended, the following statement was issued. We will not be reporting on any further information regarding this case. Thank you for your understanding. This entry sort of doubles as a lost media subject as the original footage of the episode is missing. There are only limited transcripts and a few screen grabs available. According to some, the entire video found its way on YouTube a number of times, but was shortly deleted after uploading. Some viewers of the original episode claimed that when Masa entered the alleyway, the cameraman turned away from the ropes for a brief moment, and when they turned back around, at least a few hundred more ropes spawned in. There were a few posts made on some Japanese websites that said an elderly woman was roaming the area and tying the ropes. This idea was further supported when another host of the show claimed that they attempted to interview a woman in the area about the ropes but were unable to since she seemed to be delusional and out of her mind. She mumbled stuff like, I have to tie the ropes, couldn't stop tying them. But to my understanding, the identity of this woman was never revealed. This entry refers to one of the most notorious series of murders that were committed in Belgium from the early 1980s to the mid-1980s. The Brabant killers were responsible for the deaths of 28 people and injuring 22 others. These casualties occurred in the midst of various robberies that typically involved low-value items such as groceries. Another strange aspect of these killings is that the people responsible seemed to go out of their way to incite a fight with the police instead of focusing on their escape. But their proficiency proved that they didn't need to allocate all of their focus on evading authorities. The robbers displayed high levels of skill and investigators suspected that they had military backgrounds. The vehicles that the killers used were modified with high-powered automatic and military-grade weapons as well. It is believed that there were three main figures within the group who were nicknamed the Giant, the Killer, and the Old Man. Then there was a roster of support characters. There was never concise evidence to prove this, but many believe that one if not several of the killers worked in the police force. In 1982, there were five incidents that focused on the Brabant killers. On March 13th, two men stole a 10-gauge fouling shotgun, then on May 10th, an Austin Allegro was stolen at gunpoint and later ditched in the same day. On August 14th, there was an armed robbery on a grocery store where food and wine were stolen. In this particular confrontation, two French police were wounded. On September 30th, there was another armed robbery, this time on a weapons dealer. Fifteen guns were stolen and a police officer was killed and three others severely wounded. In late December, another robbery was done on a restaurant where the sole employee at the time was tortured and killed. In 1983, there were a total of 12 crimes committed by this group two of which were in January, three in February, one in March, one in May, two in September, two in October, and one on December 1st. There were several more robberies in the following years, but in November of 1986, investigators made an important discovery. Tucked inside of a canal were tons of weapons and tools that the gang used for their crimes. But there was intense drama as a result of this discovery. Apparently, this location was already searched in the past with nothing to show for it. So, some officials believed that the ones that led the search that did result in the weapons were manipulating the investigations. The identities of the giant, the killer, and the old man have never been revealed and the fact that this group was able to get away with killing and robbing repeatedly continues to baffle people to this day. On April 11th 12th 1981 in Keddy, California, there was a gruesome quadruple homicide involving Glenna Sharp, her son John, her daughter Tina, and John's friend Dana Wingate. And Glenna was often just called Sue, so that's what I will be referring to her as for this entry. The group was staying at a place known as the Keddy Resort in cabin number 28, which is now just an empty lot. Sue had recently gone through a messy breakup with her husband, where the couple agreed that Sue would take the kids. She was also a mother of five. Money was tight, so she decided to rent one of the cabins in Keddie. 
On the morning of the 12th, Sue's 14-year-old daughter, Sheila, returned to the cabin after spending the night at a friend's. When the girl stepped inside, she discovered the lifeless bodies of her mother Sue, John, and Dana. And don't worry, I have not forgotten about Tina. She will be brought up later on. Two of the younger kids, Rick and Greg, as well as their friend, were also inside the cabin when the three were murdered, but they were unharmed. As for Tina, she couldn't be found anywhere. It actually took about three years before authorities found her remains around Feather Falls. The killer or killers were never identified. In the past, Ketty Resort was a popular destination, but in the late 1970s, the resort had taken a turn for the worse financially. Most of the cabins were run down and were rented out to low-income households. Sue and her kids were moving to the area from Connecticut in July 1979. Initially, Sue was staying with her brother named Don. From there, Sue moved her family into a tiny trailer in Quincy, before moving yet again to cabin 28 in Ketty. It was 11.30 a.m. on April 11th, 1981, when Sue, Sheila, and Greg drove to Quincy to pick up Rick, who was at baseball tryouts. And it just so happened that on this drive, they would encounter John and Dana, who were hitchhiking their way back to Ketty. Sue went ahead and dropped them off at their destination, where they later hitchhiked back to Quincy to meet up with some friends in the downtown area. After picking up Rick, Sue drove the kids back home, where Sheila left at 8 p.m. to stay the night with her friend. Now, Tina was actually at that same house Sheila was headed towards, so when Sheila got there, she told Tina that their mom wanted her back home by 10 p.m., and it wasn't until 7 a.m. when Sheila got back to cabin 28 to find her mother, brother, and Dana dead. Sheila immediately sprinted back to her friend's house and told the adults what had happened. She added that two of her brothers and one of their friends were still at the house, so one of the adults rushed over to that cabin and grabbed them. When authorities arrived at the crime scene, they discovered two knives and a hammer covered in blood. One of the two knives had been bent at a 30 degree angle. Sue's body was left partially clothed and a blue bandana as well as her underwear were used as a gag on her. Sue and John were determined to have died from knife wounds while Dana was strangled. Investigators were able to come up with a variety of suspects over the years, one of which was Sue's husband, James. James was known to have a bad temper and lash out in rage when he didn't get his way. There was also a man named Martin Smart who was friends with Sue's husband and also stayed in one of the Ketty cabins on the night of April 11th. He too had a history of being violent, and he later failed a polygraph test in regards to these murders. But before he could be charged with anything, he died of cancer in the year 2000. There were several key issues when it came to investigating the case, one of which was the compromised crime scene and evidence. It took authorities too long to adequately secure the area, and thus many aspects of the crime scene may have been altered. Authorities went door to door questioning the other residents of the resort, and the couple inside of Cabin 16 stated that they heard what sounded like muffled screaming around 1am. When they first heard it, they didn't know what it was, but after being told that three people were murdered, they said that it had to have been the victims screaming for help. The phone of Cabin 28 had been ripped off of its hook and the cord was torn apart. Police couldn't detect any signs of forced entry and if you recall, one of the suspects I mentioned was named Martin Smart. When police questioned him, he said that one of his hammers had gone missing. The family that Sheila was staying with said that they noticed a green van parked nearby Cabin 28 just before 9pm. They have never seen this vehicle in the area before. As for the three boys who survived, they had inconsistent accounts of the events. At first, Justin said that he only dreamed up his account of the murder, which he later admitted was a lie, and in reality, he actually witnessed the entire thing. It was only when Justin was hypnotized when he started to provide some vital information. He said he was sleeping in the same room as Rick and Greg and began to hear noises in the living room. When he opened up the door just a bit to take a peek, he said he saw Sue with two unknown men. One had short hair while the other had long hair. Both wore glasses and the one with the short hair had a mustache. John and Dana then stepped into the living room not knowing what was going on, and that's when everyone started yelling at each other. A brawl followed and one of the men grabbed Tina and took off with her from the back door of the cabin. With the details Justin provided, composite sketches were released to the public. The culprits were believed to be in their 20s to 30s. One of them was about 6 feet tall with dark blonde hair, while the other was about 5 foot 6 to 5 foot 9 inches tall with black hair. And on the night of the murders, they were both wearing glasses. 
One rumor that began to spread was that the murders may have been a result of Dana stealing LSD. However, there really wasn't any evidence to support this, and despite obtaining blood, footprints, and hair samples from the crime scene, investigators were unable to put together a conclusive identity to the suspects. In regards to Tina, the FBI issued a public statement that she was abducted. But on April 29th, 1981, the FBI halted their search efforts, saying that the California State Department of Justice was doing an adequate job and the FBI wasn't necessary. It took another three years before Tina was found. On April 22nd, 1984, a bottle collector called police saying that he found fragments of what he believed was a skull, as well as part of a jaw near Feather Falls. This location was about 100 miles from Keddie. The Butt County Sheriff's Office issued a state regarding this discovery and at the time they didn't identify who the skull belonged to. Not long after this discovery, an anonymous caller contacted the police and told them that it was Tina. It took two additional months before forensic pathologists confirmed that the skull fragments and the jaw did indeed belong to her. In that same area, police also found a blue jacket, a pair of Levi jeans, a blanket, and a medical tape dispenser. There was a documentary regarding the murders released in 2008. In this documentary, the wife of Martin Smart claimed that her husband and a friend of his known as John Bobadet were the killers. According to her, the three were at a bar, but she decided to go home early. Instead of going with her, Martin and John stayed at the bar. Then at 2am on the 12th, she said that she saw the two burning stuff on the stove. In the same documentary, a police officer who interviewed both men stated that both Martin and John were innocent. But there was a lot of criticism about how the investigation was being conducted. Furthermore, there were confession letters and a therapist that claimed that the men confessed to the murders. But nevertheless, the two men were never charged. The Wednesday Strangler is the name given to an unidentified serial killer from Japan whose reign lasted from 1975 to 1989. Six of the seven victims went missing on Wednesday, hence the name. All of them were women and none of them were found alive. The bodies of the 5th, 6th, and 7th victims were found a group together in Kitagata in 1989. The identity of the murderer remains unknown and the statute of limitations expired for 4 out of the 7 murders. The murders took place in Kitagata, Shiroishi, and Kita Shigayasu in the Saga Prefecture. The first victim was a 12-year-old middle schooler who was all alone at home on August 27, 1975. Her body would remain undiscovered for nearly half a decade. In June of 1980, some workers opened up the septic tank of a toilet at an elementary school in Shiroishi to reveal the lifeless body of the victim. The second victim was 20 years old and lived in Shiroishi as well. She disappeared on April 12th, 1980 and was also found in a septic tank on June 24th of the same year. Now, I do want to be clear, I am not sure if this is the same location as the previous victim that we went over. The text that I read was translated and as you all probably know, a lot of times the translations can be skewed and provide inaccurate or vague information. But anyways, this second victim was the only one who was not abducted on a Wednesday. The third woman to disappear was also a resident of Shiroishi and worked in a factory. They went missing on October 27th, 1981 at the age of 27. Just two weeks after her disappearance, she was found strangled to death at a vacant lot in Nakabara. The fourth victim was abducted on February 17th, 1982 and was just 11 years old. Her body was found the very next day, strangled to death. On July 8th, 1987, another woman was killed. She was a 48-year-old restaurant employee and was found at the base of a cliff in Kitagata on January 27th, 1989. And if you recall, at the beginning, I mentioned that the 5th, 6th, and 7th victims were all found together. At that exact cliff location were also the bodies of a 50-year-old housewife and a 37-year-old office worker, both of whom were from Kitagawa. In November of 1989, there was a 26-year-old man held in prison who wrote a letter confessing to these murders. But not long after issuing that letter, he took it all back, saying that it wasn't actually true. But regardless, he was taken to court and charged just six hours before the statute of limitations expired for one of the murders. However, the man was deemed not guilty due to a lack of evidence. The judge also claimed that the police had influenced the prisoner to write a letter confessing to the crimes, just for the sake of charging someone. 
From August 2020 to April 2021 in Little Rock, Arkansas, there were four gruesome knife attacks which resulted in three deaths. This series of killings is quite recent relative to most of the cases we cover which adds an extra layer of intrigue and creepiness to this case. On Monday, August 24th, 2020, someone called police on the 2200 block of South Gaines Street. The caller was breathing heavily and urged police to hurry. When they arrived, they were greeted with the body of a 64-year-old man named Larry McChristian, who went missing just a couple of days ago. Little is known about Larry, but he was born on October 23rd, 1955 and lived about two and a half hours from Little Rock. The person who discovered Larry's body was walking through the neighborhood at 2 a.m. and just noticed what looked like a person lying in the yard. They called out to him and gave them a little nudge, but the body didn't respond. Larry's body was taken by medical officials in order to perform an autopsy, but investigators were already confident that his death was a result of foul play. Police went to every house in the neighborhood in hopes that someone may have heard or seen something. And luckily for them, there was a home that had security cameras set up that overlooked a portion of the yard where Larry was found. One woman living in the neighborhood said, It seems the person who stabbed Mr. McChristian came north. The person stabbed him on Gaines Street and walked away and came back and stabbed him again and stood there while he died. The thing that's so scary is that it seems to be so random and there doesn't seem to be any relationship to normal activity on this street. So now we know that Larry wasn't killed prior and then dumped off in the neighborhood. But that begs the question, why was he even there? Remember, Larry lived over two hours away. In just a few weeks, another murder took place. It was September 23rd, 2020. A man named Jeff Welch was preparing for his friend's arrival at his home. The friend arrived at Jeff's a little past 3 a.m. He made his way up the driveway and prepared to knock on the door. When out of the corner of his eye, he noticed his friend slouching on the front porch. He shook Jeff and quickly realized that he wasn't breathing. Police arrived on the scene quickly and noticed that Jeff had a number of puncture wounds along his neck. Initially, there was some debate on whether these wounds were a result of a killer or if they were some strange phenomenon. Authorities soon came to an agreement that Jeff was indeed killed by a person around 2 a.m. on September 23rd, and at the time, investigators didn't immediately connect the death of Jeff with Larry. It was only after the murder of Marion Franklin when authorities finally suspected that perhaps all of the knife attacks were connected. In April, there were two knife attacks where a woman named Deborah Walker survived and the other, Marion, was not as fortunate. Along with the announcement that the killings may have been linked, police issued some camera footage of the killer. It is believed that the released footage was from 2020 with Larry's death and 2021 with Deborah's attack. Not long after this news, police received well over 50 different phone calls with tips regarding the case in less than 24 hours. The community then dubbed the serial killer as the Little Rock Slasher, but he is also commonly known as the River City Ripper or Jack the Knife. In the footage, he was seen with a dark hoodie and dark pants and gloves. Police are relatively confident that the killer is a resident of the area or at the very least, frequents the Little Rock neighborhood. When you zoom out and take a look at the locations of all the attacks, you will notice that they all happened within a three mile radius of each other. Another commonality between all of the killings is that they took place early in the morning between 1 and 4 a.m. Most likely, he is an opportunity killer as the victims didn't share anything in common. But but perhaps he is only after people that are a bit older since his youngest victim was 40 years old. Investigators aren't exactly sure when he will strike again as it seems that the killer does take breaks, which can be observed in the second and third attacks. The killer is still at large and authorities are actively searching for the man now labeled as the Little Rock Slasher. The Gebeline Man refers to a mummy that was buried around 3500 BC or possibly earlier in Gebeline. And he is by most accounts one of the most well-preserved people from ancient Egypt. He was stored at the British Museum's collection for over a century, but in 2012, he was removed in order to be CAT scanned. The results determined that the man died quite young at about 18 to 22 years old. But the most shocking discovery was the fact that he died of a stab wound in his back. There was even damage to his shoulder blade and ribs. It's going to be nearly impossible to determine this mummy's identity or the reason why he was murdered.
All the way back in January of 1322, a man named Philip Ashenden met his doom in a very peculiar fashion. Allegedly, what happened was Philip and a friend had visited a restroom and the friend had accidentally peed on an unknown boy's shoes. And for whatever reason, this kid was holding a pole axe. It's unclear how old this boy was, but people guess that it can be anywhere from 8 to 16 years in age. The boy yelled at the man for the mess, but he didn't care and he actually punched the kid. Philip then shoved his friend and said, what is wrong with you? William, in a fit of rage, grabbed the poleaxe from the boy and struck Philip in the head. He was rushed to the hospital, but unfortunately, the strike was strong enough to actually hit his brain. This entry is pretty obscure and thus doesn't have a very large following, but there is a strange fixation on the identity of the boy carrying the poleaxe. The monster with 21 faces was the moniker given to a group that blackmailed several Japanese companies during the mid-1980s. One of these companies is Izaki Glico, which was an international food company in Osaka, who produced various products including famous candies such as Pocky. The story begins in the middle of March 1984 with the president of Izaki Glico, Katsuhisa Izaki, resting at home. Izaki decided that he wanted to take a bath before going to bed. Just next door was Izaki's mother who lived by herself. Right as she was preparing to head to bed, two unidentified men in ski masks broke into her home at 9pm brandishing guns. Fearing for her life, Izaki's mother listened to all of their requests. She was tied up and left in a location where the two men knew she couldn't escape. Izaki's mother suspected that the men just wanted money, but no. Instead, they had no intentions to harm the woman or take her money. All they wanted was a key to the house next door, her son's house where he lived with his wife and three kids. Using the key, the men burst into the home and tied up Izaki's wife and daughter before scouring the home in search of Izaki himself. As for the other two children, they were fast asleep and the two men did not bother subduing them. Izaki was found in the bathroom and he immediately tried to fight the men off, but he quickly calmed down after being told that his family wouldn't be harmed as long as he listened to them. They led Izaki outside and into a vehicle nearby where they raced off into the night. The next day, a ransom note was found in a phone booth near the Izaki household that demanded a payment of 1 billion yen or over 6.5 million US dollars today. Additionally, the abductors demanded over a million USD worth of gold bullion. Then, just a few days after Izaki's abduction, Izaki found his way back to his home. He was able to escape from a warehouse in the Osaka city of Ibaraki where Izaki claimed he was being held. Police questioned Izaki, but he didn't really have much information to provide. He was able to lead authorities back to where he came from, and after searching the warehouse, there weren't any clues leading to the identity of the culprits. Izaki informed police that a cover was placed over his head for the majority of the time and that the kidnappers told him his 8 year old daughter was with them, which was a lie. Over the course of hours, Izaki was able to loosen the rope bindings around his wrists and ultimately break free. Furthermore, he said that he believed the culprits were only using toy guns. After his escape, the mysterious group made their next move on April 10th, 1984. The group set fire to a number of vehicles in the Izaki Glico Company parking lot, which was later followed by a second fire. And less than a week after that first fire, the group sent a package with a container of hydrochloric acid to the company. Inside that same package was a letter which said, To the stupid police, are you idiots? If you are pros, you would catch us. Because you guys have such a high handicap, we're going to give you some hints. The letter then stated the color of the vehicle that carried away Izaki. It was gray. They also said that they shopped at a well-known supermarket franchise near the area before threatening to kidnap the head of police. This was the first time the group acknowledged themselves as the Monster with 21 Faces. After sending out this letter, the group known as the Monster with 21 Faces began threatening several other companies with similar letters. Not only that, they stated that they had laced several Glico products with potassium cyanide. The food company was forced to recall all of its products which totaled to well over $20 million. The group continued issuing letters to the companies and police, one of which said, Dear dumb police officers, don't tell a lie. All crimes begin with a lie as we say in Japan. Don't you know that? You thought you could fool us, dressed in your nice businessmen's blue suits, acting like salarymen, but those shifty eyes gave you away. Another letter also addressed to the police read, Why don't you keep it to yourself? You seem to be at a loss. 
so why not let us help you? We'll give you a clue. We entered the factory by the front gate. The typewriter we used is Panwriter. The plastic container used was a piece of street garbage. This was referencing the package containing the acid. There was one moment where authorities believed that they had identified one of the members of the group. A camera had captured a man wearing a Yomi Uri Giants baseball hat in a convenience store. He was seen stocking shelves with Glico candy, but after releasing this footage to the public and urging people to come forward with info, the man was never identified. In a shocking turn of events, the monster with 21 faces seemed to have called off their attacks. On June 26, 1984, a new letter was received by the press which was addressed to our fans throughout Japan. The letter said, The president of Glico has already gone around with his head hanging down long enough. We would like to forgive him. Japan has gotten terribly hot and humid. So when our work is done, we want to go to Europe. Geneva, Paris, London. We'll be in one of those places. Let's bring Pocky, the traveler's friend. Delicious Glico products, we're eating them too. See you in January of next year. While this letter made it seem as though the group was ready to retire, they were simply shifting their focus from Glico elsewhere. The other companies that they began targeting included Morinaga, House Foods, and Marudai Ham. Around the same time when they announced that they would stop harassing Glico, they told Marudai that they'd also leave them alone if they paid a $250,000 ransom. The police came up with a plan where an officer would meet up with a member of the Monster with 21 Faces to exchange the cash. On January 28, 1984, an officer disguised as a Marudai employee took a train to Kyoto. He was told to look for a white flag and as soon as he saw it, he was supposed to toss the cash outside. On the train, this officer recalled a suspicious looking man watching him the entire time. This mysterious figure was large with short hair, glasses, and eyes that resembled a fox. The officer continued to keep his eyes focused on the outside in order to catch the white flag, but it never popped up. When the train reached Kyoto, the officer got off and took the next train back to Osaka. The fox-eyed man did the same. On the way back to Osaka, the officer informed his peers that there was a man tailing him and to keep track of him when they got off at Osaka. But when they got there, the fox-eyed man was lost. They couldn't identify him, but at the very least, police now had someone that they could call their primary suspect. The group continued to harass various companies, and one botched operation led to the firing of Shoji Yamamoto, who was a 59-year-old police superintendent in the Shiga Prefecture. He felt immense shame due to this, so on August 7th, 1985, he lit himself on fire, ultimately ending his own life. Then, on August 12th, 1985, the group sent what seemed to be their final letter. Yamamoto of Shiga Prefecture Police died. How stupid of him. We've got no friends or secret hiding place in Shiga. It's Yoshino or Shikata who should have died. What have they been doing for as long as one year and five months? Don't let the bad guys like us get away with it. There are many more fools who want to copy us. No career Yamamoto died like a man, so we decided to give our condolences. We decided to forget about torturing food making companies. If anyone blackmails any of these companies, it's not us, but someone copying us. We are bad guys. That means we've got more to do other than bullying companies. It's fun to lead a bad man's life. From that point on, the group was never heard from again. Throughout the entirety of the investigation, authorities have only ever released the name of one suspect. That being Manabu Miyazaki. Manabu was believed to be the fox-eyed man. About a decade prior to the harassment caused by the monster with 21 faces, Miyazaki was at odds with the Glico company. He was involved in various whistleblowing events within Glico and even supported a labor dispute there as well. But he did provide a solid alibi which virtually cleared him of any accusations. The group did mention that they had other things to do besides bullying these companies, so that made many investigators believe that perhaps Perhaps this organization was much larger than they had originally thought. Warminster is a small town in western Wiltshire, England and lies about two hours west of London. Despite its unassuming facade, Warminster gained international fame in the 1960s due to a series of bizarre events related to UFOs. The first event was reported in the 1930s, which more or less predated the UFO craze. Residents mentioned unusual sounds resembling crackling or branches being dragged over gravel. Around the 1960s, local journalist Arthur Shuttlewood published an article in the Warminster Journal. 
recounting a resident's experience of strange noises on Christmas morning. This event marked the beginning of a wave of similar reports. Letters from dozens of residents poured into the Warminster Journal describing encounters with unusual sounds and sights in the region, fueling the UFO craze. Sightings ranged from bright lights and unconventional shapes in the night sky to bizarre figures and unexplained animal behavior. One resident, Gordon Faulkner, even captured a blurry photograph of a saucer-like craft, which added substance to the growing narrative. The town hall meeting held in August 1965 turned into a platform for residents to share their experiences. As the sightings continued, rumors spread, including reports of mass bird deaths and mutilated animals. Despite skepticism, these rumors added to the town's intrigue. By August 1965, Warminster's population had nearly doubled, with enthusiasts and skeptics flocking to the town. Even Arthur Shuttlewood, the initial skeptic, claimed to have experienced a close encounter. The British UFO Research Association, or BUFORA, became involved, investigating the sightings. The frenzy gradually waned, but Warminster's reputation as the British UFO capital endured. In 2015, a conference marked the 50th anniversary of the original sightings, drawing enthusiasts and experts worldwide. To this day, Warminster remains a place of mystery, with occasional sightings renewing interest in the town's extraordinary history. This entry takes us to 2016, where a mysterious group or possibly single person made it clear how dangerous cybercrime had the potential to be. This group called themselves the Shadow Brokers, and they released over a gigabyte worth of highly sensitive information that belonged to entities such as the NSA. This event marked the first of its kind on such a scale and immediately plastered the group all over the headlines across the world. As far as the public knows, the Shadow Brokers never utilized the information they obtained in any sort of cyber attack, but instead, they just auctioned the information off and even created a subscription service for it. No one has any idea who they are or why they decided to offload the information the way they did. Pretty much every nation was suspected of possibly being responsible. One of the prime suspects was China as they were regarded as one of the largest threats to the US. Other nations included Russia and North Korea. Then there was the possibility that it was an American citizen that stole this information. One detail investigators pointed towards was the broken English in the messages sent by the shadow brokers. The words used were spelled correctly, however, the sentences were structured incorrectly. Linguistic analysts stated that even though there were grammatical errors, a low-level English speaker wouldn't even know how to make said errors. What this could mean is that the errors were intentionally made in an attempt to sound like a foreigner. The combination of perfect spelling and extremely incorrect sentence structure just didn't make much sense. The shadow brokers have in large part remained silent. Some speculate that this is because they have sold off all of the information that they have obtained, while others believe that the group is simply waiting for the right opportunity to make another move. Then there's the theory that the NSA had already captured the hacker or hackers, but chose not to release that info to the public. Israel Keyes was born on January 7, 1978 in Richmond, Utah. The town is quite small, with about 3,000 people living there today. Keyes has gone down as one of the most infamous serial killers in US history. He was born into a large Mormon family where he was one of 10 kids. The parents were very protective and sheltered their children to the extreme, which may have played a role in shaping Keyes' personality. Later into his life, the family moved to Washington State, specifically Colville. Immediately after moving to the area, the family started visiting a church called The Ark, which was well known in the area for having racist ideologies and is believed to have greatly affected Keyes' impressionable mind. One of their neighbors had a son named Chevy Kehoe, who grew up to be a violent white supremacist and criminal. The man was truly disgusting and just to oversimplify things and keep things short, he murdered his wife and 8 year old daughter. Other members of Chevy's family were very similar and actually there were many people in town that were rather unstable. Keyes essentially followed in these guys' footsteps as he got older. He adored violence and let out his harmful pent up habits on animals. 
There was a 12-year-old girl named Julie Harris who lived in Colville at the same time as Keyes. Julie was a double amputee and a Special Olympics champion. In 1996, she went missing. Initially, people thought that it was Julie's mother's boyfriend who was responsible for her disappearance. She was later found dead next to a river. Later on, Keyes would become the primary suspect, however, he never admitted or denied being the culprit. He was about 18 years old at the time, and this is around when he started to visibly show an interest in serial killers like Ted Bundy. It was also around this age when Keyes moved out, but it's a bit unclear whether he did this alone or with family. He found himself in New York where he was able to get a hold of a large chunk of land. It is unknown how exactly he acquired it. One summer in the late 1990s, there was a group of teens intertubing near the Deschutes River. Keyes just so happened to be in the area and was keeping a close eye on the group, waiting for one of them to be alone. Eventually, a girl around 14 to 17 years old isolated herself. And the details from here are essentially unknown, but Keyes was able to kidnap this girl. He admitted to her before letting her go. Now, the thing is, the identity of this girl is unknown, reason being is that she never reported the incident. The story could very well be entirely made up by Keyes, but according to him, it was the first time he committed a crime. Keyes would later join the US Army, but he never admitted to committing any crimes during his service. In 2001, he was honorably discharged and he decided to move back to Washington. He found himself in a small fishing town known as Nia Bay, which had a predominantly Native American population. Keyes eventually met a woman there who he had a daughter with, and according to most people, he seemed to be a normal person contributing to society. However, this was far from the truth. After the birth of his daughter, Keyes sort of switched up his targets and no longer attacked children. Instead, he focused on adults, specifically without any children. He admitted to killing one person after July of 2001, but Keyes refused to say who or where. And between 2001 and 2005, he also admitted to killing a couple. Keyes implied that he had buried the couple in a valley and had used their own car to leave their burial location. Then in the years 2005 and 2006, Keyes killed again. But once more, he was stingy with the details and didn't reveal his victims' names. Keyes shared that he used his boat to get rid of the bodies. He said that he dumped them somewhere around Crescent Lake. But after extensive searching, nothing was found. In 2007, Keyes left Nia Bay and moved towards Alaska where he made several stops along the way. When he arrived in Alaska, he built a reputation as a normal person using his skills as a tradesman. Then he moved yet again in 2008 and it was at this time when Keyes prepared what he called murder kits. These kits carried cash, weapons, and other tools to assist with killing and disposing of his victims. He had them buried all over the locations that he frequented. It wasn't until the early 2010s when Keyes was finally subdued. His final target was a woman named Samantha Koenig, who was 18 years old. A security camera recorded her working and cleaning up in a coffee stand on the night of February 1st. A man in a ski mask pulled up to the coffee stand asking for a drink. When Samantha was done, Keyes pointed a gun at her. From there, he zip-dyed her and told her that he was planning for the town to come up with a large sum of money in order to get Samantha back. Keyes made several stops before bringing Samantha back to his house where he raped her before taking her life. Authorities were quick to spread the word about Samantha's disappearance and eventually, some Texas Highway Patrolmen pulled over Keyes since he looked like their suspect. Inside of Keyes' vehicle was Samantha's phone and debit card. And remember, at this time, nobody knew of Keyes and his actions. It was only after he was arrested and police started questioning him when they began to realize just what exactly they had stumbled upon. Investigators have no idea just how many people Keyes has killed. Some investigators believe it could go into the hundreds. He ultimately took his own life on December 2nd, 2012. With this act of cowardice, he took all of his secrets with him. Keyes went down as one of the most intelligent and strategic serial killers in history, and before his death, he left behind a note. The note said the following, and just an FYI, there were a number of spelling mistakes and illegible words in the note, so if there are any instances where the sentence doesn't really make any sense, that's why. 
Where will you go, you clever little worm, if you bleed your host dry? Back in your ride, the night is still young. Streetlights push back the black eyed neat rows. Off to the right, a graveyard appears. Lines of stones, bodies molder below. Turn away quick, bob your head to the seat. As straight through that stop sign, you roll a loaded truck with lights off slams into you broadside. Your flesh smashed as metal explodes. You may have been free, you loved living your lie. Fate had its own scheme, crushed like a bug, you still die. Soon, now, you'll join those ranks of dead or your ashes the wind will soon blow. Family and friends will shed a few tears, pretend it's off to heaven you go. But the reality is, you were just bones and meat and with your brain died also your soul. Send the dying to wait for their death in the comfort of retirement homes. Quietly, quickly, say it's for the best. It's best for you so their fate you'll not know. Turn a blind eye back to the screen, soak in your reality shows. Stand in front of your mirror and you preen, in a plastic castle you call home. Land of the free, land of the lie, land of scheme Americanize. Consume what you don't need, stars you idolize. Pursue what you admit is a dream, then it's American die. Get in your big car so you can get to work fast on roads made of dinosaur bones. Punch in on the clock and sit on your ass, playing stupid ass games on your phone. Paper on your wall says you got smarts. The test you took told you so. But you would still crawl like the vermin you are once your precious power grid's blown. Land of the free, land of the lie, land of the scheme Americanize. Now that I have you held tight, I will tell you a story. Speak soft in your ear so you know that it's true. You're my love at first sight, and though you're scared to be near me, my words penetrate your thoughts now in an intimate prelude. I looked into your eyes, they were so dark, warm, and trusting, as though you had not a worry or care. The more the game, the better potential to fill up those pools with your fear, your face framed in dark curls like a portrait. The sun shone through highlights of red. What color, I wonder, and how straight will it turn, plastered back with the sweat of your blood. There will be no more laughter here. I feel your body tense up, my hand now on your shoulder, your eyes. Forget the lady called Luck. She does not abide near me, for her powers don't extend to those who are dead. Let you be the master of your own fate, knowing full well what's at stake. My pretty captive butterfly, colorful wings my hand smears. I somehow repaint them with punishment and tears. Violent metamorphosis, emerge my dark moth princess. I will come often and worship on the altar of your flesh. You shudder with revulsion and try to shrink far from me. I'll have you tied down and begging to become my Stockholm sweetie. Okay, talk is over, words are placid and weak. Back it with action or it all comes off cheap. Watch close while I work now, feel the electric shock of my touch. Open my trembling flower or your petals I'll crush. Near the Ohio River is a small town called Point Pleasant that was originally created as a military base in the 1770s. The town was well known for the battles that have taken place there, but in November of 1966, the town gradually developed a new reputation. A traveling salesman named Woodrow Derenberger was driving on Interstate 77 back home. He lived in a town called Mineral Wells, which was about an hour from Point Pleasant. During that drive home, Woodrow claimed that he was stopped by this hovering vehicle that resembled a car but was not one. The vehicle had super bright lights and cut him off abruptly, causing Woodrow to slam on his brakes. That's when this humanoid being stepped out and communicated with Woodrow telepathically. It told Woodrow that his name was Cold, and through the entire exchange, the quote-unquote alien kept this creepy smile which later earned him the name The Grinning Man. Now, most would discount Woodrow's words as fantasy, but when more and more people claim that they saw similar strange anomalies, it gets you thinking. On November 12th, a group of gravediggers in Clendenin said they saw a huge winged creature take off from a bundle of trees. This creature almost looked like a man, but it had wings. It gained speed fast and fled the area. This particular creature would go on to be known as the Mothman. Just three days after that encounter, a married couple named Roger and Linda were visiting a portion of woods located outside of Point Pleasant that was previously used to stockpile explosives for the military. This location became known as the TNT area. As Roger and Linda were headed towards the woods in their car, they noticed a being with massive wings, almost like a bat's, flying around a power plant. Out of fear, the couple turned around and drove away, but the creature flew towards them. Roger claimed that it flew right above the car for a few minutes before leaving. Then just a few hours before that, a man named Newell Partridge was at home watching TV when his dog started barking at the barn. 
It was getting late and Newell decided to investigate the area to see just what was bothering his dog so much. He exited the home with a flashlight and his German Shepherd. Once he got close to the barn, Newell lifted up his flashlight to reveal a pair of big red eyes hiding inside. This freaked him out and he ran back inside to get his gun, but when he returned to the barn, the creature was missing and so was his dog. It is believed that Newell and the couple saw the exact same beast as they both reported that it had what appeared to be wings as well as radiant red eyes. Another strange occurrence in the area happened on December 15th, 1967. Around 5pm, the silver bridge which loomed over the Ohio River collapsed. This just so happened to be rush hour. All of the vehicles stuck on the bridge dropped into the freezing river. In the end, 46 people died, two of whom were never found. Now, this may be an over-romanticized narrative that news outlets drummed up, but all of the strange sightings along with the collapse of this bridge led people to believe that something sinister was occurring in the town. Grave robbing for morons is an obscure piece of media that has an aura of mystery surrounding it. It was originally discovered as part of a box set of home movies, which included four different films that all carry a sense of mystery. One of the films was later debunked as a parody film created by Huck Botko, who was one of the writers for The Last Exorcism. Because of this, some people have proposed the idea that perhaps a grave robbing for morons is also just a dark parody movie and nothing more. So first things first, we don't know if this film is genuine or not. It follows a young man as he returns from digging up a graveyard, and according to some experts, the details found in the film are shockingly accurate. For example, the skull that he is seen holding more or less resembles the real thing. The man in the film states that his name is Anthony, which eventually led internet sleuths to a man named Anthony Kasamasima who confessed to a 15 year long run of grave robbing. However, he was 40 years old when he accidentally confessed, which would mean that he started grave robbing in his mid-twenties. The person in the film looks nothing close to that. At most, he would be in his late teens. So most people do not believe that these two men are the same. In the film, Anthony is accompanied by a man named Pushi. Investigators later deduced that this was likely a mispronunciation and Anthony meant to call him Bushi. Now, there is an indie film director named Christopher Bushi who is known to use hyper-realistic skeletons in his movies. However, we have no idea if he really was a director of Grave Robbing for Morons. At the end of the film, Anthony said that he would be back, but we never got our hands on a second installment. Or if he did truly make a sequel film slash video, it hasn't been found yet. In the mid-1980s, dozens of residents of New Jersey requested that an investigation be conducted in Tom's River as there was an alarming number of children dying from cancer in that area, but all of the requests were either ignored or denied. But in 1986, a detective named Michael Berry finally took up the case. There were suspicions that the water supply in Tom's River was chemically contaminated. However, once the investigation was completed, he deemed his results inconclusive. Then in 1994, there was a terrifying discovery made by the NJDOH. Relative to the rest of New Jersey, the cases of brain tumors within children were over 70% higher. A year later in 1995, Barry was asked to investigate the same case once more. He reluctantly accepted as he didn't think the results would be much different. However, he would soon find out that he was very wrong. Children under 5 years old were dying from neurological cancer 7 times more than the state average and the kids slash young adults under 20 were dying at 3 times the rate. Looking at the data, there was a significant spike around the late 1980s. At first, the information was not released to the public, but in March of 1996, investigative journalists at the Star Ledger exposed the news. And as you could imagine, the public reacted with extreme anger. Immediately, protesters began to flood the streets surrounding the local health department's office. One of the victims was a young man named Michael Gillick. He was diagnosed with neuroblastoma at three months old. His arduous fight against this has left him disfigured and blind in one eye and deaf in one ear. Another victim was named Gabrielle Pascarella, who was diagnosed with CNS lymphoma at under a year old and tragically passed away at 14 months old. 
From 1990 to 2010, U.S. health agencies looked into over 420 cancer clusters, and out of all of those investigations, only one of them was able to end with an identified cause. There are many theories regarding what may have been the root cause of these clusters, such as irradiated drinking water or illegal dumping of plastic manufacturing waste. Back in March of 2020, the painting known as the Parsonage Garden at Noonan, or the Parsonage Garden at Noonan in Spring, was stolen. This happened at an exhibition at the Singer Loren Museum, but it was recovered in September of this year. The exact date when the painting was stolen was on March 30th, which just so happened to be Van Gogh's birthday. At the time, the painting was being loaned out to the Groninger Museum. Due to the pandemic, the public was not able to access the building. According to police, the thieves or thief broke a pair of glass doors with a sledgehammer at 3.15 a.m. to steal the painting. Then in June of the same year, Detective Arthur Brand received a photo of the Parsonage Garden with a newspaper that dated May 30th. After careful examination by experts, they believe that this photo was of the genuine painting. This was not the first time that one of Van Gogh's works has been stolen. Since 1988, there have been about 30 recorded incidents where Van Gogh paintings have been stolen in the Netherlands, all of which were eventually recovered. In September of 2023, Detective Arthur Brand caught his big break. He claimed that after intense negotiation with a man, he was able to get his hands on the stolen painting from 2020. However, he never named him and said that he was not involved in the theft. The painting did resurface with slight damage, but overall it was still considered to be in good condition. Fingerprints found on the painting led to a man only known as Nils M. He was sentenced to eight years in prison and had to pay approximately $9 million. But where the mystery lies is why he stole the painting in the first place. Of course, it was valuable, but there are rumors that a man named Peter Roy K. commissioned the job in hopes of using the painting as leverage to reduce his prison sentence. Peter was a Dutch shipping mogul who had his hands in illegal businesses such as substance smuggling, but Nils himself said that he did it just for the sake of highlighting how poorly secured the facility was. This entry refers to a Reddit post detailing a piece of potential lost media. OP states that they saw an ad on TV in the UK around 2009 to 2010 in the midst of a swine flu breakout. They also say that it was possibly banned due to how frightening it was to kids. The ad itself is said to have included several toddlers and baby swings up against a white backdrop. All of the kids were coughing and sneezing, but the way OP describes it, it seems that they were doing all of this in the same rhythm as Frere Jocks. Additionally, OP stated that a friend of theirs who also remembers this ad thought that some of the babies were actually choking. OP thinks that the ad was for cold medicine, but due to the creepiness of it, it may have been a PSA for a certain disease. And it does seem that this was a real ad, as several others claim to have also seen it before. This entry takes us back to 1908 where two brothers, Willie and Frank McLeod, visited the Nahani Valley with the goal of hitting it rich with gold. However, not only did they not find any gold, but they also never returned home. Then, two years after their departure, some hikers discovered their bodies next to the Nahani River. And the scariest part was that both men's heads were missing. Then, about seven years after the discovery of their bodies, a man named Martin Jorgensen also ventured into the Nahani Valley in hopes of finding gold. Not long after arriving, he sent letters back home claiming to have stumbled upon a massive supply of it. But in a shocking turn of events, his cabin was burned down and inside was the lifeless body of Martin. Martin, like the McLeod brothers, was also found headless. And then, in 1945, a miner was also found decapitated in his sleeping bag. The Nahani Valley is considered a very sacred place, with most parts of it not accessible to the public. It is surrounded with folklore and mystery ever since it was first inhabited. Many early tribes warned that the location is evil and haunted by demons, which is why most tribes avoided settling there. One tribe that did decide to live in this valley were the Dene people who spoke of bloodthirsty creatures roaming the forests at night. Additionally, living in the mountains were the battle-hardened Naha warriors. 
This particular tribe was only able to live here due to their fierce warrior instincts. They were also known for decapitating their enemies. The Naha tribe is another mystery in itself as they just suddenly and inexplicably vanished. The area already terrified other tribes, so this sudden disappearance of the Naha was all the more reason for them to avoid this location. Along with the eerie deaths of the visitors in the valley, there have also been reports of enigmatic lights, UFOs, cryptids, and living fossils. To this day, no one has any idea what is causing the decapitations, or if there is any truth to the existence of unique creatures in the woods. During the American Indian Wars, there was a chief named Sitting Bull who was shot and killed by Lieutenant Bullhead. In the past, Bullhead fought side by side with Chief Sitting Bull against the Americans, but one day Bullhead was commanded to arrest Sitting Bull. So on December 15th, 1890, Bullhead rushed Sitting Bull's cabin with over 40 men in Grand River, South Dakota. At the time, Sitting Bull and his family were still asleep, so Bullhead's men busted inside and dragged him out. His family began to scream, which awoke Sitting Bull's men that were resting nearby. Initially, Sitting Bull was cooperative and listened to orders. However, it all fell apart after his favorite child yelled, They are making a fool out of you. Sitting Bull was enraged and yelled, I will not go. Attack. Attack. Lieutenant Bullhead was then shot by one of Sitting Bull's men, and right as he was about to hit the ground, he lifted his gun and dealt a fatal shot to Sitting Bull. This rapidly sparked a brief firefight where 13 people were killed, including Sitting Bull's child Crawfoot. It is said that Sitting Bull was buried in an unassuming location by prisoners at Fort Yates. Apparently, his grave was frequently vandalized, but nobody really knows where it is. In the early 1900s, a couple of drunk soldiers said that they dug up Sitting Bull's remains and took two bones, one of which they donated to the North Dakota State Historical Society. Most people seem to believe that his grave is somewhere at Fort Yates, but others seem to believe that it's somewhere else entirely, possibly even Canada. In May of 2023, someone dumped over 500 pounds of assorted pasta in the woods. The pasta was fully cooked and dumped alongside a creek in Veterans Park. Allegedly, there are a number of people who know who is responsible for dumping all of this, but they choose not to reveal his identity. Two Public Works employees arrived on the scene to clean up the mess and were able to get rid of all of the pasta in less than an hour. There are a number of community advocates who said that the person who dumped the pasta is a man with a history of mental health issues and believe is best for everyone if his name remained private. Duck Song 63 is the name given to a Jane Doe who was found inside a block of concrete in 2016 in South Korea. It was April 28, 2016, when a group of construction workers were in the process of destroying an outhouse in Incheon. This particular outhouse was constructed as part of a three-story building and rested right underneath an emergency staircase. And right between the staircase and the outhouse, there was this small box structure. There were cinder blocks all around it and in the middle it was filled with concrete. For years, people passed this area and took a note of the box, but never really cared what it was. Since it wasn't essential in supporting any of the nearby structures, the construction workers decided to just break it. It took several tries to access as the construction workers said it was oddly strong, and they even thought that it was unbreakable at first. But eventually, they were able to get it open by dislodging one of the cinder blocks with a crowbar. As soon as they opened it up, something hard rolled out. It was a human skull. In addition to the skull, there was also a small pillow, ramen packet, and a box of cigarettes. Investigators noted that the building was constructed before the 80s and they were possibly looking at a decades-old case here. Medical officials determined that the remains were of a female and she was in her early 20s at the time of her death. Officials were not able to determine her cause of death as there were no clear signs of trauma. With no way to advance the investigation with the body itself, investigators set their sights on the various items that were found alongside the woman. They also carefully inspect the concrete tomb itself. A sample of that concrete was inspected and determined to be newer, specifically from around 2006 to 2008. Another detail that police found odd was that the culprit had poured cement over the body and then poured water on top of the dry cement instead of just pouring concrete over the victim from the start. 
Because of the method used, there were several distinct layers within the concrete. Furthermore, there was no running water in the outhouse. Authorities believed it would have taken about 3-5 to five minutes to get water and come back to this location. It just seemed like an immense amount of effort. Two of the earliest suspects were the former owners of the building. Investigators assumed that around the time the body was buried, the two owners were named Lee and So. Lee turned down a police interview while So accepted. But as soon as So's wife learned what the interview was about, she yelled that they were innocent. So denied knowing anything about the box next to the outhouse, but after police searched his phone, there was a picture of it on there which was taken in December of 2013. He was later asked to participate in a second interview, but he was much less welcoming this time. At one point, he blew up with rage and refused to talk. When the interviewers left his home, they noticed a peculiar stick at the top of his doorway. It was made out of Kalapinax, which some people use to ward off dead spirits. But investigators and the public believe that he is at the very least involved, if not outright the sole person responsible. We never got any information out of Lee, so it's very much possible that he may have played a role. On August 11th, 1994, a fisherman named Mark Peterson was venturing around the Hawkesbury River in Sydney. All of a sudden, he felt a distinct heavy tug on his fishing rod. Mark thought that he had just snagged a massive fish or squid, but once he reeled up the mass, he recoiled out of shock. It was a man wrapped in plastic, tied to a steel cross. Additionally, there was a noose wrapped around the man's neck. Mark called police and medical officials determined that the man had died from blunt force trauma and they estimated he died in 1993, but they weren't entirely sure whether he died on the cross or if he was placed onto it afterwards. The rope and wire that was wrapped around the victim's neck and torso would have made it impossible for him to escape if he was still alive on it. The man had been underwater for over a year which eroded his fingerprints. The steel cross to which he was binded to seemed to be custom made just for him. The clothes that he had on were just a run of the mill clothing that you could find at any store in Australia. News outlets gave this person the name Rackman. He was essentially unidentifiable, so investigators set their efforts on trying to find the culprit instead, but they didn't accomplish much in that avenue either. Over two decades later, the Rackman was finally identified. In August of 2018, NSW Deputy State Coroner Paul McMahon publicly announced that the victim was 37-year-old Max Tanchevsky. He was last seen by his significant other, leaving home on January 11th, 1993. Max was known amongst his family and friends for having a gambling addiction, and on this particular night, he was yet again out to gamble. Because of his nasty gambling tendencies, his family didn't think it was strange when he failed to return home the following day. It is unknown how much money he lost or owed due to his gambling habits, but before he disappeared, he had made a $1,800 withdrawal, which was not a standard amount for him. So now that the victim has been identified, investigators still need to find out who was responsible for his death. This method of killing was definitely unusual. Authorities thought that the manner in which Max was killed was similar to how a gang would kill someone just to send a threat to someone else. It was possible that Max's death was just meant to be a warning. Then there's the obvious reference to Jesus with the manner in which Max was displayed. It may have been possible that some sort of religious group or individual was responsible. And of course there's the obvious theory where Max owed someone money for his rampant gambling. Overall, the entire thing must have taken an immense effort for the culprit, so police believe that whoever the killer was may have had a personal vendetta against Max. The Alcacer Girls was a group of Spanish teenagers who were kidnapped and raped before being murdered in the town of Picasent in 1992. Their names were Miriam Garcia Ibora, Antonio Rodriguez, who was often called Tony, and Desiree Hernandez Fulch. It was mid-November 1992 when the three girls were on their way to a school party held at a nightclub called Culor. It was on this trip that Miriam, Tony, and Desiree disappeared. They were traveling about two and a half miles out from their home. The girls planned for Miriam's father, Fernando, to give him a ride to Kalur. However, he had recently developed influenza and was bedridden. The girls really wanted to go to this party, so they resorted to hitchhiking, which they have done a number of times in the past. 
One couple was able to drive them from Alcacer to a petrol station located just outside of Picasent. From there, they got another ride, and a resident later reported that the girls got into a sedan which contained several men inside. But they couldn't tell the exact number. This was the final time the girls were reported alive. Over two months later, on January 27th, 1993, a couple of beekeepers were near the La Romana Ravine when they noticed the bodies of three girls in a ditch. It seemed as though the girls were buried, but the recent heavy rain washed all of the dirt and mud away. Investigators were actually able to arrest and convict one man for these murders. His name was Miguel Ricart. Miguel shared that he and a friend of his named Antonio Anglais gave the girls a ride, but once they passed the nightclub, the girls started to scream and flail around. That's when Antonio grabbed his pistol and whipped the girls in their faces. Miguel drove the group to a rundown house near La Ramona, which was located in an isolated area in the mountains. Two of the girls were raped. The two men then left for food, which took about two hours. When they returned, they the third girl as well. In the morning, the men dug a large pit and led the girls to it. They were assaulted once more and two of the girls were shot while the third was stabbed twice in the back. Tony, Miriam, and Desiree were then left in the pit before being discovered by those beekeepers. Authorities raided Antonio's home, but they couldn't find him. It is said that he snuck onto a container ship which he jumped off of when it reached the coast of Ireland. And this is where details are a bit unclear, as some believe that he drowned while others say that Antonio is currently in Brazil since he is a native there. There was also a theory that suggested the two men worked for an underground crime ring that sold minors. About four years before the deaths of the Alcacer girls, there were two other girls and a boy who were murdered in a nearby town. No one was charged for those murders but many suggest that it may have been the same culprits. On August 19, 1981, in Crawford Township, Pennsylvania, an employee of the state's Bureau of Forestry was examining a heavily wooded area about six miles from Interstate 80. Eventually, he stepped on something slightly squishy. When he looked down, he froze for a few seconds at the sight of a body. The employee jumped backwards and ran off to contact 911. Investigators determined that the male victim died from a 38 caliber handgun, possibly a revolver. Medical officials added that the man had sustained two wounds to his head as well. Due to the lack of blood at the location the body was found, police believe that he was killed elsewhere and dropped off in the woods. And based on the name of this entry, you probably already suspected that this victim also had his privates mutilated, which will be a consistent in detail in all of these murders. About a month after finding this man, authorities received a phone call from an anonymous male caller. This man claimed that he knew the victim and even had a number of his belongings. It is unclear if police ever met up with this individual to gather information or not. Through the use of fingerprint records, investigators were eventually able to identify the first victim as a Wayne Lee Riffendifer. Before being discovered in the woods, he had recently taken up a cross-country journey as a hitchhiker. And I probably don't need to say this, but that is likely how he met his end. At first, police didn't connect Wayne's murder to any other cases, but years down the line, they realized that there were about two to five, possibly more, victims who also shared the same mutilation characteristics as Wayne. All of these killings were likely done by the same individual. On June 14th, 1982, another body was found in Daniels Canyon in Utah near Route 40. A fisherman named Lee Valdez was headed towards a river when he noticed what appeared to be a person lying near some trees about 30 feet from the road. Just like with Wayne, this man, estimated to be in his mid-twenties, was also shot by a 38 caliber firearm. But unlike Wayne, the location of this newly discovered victim was covered in blood. Wasatch County Sheriff Mike Spanos said, We found drag marks and blood splatters leading from the highway to the trees. It looks like someone just drove up, dragged the body out of the car, dumped it, and then drove away. The body was completely nude, except for his socks, and the victim's male organs were absent. Medical officials stated that the castration was done post-mortem with a hunting-type knife. After scouring the area, authorities couldn't locate any of the man's belongings or clothing. However, there were several witnesses who came forward and said that they saw what appeared to be a woman near the body the same day the discovery was made. 
She had blonde hair and was hitchhiking before she was picked up by two men. Mike Spano said, Evidently, the woman saw something happen in that canyon, and we would like to find her and talk with her. We are having a composite drawing made of her now, and we will begin looking for her as soon as that's done. Most people look at this woman as a primary suspect, but due to the lack of evidence available, that's tough to justify. Police failed at locating or identifying the woman and also struggled at tying any identity to the new victim. But luckily, the news of this young man's body reached Truckee, California, and police discovered that the identity of the man was a 21-year-old named Marty James Shook, who was last seen about two days before his body was found in Utah. Marty left his family on June 12th, 1982 in Sparks, Nevada and planned to visit Colorado. And just like Wayne, Marty was hitchhiking his way there. His case was later linked to the murder of Willard Edward Judd, who was a 27-year-old oil field worker who went missing and was later found on August 10th, 1980. Just like the previous two victims, he also hitched hike and shared the same bodily wounds when found. The investigation later led to a man named Dirk Pace who was convicted for a murder. Dirk claimed that two of his acquaintances were responsible for Judd's death. However, after further investigation, those two were deemed innocent. In July of 1983, there was another victim, who was never identified, found in Georgia who only had on a swimsuit. Then in November of 1986, another man aged 26 named Jack Franklin Andrews was discovered dead in Litchfield, Connecticut. Both of these events were suspected of being tied to Judd, Marty, and Wayne. There are several several other names that sometimes find their way into the list of victims of this particular serial killer, but the ones listed above are more or less commonly agreed upon to be related. There were a number of potential suspects that may have committed these crimes. However, one of the names that stands out is Harry Christ Manos. In November of 1991, he was acquitted on several child molestation charges, and the details regarding his investigation are very graphic, but let's just say he was an avid pedophile that enjoyed torturing young men. He also worked as a high school teacher, and police found a jar with severed male organs inside of a locked cabinet. Investigators state that Harry got away with committing numerous crimes. In a case that's unrelated to the one that we just went over, the evidence stacked against Harry was pretty insane. But shockingly, he got off with no prison time. The majority of the victims of these castration murders died in the summer, which would have lined up perfectly with Harry's work schedule. There were also some rumors that mentioned Harry was in the same locations of those bodies, but these claims aren't exactly the most credible. Harry was never charged with any of the crimes regarding those murders, as investigators had inadequate evidence against him. Mel's Hole refers to a legend about a supposed bottomless pit somewhere around Ellensburg, Washington. However, this pit was never discovered, nor could anyone find a person named Mel. This legend first sprung up on February 21st, 1997 when a man named Mel Waters got on a radio show called Coast to Coast AM. Mel said that he owned private land which was about 9 miles west of Ellensburg. On this land, there was a strange hole with an unknown depth. He claimed that he tied a weight to the end of a fishing line to try and see how deep it was. He ended up using over 80,000 feet of line and even then it had not reached the bottom. Another eerie detail is that there was supposedly a dead dog thrown into the hole which later appeared alive several days later. Some people actually believed Mel at first but after hearing that story about the dog, that's sort of where they became a little bit skeptical. It was later mentioned that the US government claimed the land and forced Mel to move to Australia. Mel never revealed the exact location of the hole and several explorers funded expeditions to find it, but none of them resulted in definitive answers. And so, many people grew skeptical and called the story a hoax. Several researchers suggested that such a hole would collapse into itself under all of that pressure. This is going to be a pretty short one, but I'm sure we've all seen those little signs stuck into the ground or pinned onto a wooden post telling you to vote for a particular mayor or governor. But there are a number of signs that have residents a bit confused, those being the ones that simply ask Barber School. 
The sign has no contact information or an address, so people are just left scratching their heads, wondering what the point of the sign is. Was it all just a joke? Well, if you look up Barber School in Pittsburgh, which is where the signs were found, you'd find a barber school in that city. More than likely, it's from someone who attended that place and is now just trying to help the school get new students. This isn't a heavy or serious case by any means, but it sort of just makes you chuckle. And no one has any idea who actually placed those signs. Madeline McCann is the name of a missing child who disappeared at the age of three on May 3rd, 2007. Madeline and her family were on vacation at the Ocean Club in Praia de Luz, Portugal. The parents decided to go out for dinner with some friends at a restaurant nearby while Madeline and her two younger siblings remained in the apartment. The couple came up with a particular supervising strategy where they would rotate who checks on the kids. When it was Kate McCann's turn, she noticed that Madeline was missing. Police were immediately contacted and searched the vicinity. It wasn't until May 26th when police were able to complete all of the tips and details they received and released a description of a potential suspect. Apparently, on the same night of the disappearance, there was a man carrying what looked to be a child. This may have very well been Madeline. Then in June through August, police publicly announced that they possibly had destroyed forensic evidence as a result of not properly securing and protecting the crime scene. It was also at this time where they believed that the possibility of locating Madeline and retrieving her alive were very slim. It was in January 2008 when police released a sketch of who they believed may be responsible. A British holidaymaker described the man as creepy and acting strange. He was seen about 600 yards from the resort where the McCanns were staying at. It was also mentioned that this man was seen at least three times in the month before Madeline's abduction. This man has never been identified. Then in 2013, detectives from the UK released additional computer-generated images of a number of potential suspects. By late 2015, the British government had spent well over £10 million on the investigation. Madeline has yet to be found, and there is debate on whether or not she is still alive. There have been a number of reported sightings of her around the world, however, these were never really heavily investigated, so they may have just been false reports. On December 31st, 2000, the Setagaya family was tragically massacred by an unknown assailant who subsequently lived inside of their home for an extended period. The mother and wife of the household, Yazuko Miyazawa's mother, visited the home on December 31st to discover the family dead. Amongst the victims were father and husband Mikio Miyazawa, wife and mother Yasuko, 8-year-old Nina, and 6-year-old Rei. Medical officials stated that Mikio, Yasuko, and Nina all died from several stab wounds, while Rei died of asphyxiation. It was estimated that the family was killed the night before around 11.30pm. But how exactly did the killer access the home? Well, the police believe that the killer climbed a tree next to Ray's room, which had an open window at the time, and jumped in. Ray was in his room at the time and was the first to die. But while he was being strangled, Ray was able to let out a scream that awoke his father, Mikio, who sprinted upstairs to his son's room. Mikio tackled the assailant and inflicted several wounds onto him, but the killer had a knife which he used to fatally wound Mikio. This fatal strike broke the knife, but despite this, he used it to take the lives of Yasuko and Nina. What followed was one of the strangest things investigators have seen. The killer decided to live inside of the Miyazawa home instead of escaping. Authorities believe that he stayed there for several hours at the very least. He went on the family computer and browsed the internet before drinking some tea from the fridge and eating some melon and ice cream. Afterwards, he used the toilet and did not flush. He also used the family's first aid kit to tend to his injuries. Typically, when a home is broken into, police believe that money is the driving factor. However, this was not the case here as the killer left behind a lot of cash. He did go through all of the drawers and cabinets and take some money, but not enough for authorities to deem this as a monetarily fueled attack. 
Before leaving, the killer left behind his broken knife, a scarf, hip bag, sweater, jacket, hat, gloves, shoes, and two handkerchiefs. The killer did not seem to care at all about what he did or if he was potentially caught. Along with what was just listed, he left behind a plethora of evidence. There was his fingerprints, feces, and blood available throughout the home. After investigation, police realized that the computer recorded activity at 1.18am and 10am, with the latter being right about when Yasuka's mother arrived at the home. But it is debated whether or not the second login was the killer or if it was Yasuko's mother who triggered it by bumping into the mouse. The sweater that the murderer left behind was able to be traced to a store in the Kanagawa prefecture and it turned out that it was pretty rare with only 130 ever being sold. 12 of those buyers were found but all of them were deemed innocent. And despite all of the DNA left behind, officials really couldn't figure out much in terms of the culprit's identity. They did figure out that the killer was male and possibly mixed race. He was also right-handed and aged between 15 and 35 years. Yeah, not exactly a great starting point for finding the identity of this killer. It has since been decades and no one has been charged with the murder of the Miyazawa family. There is a reward currently of about 140,000 USD for anyone who can provide information that leads to the arrest of the culprit. Donald Rindall was a 22-year-old man who was found buried in 2003 near Cambridge in Asante County. He was buried 3 feet underground on private property. Officials estimated that he was buried sometime between the late 1970s or early 1971. One detective was quoted saying, Based off information from the family, as well as a scene in 2003, it is believed that Donald was a victim of homicide, but his death has been classified as undetermined. It is further believed that there may still be people alive today who know what happened to Donald in 1970. The family also believes that Donald was killed, as he had no reason to just take off and never tell anyone why. Donald's remains were discovered near Highway 47 and County Road 5 in two different locations. They were found by a man who was doing some work on a driveway with his bobcat. At the time, no one knew that the remains belonged to Donald. At first, medical officials could only determine that they belonged to a white male in his 20s. If Donald was indeed a victim of foul play, investigators don't have the slightest clue as to who is responsible. But even if he didn't die by the hands of another, we still have no idea why he was buried. There was one rumor that involved illegal substances, but there isn't much information out there to build on this claim. Jennifer Kessie was a woman who went missing on January 23rd, 2006 in Orlando, Florida. A suspicious individual was seen on security footage driving and exiting Jennifer's car after she disappeared, but due to the poor quality on the camera and just bad luck, the person could not be identified. Jennifer had just moved into a new condo in Orlando and had recently accepted a promotion as a project manager for a timeshare company. At the time, she was in a happy relationship with her boyfriend, Rob Allen. Just a week before Jennifer's disappearance, she and Rob both went on a vacation. After returning home, she went to work on Monday, January 23rd, 2006. Everything was proceeding as normal, but around 10pm after Jennifer got off work, she spoke with Rob on the phone. Apparently, the couple got into an argument. It wasn't revealed just what the two were talking about, but it had something to do with their relationship. The two lived three hours apart, which may have taken a bit of a toll on both of them. The next morning, January 24th, Jennifer's employer took note that she had not arrived yet. They waited a little longer, but still, Jennifer was nowhere to be seen. They decided to call Jennifer's parents and tell them about her absence. This greatly worried her parents and they immediately tried calling her, but she didn't pick up. Her mother was quoted saying her cell phone that she had since she was 16 years old went to voicemail for the first time. That is how we knew something horrendous has happened. Jennifer's parents and their son Logan immediately took off to check Jennifer's home. The drive took about two hours and when they took a look inside the house, everything appeared normal. Jennifer's mother Joyce said there was makeup all over her counter. The t-shirt she had worn to bed was on the floor. The shower was wet in the corners. It looked as though Jennifer had left not too long 
long ago. Although, the one strange thing was that nobody could locate Jennifer's phone, keys, or purse. It didn't take long for Jennifer's friends and family to flock near her home and begin their search. After an entire day of searching, Jennifer was officially declared missing. Just two days after her disappearance, Jennifer's car, a black Chevy Malibu, was discovered in a parking lot about one mile from her home. It was at this same time when investigators caught their first big break in the case. The security cameras in the facility where the car was parked had recorded a man parking Jennifer's car at about 12 p.m. But unfortunately, the camera took photos every few seconds and it literally just so happened that each photo had an object blocking out the man's face. After half a year, a new lead detective was put on the case. His name was Joel Wright and this was what he said when asked what he believed happened. I believe Jennifer got ready for work. She showered, got dressed, went outside of her condo, locked the door on the way out, and made it as far as her car. After that, I believe she was abducted. Jennifer's family continuously searched for her. On the second anniversary of her disappearance, they grouped up on a street corner where they held up signs spreading awareness of Jennifer. Detective Wright came up with the idea of showing the photos of the unidentified man to the employees of the complex parking lot. One of the women working there said that the man pictured kind of looked like a guy named Chino. Turned out that Chino lived near Jennifer. In fact, he lived in the same condo complex but in a different building, and he even worked there as a maintenance worker in the past. Chino had visited Jennifer's condo about a week before she went missing to do some repairs. On March 18th, 2009, Detective Wright got an opportunity to interview Chino in prison where he was serving a sentence for a rape charge. But Chino claimed to have no idea what happened to Jennifer. He was subjected to a polygraph test, which he passed. In December of 2018, Jennifer's family grew frustrated with how the Orlando Police Department was handling the case, and so they sued them. In 2019, the OPD was required to hand over 16,000 pages of documents and 67 hours of camera footage over to Jennifer's family. Additionally, the OPD was not allowed to investigate Jennifer's case any further. They later hired a private investigator named Michael Toretta, who developed the following theory. Allegedly, there were about 8-10 to 10 construction workers staying in an empty apartment near Jennifer. Michael believes that one or several of those men were responsible for her abduction. He added that just under a year after Jennifer's death, someone was seen tossing a rolled up piece of carpet into a nearby lake. The reason this is relevant is because on the day that Jennifer went missing, there were several construction workers laying down a similar carpet in that apartment we mentioned. A dive team was deployed to search the lake, but they couldn't find anything. Despite this, Michael believes it's the most valuable piece of info that they have. It has been nearly two decades since Jennifer Cassie's disappearance and no one has ever been charged. But now, with all the documents and videos in the hands of the Cassie family, they are hopeful that they can figure out just what happened to Jennifer. It was July 24th, 2009 when the 5th grade girl Manami Shinomura disappeared from her class field trip and was never seen again. 10 year old Manami had been telling her family all about the upcoming field trip to the Hiragano Kogen camping grounds saying things like, I can't wait for the camp. Monami was described as a heartwarming girl who had a bubbly personality. She loved to sing and dance and led a tough life from the very start. She was taken care of by her single mother and older sister, and she was even born with a peculiar heart condition that required surgery not long after she was born. Additionally, Monami had Down syndrome and was smaller than all the other kids. And the strange thing was, Monami's mother said she wasn't much of a wanderer. While she was outgoing, she was also cautious about her whereabouts, and she was well aware of her disability and knew better to venture off alone. On the day of the field trip, over 80 students and several chaperones from the Toko Namanishi School visited the Hirogano campsite. The group was supposed to stay there for three days, and in that time, they were the only ones camping there. There were no other visitors. The first night was filled with fun for the children, as for many of them, this was their first experience camping. Then the next morning, at about 7.30am, Monami and four other students headed out to explore. One of the chaperones remembers the exact moment when they passed him. 
He took note of Monami trailing behind the rest of the kids by a decent margin, but he just thought that she'd catch up eventually. However, the group later returned, but without Monami. One of the girls yelled, Monami has vanished. The last confirmed sighting of her was at 8am by the principal. One of the campground supervisors said, The forest road is a course that returns to the same starting point if you walk along the road. The area around the last site is a forest road paved with asphalt. On the eastern slope, there are cliffs that even adults cannot climb. Although there is a stream on the west side, the water was not deep enough to drown in at that time. The comment alluding to drowning would be if the person was an adult, so you could imagine if a child were to fall into that stream, it had the potential to be very dangerous. Immediately, all of the adults got together and split up roots in search of Monami. They made absolutely sure to tell the other students to stay put and not wander off, but after searching for a couple of hours, the adults called the police. Along with the officers, there were hundreds of volunteers on the site. Upon arrival, police sealed off the entire area, but after sweeping through the vicinity, they too failed at locating Monami. They couldn't even find a footprint from her. When Monami's mother learned of her daughter's disappearance, she searched for her every single day for hours over the course of two months, and she eventually stumbled upon a pair of shoes that looked just like the ones her daughter wore. She was confident that they were indeed her daughter's, but police thought otherwise and concluded that they did not belong to Monami. It seems that the most commonly agreed upon outcome was that Monami may have been attacked and consumed by an animal after getting lost. However, someone should have found something that belonged to her, and due to the lack of remains found at the campsite, some think that she was actually kidnapped. But as of now, there isn't quite enough evidence to support any of these theories. And just in case you are wondering why the adults allow children to go exploring the wilderness all alone, well, that's because they organized various tests that involved going out in groups. The intent was to increase the children's level of independence, but more often than you'd think, a child actually does go missing during one of these tests. Chip Chan refers to a Korean woman who documents her life online and claims that she is the victim of a mind control weapon. Additionally, she frequently says that she is being held captive by a dishonest police officer, who she refers to as P. Over the course of a decade plus, Chip Chan has been live streaming her apartment on an almost daily basis. She was initially discovered on a 4chan webcam thread in 2008. Immediately, visitors of the site took an interest in Chip Chan. She was found sleeping in a peculiar position and many thought that she was actually deceased at that moment. As internet sleuths did more investigating into Chip Chan, they found her WordPress blog. This discovery then spiraled into a rabbit hole of other blogs created by her where she spoke of this mysterious mind control device that was implanted 3 centimeters into her ankle bone. Throughout her apartment, there are several webcams which were likely placed by Chip Chan herself. For the majority of the time, Chip Chan just visits the internet and sleeps. And oftentimes, she sleeps upwards of 12 hours a day. Viewers say that she appears to be in rather poor health with lower levels of energy. She also occasionally develops rashes and wounds, wounds which she never revealed the origins of. Chip Chan claimed that she had been living in her apartment since 1996 and hasn't been able to leave since due to her chip which can knock her unconscious. However, this seems to be a lie as she has left her apartment several times and she has even changed her place of residence before. Instead of calling the police, Chip Chan asks the viewers for help. She wants people to spread the word about her situation and often mentions a man named Park Sung Man. Apparently, this guy can help her. Park was actually her former landlord as well. There are many theories in regards to Chip Chan, but it seems that the most commonly believed one is that she is simply mentally ill. Viewers have stated that she exhibits symptoms that often parallel paranoid schizophrenia. However, skeptics of this theory like to point to the trend where paranoid schizophrenics typically don't like being watched and often go into hiding, which in the case of Chip Chan is the complete opposite. There is also the possibility that Chip Chan is a dedicated artist and this is all an elaborate art project, but to keep this up for nearly three decades is just insane. So for now, no one knows what is truly going on with Chip Chan. In 1840, a 22-year-old man named William N. Crump built his farmhouse near Oneonta, Alabama. 
Then in 1858, William purchased 246 acres of land from the US government. And on this land, there were five caves. Crump Cave, Second Cave, Horseshoe Cave, Bishopella Cave, and Sewer Cave. The focus of this entry will be on Crump Cave, which had a super tiny entrance that could barely fit in one man at a time. One day, William entered said cave and discovered Native American artifacts inside. There were beads, arrows, spears, copper, and stone axes. Additionally, there was well over 200 pounds of galena, which was an ore used in lead and silver. But along with those items were also wooden coffins and skulls. Over time, Crump and his friends took everything that was inside except for those wooden coffins. William served during the Civil War with the 49th Alabama Infantry, and it was during this time when Crump's cave was mined for saltpeter, which was used in gunpowder. After the war in 1892, a geologist named Frank Burns visited the cave with William by his side and said the following in his report. A short distance from the entrance was a room, which proved to be a burial cave of the Aborigines. They found eight or ten wooden coffins of black and white walnut, hollowed or cut of wood, after the fashion of the dugout canoe. The coffins are about seven and a half feet long, 14 to 18 inches wide, and two and a half inches thick, and six or seven inches deep. By this time, the coffins had deteriorated a great deal. Frank had them shipped off to the Smithsonian Institution, however, they they went lost shortly after their arrival. They have been lost ever since amongst all of the artifacts stored at the museum. Within Tokyo on January 26th, 1948, an unassuming middle-aged man visited the Tegan Bank. This man identified himself as Dr. Jiro Yamaguchi and even provided a business card to prove his identity. Dr. Jiro spent about one hour in that bank, but the events that occurred in this building for that relatively short amount of time was shocking. Jiro was wearing an armband that said Metropolitan Office City Hall of Tokyo, and he brought along a bag with medical supplies. He asked for the manager and informed them that there was a recent breakout of dysentery in the area and that he was tasked with vaccinating the staff at the bank. The staff thought that this was legitimate as Japan had recently faced the destructive force of a nuclear attack from World War II. Nobody suspected that perhaps this man was a fraud. Dr. Jiro stated that he would be exhibiting the vaccination in two doses. They would be swallowed one after the other. In total, 15 staff members and a child received this. There was about another two dozen staff members who refused the vaccination. The group waited a few minutes for it to take effect and shortly after, they all collapsed onto the floor. It was now clear that what they received was not really supposed to help them. Medical officials later determined that what was administered was potassium cyanide. Only four of the 16 people survived, 10 of whom died on the scene, including the child, and another two who passed away in the hospital. The false doctor stole about 160,000 yen, which is about 1400 USD. The strange thing was that he left behind nearly 200,000 yen. It took until August 21st of the same year for authorities to finally bring in a suspect to be questioned. This man was named Sadamichi Hirasawa. At the time, there was an illegal business of people swapping business cards. The business card belonging to the fake doctor had an entirely fake identity. Dr. Jiro Yamaguchi did not exist. And after the incident at the Tegan Bank, this killer went on to commit similar crimes two more times, but on smaller scales. One of the other identities he used was Shigeru Matsui. Authorities were able to find the real Shigeru who said that he swapped nearly 600 business cards and one of the people he swapped with was Sadamichi Hirasawa. Two of the surviving bank staff later stated that they believed the doctor was Hirasawa. Furthermore, police discovered a large sum of cash hidden away in Hirasawa home. He was a painter and he claimed that the money was from illegal sales of adult artwork. Hirasawa later confessed to the killings after three weeks of constant interrogation. However, he did later retract his confession and said he only confessed to get out of the inhumane torture that he was being subjected to. Hirasawa's lawyers urged him to take a deal where he claimed to be partially insane since he suffered from Korsakoff psychosis. This is commonly associated with chronic alcoholism, but he was quickly found guilty and charged solely based on his confession. Hirasawa was later sentenced to death, which was upheld in 1950. 
1955. In total, Hirasawa lived on death row for over three decades while his lawyers filed over 18 appeals over that time. The vast majority of people seemed to believe that Hirasawa was innocent. Aside from the money and his potentially false confession, there really wasn't much to convict Hirasawa. In total, there were nearly 40 employees at the bank and only two of them positively ID'd Hirasawa as the doctor. Even 33 different ministers of justice didn't think Hirasawa was responsible and they refused to sign off on his death warrant over those three decades where he was on death row. One of the more notorious ministers was known to frequently sign off on death warrants, signing a high of two dozen in a single day. Even he refused to sign off on Hirasawa's. There are many people who believe that Hirasawa was used as a sort of scapegoat for Unit 731, who specialized in the development of various chemical and biological weapons for the Japanese military. The group is said to have caused the deaths of well over 250,000 Chinese as well as massive populations of British, American, and Australian POWs. There were rumors that one of the members of Unit 731 was responsible for the Tagen Bank murders. To support this, during the war, it was normal for Unit 731 to actually administer poison to prisoners but tell them that it was actually medicine. Another aspect investigators like to point to is that not much money was stolen from the bank. This may have been because the true goal of this incident wasn't monetary, but simply to test out a new substance, and stealing the money was just an attempt to leave a red herring. If you recall, towards the beginning I mentioned that the lethal substance was potassium cyanide. Well, after additional extensive research, medical officials believe that it was more likely hydrogen cyanide. In most cases, the actual type of cyanide may not be an important factor as in the end the victim still died. However, in this particular event, the type is quite important. Unit 731 was known to be developing a new and highly lethal toxin named acetone cyanohydrin. The effects that this would have had are very similar to hydrogen cyanide. Now, investigators aren't 100% sure that the substance was actually hydrogen cyanide, but the victims exhibited signs similar to what that substance would have caused. Ultimately, Hirasawa died of pneumonia on May 10, 1987 while still condemned to the mass murder at the Tagen Bank. Around 6 a.m. at Lake Bodum, a group of boys noticed a tent in the distance collapse in on itself as a tall blonde man walked away. This is the case of the gruesome murders of Lake Bodum. A group consisting of two girls aged 15 and two young men aged 18 sat out on a camping trip on June 4th, 1960. The girls' names were Anya Maki and Amela Bjorklund. The boys were named as Seppo Boysman and Niels Gustagsen. Anya, Mela, and Seppo were all stabbed through their tent early in the morning. Investigators estimated that it was between 4 and 6 a.m. As for Nils, he sustained a shattered jaw and a concussion as well as a number of other facial injuries and was found outside of the tent. Seppo had several stab wounds, the lethal one being on his lung, but his skull had also been crushed from a blunt object. Mela had three injuries on her head that were also from a blunt object as well as 15 stab wounds. She was also found lying underneath Nils. There was also a pillowcase with semen which was later tested against all of the suspects. However, it is unknown whether this pillowcase belonged to the campers or not. As mentioned earlier, there was a group of boys who noticed a blonde haired man leaving the tent, but the actual bodies were reported by a carpenter named Esko Johansson. He discovered the remains at 11 a.m. and immediately called police, who didn't arrive until midday. Niels and Mela were discovered outside of the tent, and Niels was fortunate enough to be the sole survivor of this gruesome attack. Police promptly hauled him off to a Red Cross station before starting their investigation. The crime scene was an absolute mess, and there wasn't much to go off of at the location itself. Investigators noticed that the killer had left behind some items such as the keys to the victim's motorcycles. Neil's shoes were later found buried about 500 meters from the tent. The crime scene was further ruined after soldiers were called in to assist in the search for missing items. The site was trampled over and any evidence that police may have had were being handled before they were even recorded. After a few weeks, investigators decided to hypnotize Nils in an attempt to dig up valuable information that could lead to the culprit. They were able to obtain a description from Nils which led to various drawings, but they didn't lead to an arrest. 
The culprit was aged anywhere from his 20s to 30s with an average if not slightly heavier build. His face was round, he had long blonde hair, red cheeks, a short neck, long forehead, dark beard, and was wearing a checkered shirt and a multicolored sweater which included the colors black and green. The killer was initially believed to be a man named Pauli Custa Luoma, who was a labor camp escapee. However, he was later proven innocent. One of the more interesting suspects was a man named Hans Asman, who lived nearby Lake Bodum. He was found smack dab in the middle of various murder cases, but to sum things up quickly, it seemed like he was just a liar that liked to get involved in various unsolved cases. Hans also had a family, which made some people think that he didn't have it in him to brutally stab a girl 15 times. Another suspect was Nils himself. Authorities thought that it may have been possible that Nils got into a heated argument with Seppo while they were drunk. Remember Nils' shoes which were found buried? Well, the blood of the other three campers were found on them, but Nils' DNA wasn't. Nils was even put on trial in 2005 where the prosecution requested a life sentence for Nils, but he was later acquitted and granted monetary compensation for false accusations. This next entry takes place in Ibadan, Nigeria in March of 2014. A group of motorcycle taxi drivers set out in search of one of their colleagues after receiving concerning text messages from him. The man sending the text messages was named Kazim and in one of his texts, he stated that he had been lured into a rundown building in the forest of Soka. He along with dozens of other people were being held captive. Kazim had somehow snuck his phone into the building, hence how he was able to contact his friends. Kazim described the place as a long abandoned construction site, but the most disturbing things about his messages were the evils being committed in the forest. It has been known by locals for a while that the forest was dangerous, but no one really knew why. Kazim's friends eventually found the forest using clues given by him and they will never forget what they saw. Immediately upon stepping into the wilderness, the stench of rot filled their noses. All around the abandoned construction site were decomposing bodies. There were rows and rows of unmarked graves and trails of blood. Inside the dilapidated structure, there were dozens of starved men and women. However, the people responsible for running the site were nowhere to be seen. Just what was going on here? Investigators believed that it was an illegal organ farm where organs were being sold off on the black market, or they were being used as items in black magic. Within Nigerian culture, there is something called Nigerian juju. This is where practitioners sacrifice various offerings as part of a ritual for whatever their heart desires. Almost anything can be offered, including hair, nail clippings, etc. But for the darker spells, much more valuable items must be sacrificed. Caucasian people were even more valuable as it was said that their body parts could bring extra amounts of fortune and good luck to the caster. Rumors spread that the people running the business were backed by wealthy Nigerians, some of which may have even been government officials. Immediately after the discovery of this forest, riots began to stir. Authorities and various security forces then stepped in to protect the site, and they even utilized tear gas and guns to hold off the angry protesters. And this obviously just pissed off the residents even more as many of them had missing loved ones that were likely killed in that forest. They asked officials why was the security just now stepping in when it had been known that something was happening in the forest for years. No one was ever charged for the crimes committed in the Ibadan House of Horror and after being demolished, a school was built on top of it. And to my knowledge, there was never an investigation done for this crime, or at least no serious official ones anyway. This entry focuses on a boy named Shinya Matsuoka who was 4 years old in 1989. The family consisted of two kids and a mother and father. Previously, it also included a grandmother but she passed away on March 5th, 1989. The family visited Tokushima to attend her funeral and stayed over at a relative's house for the night. At 8am on March 7th, the father took Shinya and his sister out for a stroll. They were out for about 10 minutes before they headed back home. 
But Shinya wanted to stay outside, so they decided to drop off his sibling, then Shinya and his dad would continue to walk around. When they return to the house, Shinya's father walks up some stairs carrying a toddler. Shinya was trailing behind his father by just a little bit, but his dad could see that Shinya had made it to the top of the stairs out of the corner of his eye. His father knocks on the door and takes two steps into the house to hand his other child to his wife. And in just a matter of seconds, when he turned around, Shinya was gone. He ran around the house looking for Shinya and yelling his name, but he just couldn't seem to find him. He rushes back inside of the house to let everyone know that Shinya was missing, and then they all put on their jackets and began to search. There were some mountains nearby, so the adults began to worry that Shinya may have wandered into the woods. Eventually, Shinya's father called the police and they had a massive search party searching for his son. There were 15 officers, 100 riot officers, firefighters, and volunteers which totaled to over 200 people. The search continued for several months, but not a single lead was obtained. It is so baffling that Shinya somehow disappeared in just a matter of seconds. The area where the family was residing in at the time was said to be pretty remote, located at the end of a road, which meant that the only people who would be there actually lived in the exact area. There were a couple of field workers about 100 meters away who did not report seeing anything strange. Then on March 16th, something equally as strange as the disappearance occurs. One day, before the family planned to go back home, they received a phone call. Shinya's dad picked it up and a female voice asked, Is your wife there? He hands the phone to his wife and the caller says, I am Mariko Nakahara's mother. My child is in group Moon of the Seikai Kindergarten. We have put together some money to support you. Where should we send it to? Are you returning home soon? The mother replied, we'll be back sometime tomorrow. After a couple of days, the family didn't hear anything about this fund. Shinya's mother didn't want to come across as rude, so she waited a bit longer before getting in touch with the caller. She contacted the school and asked about the parents of Maruko Nakahara, but the school said they didn't have a student under that name. This got Shinya's mother thinking. She recalled that the caller had a Tokushima accent which in hindsight was strange as they lived in Ibaraki. Furthermore, how did this alleged parent of a student know the phone number to the house of one of the family's relatives? How did this person know which kindergarten the kids were attending? This call had the potential to solve the entire case, however, it led nowhere. From 1989 to 1998, there were about 7 to 9 alleged sightings of Shinya. Then in 2018, a man named Ryoto Wada actually claimed to be Shinya Matsuoka. Ryoto did appear similar to Shinya, but after DNA testing, it was determined that Ryoto was not him. It has now been over three decades since the boy disappeared, and both the family and investigators are just as confused with this event as ever. There are some theorists that believe that Shinya's father was actually the person responsible. From what I could understand, his wife never actually saw Shinya at the top of the stairs. This led some to believe that the father had actually taken care of Shinya sometime before returning to the home, because he was the only one who claimed to have seen Shinya right behind him. But again, decades passed and there hasn't been any serious progression in the case. Zeb Quinn was 18 years old and lived in Asheville, North Carolina when he went missing on January 2nd, 2000. It was about 9pm when Zeb had finished his shift at Walmart. Zeb made plans to visit Lester with one of his co-workers named Robert Jason Owens in order to purchase a new car. After his shift, the two met up in the Walmart parking lot and talked for a little while before heading out in separate vehicles. Security cameras captured the two leaving a gas station around 9.15pm after purchasing some sodas. Robert later claimed that Zeb was flashing his headlights behind him signaling for him to pull over. Zeb said that he had received a page and needed to find a phone to return the calls. He went off to look for a payphone and when he returned, Robert said that he was acting frantic and randomly blurted out that he needed to cancel their plans. Zeb then took off in his car and rear-ended Robert's truck in the process. Then a few hours after that incident, Robert visited a hospital where he was treated for his fractured ribs and a head injury. 
According to Robert, he has sustained these injuries from a car accident right after Zeb left him, but there was no report ever made to police about said accident. The next day, Zeb's mother, Denise, filed a missing persons report for Zeb. Then just a couple of days after this report was filed, an unknown man claiming to be Zeb called Walmart to say that he wouldn't be in for work because he was sick. The employee that answered the call said that the guy on the other end did not sound like Zeb. The first person to be questioned was, of course, Robert Owens, who later admitted that he was the one who made that call to Walmart impersonating Zeb. Robert stated that Zeb had asked him to call in sick for him. Another person of interest was a woman named Misty Taylor. Misty was a love interest of Zeb's. Apparently, Zeb had developed a friendship with her not long before his disappearance, but Misty's abusive boyfriend, Wesley Smith, learned about this and threatened Zeb to leave Misty alone. Investigators later discovered that the page Zeb received came from the home of his aunt, Ina, but Ina denied ever making a call and said that she was having dinner at a friend's house. This friend just so happened to be Misty's mom. Both Misty and her boyfriend, Wesley, were also there. Ina did bring up the fact that she filed a report with police saying that her home was broken into that same evening, but nothing was taken from her. Fast forward to January 6th, Zeb's Mazda protege was located in a parking lot at a barbecue restaurant. The vehicle's headlights were left on and there was a pair of lips and an exclamation mark drawn on the back windshield and lipstick. Furthermore, there was a black Labrador puppy left inside the car. There was also a plastic hotel key card, several drink bottles, and a jacket. Police couldn't locate the hotel the key card belonged to. Zeb's mother, grandmother, and sister all worked nearby that restaurant, so it is widely believed that whoever left it there intentionally selected this location in hopes that one of the three would find it. A couple soon contacted police informing them that they saw the person who drove the car. They were brought in to provide details for a composite sketch which turned out to look strikingly similar to Misty Taylor. On March 17th, 2015, over a decade since Zeb's disappearance, Robert was arrested for a different incident which involved the murders and disappearances of a woman named Christy Schoen, her husband, and their child. Robert pleaded guilty for these crimes but claimed that he had accidentally run them over. He also pleaded guilty to two counts of dismembering. And this is where investigators made a major discovery in Zeb's case. When authorities went to investigate Robert's home, they found fabric and leather materials as well as bone fragments under a layer of concrete on Robert's property. Then in July of 2022, authorities publicly revealed that a while back, Robert had told them that a family member had killed Zeb. Then they burned his remains and left them somewhere in the Bent Creek Experimental Forest. Robert later accused his uncle, Walter Owens, of taking Zeb's life. However, investigators cannot confirm this as Walter died in 2017. According to Robert, what had happened was Misty's boyfriend hired Walter to kill Zeb. Walter lured Zeb into meeting Misty into the Pisgah National Forest. But instead of meeting up with Misty, Zeb encountered Walter. He then shot Zeb with a 22 caliber rifle, then proceeded to dismember him. Robert added that he helped him cover everything up. But as of now, police can't say for certain that this is what actually had happened. Robert was ultimately sentenced to 12 and a half to 16 years in prison for the previous crimes he committed. While some do believe Walter was the one responsible, some think that it was actually Robert and he's only making up this lie knowing that Walter isn't there to actually argue against him. It's possible that he's forking off this crime in an attempt to lessen his sentence. The case of Robert Wohn is one that is filled with holes that just don't really add up and involves several suspicious individuals. The case frustrates many people and they believe that there was some sort of pact of silence made that is keeping this case from being solved. Robert was a 32-year-old lawyer who worked in Washington, D.C. He was murdered in August of 2006 in the home of his college friend, Joseph Price. Robert was working as general counsel for Radio Free Asia and decided to stay the night at Joseph's home, which was less than a mile from his office. This decision cost Robert his life. 
The three men lived as a polyamorous family. Robert arrived at the residence around 10.30 p.m. Then around 11.50 p.m., Victor called the police asking for an ambulance. When officials arrived, they discovered Robert's body clinging to life, but unfortunately, he later passed away at the George Washington University Hospital at 12.24 a.m. August 3rd. Again, the three men present with Robert were Joseph, Victor, and Dylan. Investigators were immediately suspicious of them, but they claimed that an intruder had broken in and killed Robert. They all denied any involvement in his death, and they all attended Robert's funeral. Paramedics later stated that they found it eerily unusual that the three men didn't exhibit much emotion when they arrived. They didn't even bother pointing medical officials in the direction of Robert's body. Police later publicly claimed that the crime scene had been tampered with. There were accusations that the area around Robert's body had been extensively cleaned. Authorities swept the entirety of the building, removing pieces of floor and walls in order to gather evidence. At first, the case didn't make much progress as the police only really had those three men as their suspects. But all three of them kept insisting that they were not responsible. Then in October of 2008, Dylan Ward was charged with obstruction of justice. Then the next month, Joseph and Zaborski were also charged with obstruction of justice and arrested. Not long after, charges of conspiracy were also filed against the trio. This is where we find out that police were building a case against these three ever since Robert's death. Their report said the following, The evidence demonstrates that Robert Wone was restrained, incapacitated, sexually assaulted, and murdered inside 1509 Swan Street. There exists overwhelming evidence, far in excess of probable cause. They obstructed justice by altering and orchestrating the crime scene, planning evidence, delaying the reporting of the murder to authorities, and lying to the police about the true circumstances of the murder. Investigators went on to say that the knife they found near Robert's body had been planted there after someone covered it with blood. Police believe that the real knife was hidden or disposed of. Apparently, the wounds that Robert sustained did not match up with the knife that was found either. There was also evidence alluding to some amount of suffocation and puncture marks along Robert's neck, chest, foot, and hand. But medical officials couldn't detect any toxins in Robert's blood. Cadaver dogs also hinted at the likelihood that someone washed themselves on the back patio, then dried their clothing in the dryer. But on June 29, 2010, Judge Lynn Leibovitz found all three men not guilty of any of the charges. However, the judge did later say that she did believe that those three knew exactly who killed Robert, but it was definitely none of them. Robert's wife filed a wrongful death lawsuit against the three men in 2008, which was settled in August of 2011 out of court. To this day, we still don't know who killed Robert Wohn. Danny Philippidis is the name of a man who went missing on a mountain in New York during a ski trip before reappearing in Sacramento, California not even a week later with no memory of what happened to him. It was February 7th, 2018 when 49-year-old Toronto firefighter Danny Philippidis was skiing down the Whiteface Mountain in Wilmington, New York. Danny was a married father of two kids who loved to visit various mountains for skiing. This event was an annual trip that Danny went on with his colleagues and retired firefighters. On the very last day of the trip, around 2.30pm, one of the men in the group said that he was feeling a bit nauseous and needed to head back. Danny, on the other hand, was having the time of his life and wanted to stay behind. So instead of heading back, Danny went down the mountain one more time all alone. Just as Danny's friends reached the lodge, a massive snowstorm began to hit the mountain, making it incredibly difficult to see. At about 4pm, ski lifts began to close, yet Danny still hasn't returned back to the group yet. Given that the weather was turning really bad, they grew worried about Danny. About half an hour later, they reported Danny missing. They rushed back to the resort to where they were all staying, just on the off chance that Danny went straight there. But yet again, there was no sign of him. In his room was his passport, phone, and ID. His car was also exactly where he left it. Forest rangers, ski patrol, and a group of volunteers trekked up the mountain in an attempt to locate the now missing Danny. Unfortunately for them, the weather kept getting worse, and by the end of their search, they couldn't find Danny or any sign of him. By the next day, police, Homeland Security, and U.S. border officials got involved. 
Additionally, when the news of a missing firefighter made its rounds, over 100 firefighters traveled to New York in order to help with the search, while an equal amount agreed to take up their shifts back home. There were a staggering 6,000 plus people searching for Danny. Helicopters, drones, and dogs were also used. Danny was last seen in a green jacket, black helmet, goggles, and he had red skis. As the one-week mark drew closer, people began to lose hope that they'd be able to find the missing firefighter alive. But that's when a shocking discovery was made. Danny was found all the way in California. It was about 9 to 10 a.m. on February 13th when Danny's wife received a phone call from a caller that she did not recognize. Upon answering, the caller called her by her nickname, and that's when it clicked. The caller was her husband, Danny. He said that he was at the Sacramento airport and he needed help immediately. Danny's wife then called police who notified officials in Sacramento. Danny was found in the exact clothing that he went missing in. However, while he appeared normal on the surface, mentally it seemed as though he had suffered from something. When asked what a blue sign looked like, he said that it was green. In his possession was a brand new iPhone, a credit card, and $1,000 in cash. His colleagues later stated that he had also gotten a haircut in the time that he was missing. Medical officials suspected that Danny may have sustained some sort of head injury. Danny couldn't seem to remember much during the time he was gone, but he did say that he was riding in some sort of a large truck. After being examined by doctors at a nearby hospital, they determined that he had no signs of any injuries. Furthermore, he had not consumed any substances or alcohol. Police tried finding the driver of the truck that Danny claimed he rode in, but the driver was never identified. About half a year after Danny resurfaced, he said in an interview that he may have taken an incorrect turn when attempting to locate his car back at the resort. Investigators think that he may have taken a fall and, in the storm, wandered to the kids' hub which was closed. From there, he tried to find his car but failed at locating it. Then he traveled to a nearby road where he hailed down a passing truck all while being dazed. All Danny could remember from the ride was that the driver had some sort of generic name, which obviously doesn't help. After being dropped off in downtown Sacramento, Danny said that his first thought was to call his wife, but he couldn't remember her number, nor did he have a phone on him. But he did have a credit card which he used the next day to purchase a phone after he remembered his wife's number. A brain surgeon in Toronto proposed the idea that Danny suffered from amnesia as a result of a concussion. It may have been possible that Danny hit his head when he was coming down the mountain and developed retrograde amnesia, but again, medical officials couldn't find any signs of injury on the man. Another strange aspect is that if he did have amnesia, the doctor stated that it shouldn't have lasted any longer than 48 hours. Although, there are some very rare cases where the loss of memory extends into several months. Danny was missing for nearly a week and couldn't remember a single thing. Then, when he accepted the interview six months later, he still couldn't recall much. Another doctor proposed the idea that Danny experienced a different form of amnesia called a dissociative fugue state. Fugue or fuga is the Latin term for flight and is a very rare condition where the person loses their sense of identity and impulsively travels around. They lose chunks of their memory and they have no idea who they are, and sometimes they even make up fake identities in an attempt to tie themselves to something. This can be caused by a head injury or even by traumatic events, but either way, no medical professionals are certain just what happened to Danny, nor does anyone know who the driver was that picked him up. The Soda Killer refers to an incident in Causid, Nebraska where a camera caught the gruesome murder of a woman named Leah Rollins. Leah was a 41-year-old mother who had recently divorced her abusive ex-husband. Following her divorce, she moved to the small town of Causid with her two sons. For the most part, Leah's life seemed to be on the up and up. She had received a promotion at a moco station where she worked and was in a relationship with a new man that cared for her and her kids. But her life took a turn for the worse on March 10th, 1997. Leah was in the middle of her shift at the convenience store when a shaggy looking man with no shoes walked in. He had on sweats and a dark colored bomber jacket and was careful to wait for the customers in the store to exit before he commenced his disgusting plans. As soon as the mother and her child exited the store, the man grabbed a soda then headed to the counter where Leah was standing. 
He opens the soda and takes a look at the camera, almost as if he was mocking whoever was going to see the footage later. With the use of a firearm, the man ordered Leah to empty the cash register and lie on the ground face down. He then proceeds to shoot her several times with his 9mm semi-automatic pistol. Afterwards, he nonchalantly exits the store and gets in his red 1993 Pontiac Grand Am. Eventually, a new customer entered the store and discovered the grisly scene. They reported the crime to police who didn't take long to arrive. And the most frustrating part of this entire event was that there was an abundance of evidence, but the killer was never caught. His face was well documented by the camera, his license plate was picked up, and he even left prints all over the store. One officer later said the man was very brazen, very confident in what he was doing. Most investigators are of the opinion that this was a random crime and Leo was simply a victim of the wrong place at the wrong time. Although, some have suggested that the man knew Leah and taking the money from the register was just a way to cover up the true motives of the crime. Cause it was a small town and nobody recognized the man's face, so this meant that more than likely he was not a local. Leah moved in from Arkansas, so could this man have come from there? Investigators attempted to try and find a reason in which the man could justify killing Leah, and all they could come up with was he either had a personal vendetta against her or he was a complete lunatic. But then again, the killer was eerily calm throughout the entire incident, making it seem like this was not his first time killing. This could support the idea that Leah was not some random victim. Leah's brother Roy believed that it was actually Leah's ex-husband who hired a hitman to take out Leah. Roy said the following in regards to the killer's clothing. This guy who killed my sister comes into that gas station with clam diggers on. That's when your pants are rolled up to your knees and that's what people in the bayous or in the southern hemisphere do. So this guy in Nebraska, which is not warm, comes in with his pants rolled up, which tells me I think he was from St. Thomas, the Virgin Islands, and I think my brother-in-law paid him to come up and shoot my sister. Leah and her ex actually owned a restaurant in St. Thomas before they broke up. It's been nearly three decades since Leah's death, making many people think that the killer will never be caught. It's not like investigators had no information on the killer at the very start and have been working at obtaining more evidence, no. Essentially, all one would need to solve the case was hand given to authorities, but they still have not been able to identify the man, leaving most people hopeless. During the mid-1940s in Mattoon, Illinois, there were a series of gas-based attacks by an unknown individual who has gone on to be called the Mad Gasser of Mattoon. Victims of these gas attacks reported symptoms such as paralysis in their lower limbs, coughing, and vomiting. Thankfully, nobody died as a result, but nevertheless, this entire series of events is very strange. The first attack happened on August 31st, 1944 in a suburban neighborhood where a man named Urban Reef awoke from his slumber after noticing a distinct odor. Shortly after noticing the smell, he began to feel nauseous and was not able to support his own weight on his two legs. Not long after, he began to violently vomit. Urban's wife suspected that there was some sort of gas leak and rushed to the kitchen to see if something had happened there. But before she could make it all the way to the kitchen, she collapsed to the floor, paralyzed from the waist down. That same day, a neighbor of Urban's reported similar events within her home. Her daughter was paralyzed in bed and also vomited several times. The very next day, September 1st, a third incident involving another odor was reported. This one occurred at around 11pm and the woman described it as sort of sweet, which made her think that the smell was actually her flowers. Quickly, she began to lose feeling in her legs and she yelled for her sister. She also noticed the odor and went to call the police, but by the time they arrived, the smell had faded. Then just one and a half hours later, the woman's husband returned home and noticed a masked man crouching near one of the windows of his home. He yelled at the man, which caused him to flee. 
police thought that money was the sole purpose behind all of these attacks, as the residents in one of the homes stated that they were counting cash near a window and someone may have seen them. Nearly half a dozen additional gas attacks were reported in the following weeks. One of the victims found a handkerchief on their front porch and after holding it close to their face, they instantly collapsed to the floor. Police believed that this cloth was meant to incapacitate the family dog. And not too far away, police also found a skeleton key, which if you do not know is essentially a makeshift master key. With the key, there was also a tube of lipstick. After the police made a public announcement that there was someone trying to break into homes by the use of gas, residents began to grow paranoid, causing a massive influx of false reports to come in. In the end, no one was caught and the commissioner of public health had the following to say, There is no doubt that a gas maniac exists and has made a number of attacks, but many of the reported attacks are nothing more than hysteria. Fear of the gas man is entirely out of proportion to the menace of the relatively harmless gas he is spraying. The whole town is sick with hysteria. It was February 2nd, 2009, when a woman named Christine Ross was walking her dog in West Mesa in the Albuquerque area. As they were walking, her dog eventually started showing signs of agitation and barked in a certain direction. Christine allowed her dog to lead her and that's when it brought back a bone that looked almost like a human femur. That's because it was a human femur. Christine took a picture of it and sent it to her sister who was a nurse. She told Christine that she needed to call the police immediately. Police investigated the area and over the following month, they discovered additional remains. Initially, they thought that they had the remains of 13 different victims, but this was later reduced to 11. The victims were all women or girls, with the youngest two being 15 years. And most, if not all of them, were of Hispanic descent. They all went missing around 2003 to 2004. Monica Candelaria went missing in May 2003, Doreen Marquez in October 2003, and the following victims went missing in 2004. Veronica Romero in February, 15-year-old Jamie Barella and cousin Evelyn Salazar in March, Solania Edwards in May, Virginia Cloven in June, Cinnamon Elks in July, Julie Nito in August, pregnant Michelle Valdez in September, and then Victoria Chavez. However, it isn't exactly known when she went missing in 2004. In 2005, a detective investigating one of these cases named Ida Lopez began to notice similarities and linked several missing persons cases together. Apparently, when Cinnamon was still alive, she was telling people about a crooked cop that was killing and burying women on the West Mesa. Then, just weeks after she started spreading these rumors, she disappeared. Julie Nito's family said they heard similar rumors and they, along with two of Julie's friends, reported Julie missing. Julie was also talking about these supposed burials on the West Mesa. Detective Lopez began to group all of these names together and she ended up with over two dozen names. Some of the other victims whose remains were not found but were on Lopez's list were Darlene Trujillo, Christine Julian, Anna Vigil, Felipa Gonzalez, Nina Heron, Chantelle Waits, and Leah Pibles. No one has ever been convicted of these crimes, but there remains a list of notable suspects. One of these suspects was a man named Lorenzo Montoya who died in 2006. He was murdered by the boyfriend of a 19-year-old dancer that he killed. Montoya has been a person of interest for quite some time as they obtained an audio clip where it sounded as though Montoya was duct taping garbage bags. Furthermore, he was frequently in the middle of other assault cases involving women. Another suspect was Joseph Blea aka the McKinley Middle School most investigators paid Joseph no mind in regards to the case of the bones, but his DNA was discovered on some clothing found with them. He was also known for stalking escorts in the night and taking advantage of them. He is currently in prison serving a 90 year sentence and refuses to speak on the West Mesa case. The Isdal women refers to an unidentified female found dead at the Isdalen Valley aka the Ice Valley in Bergen, Norway on November 29, 1970. 
Police believe that the woman died of suicide, however, there are various details that may suggest otherwise. It was November 29th, 1970 when a man took his two daughters on a hiking trip to the Ice Valley. Unfortunately, the location is also often referred to as the Death Valley by locals due to the vast amount of suicides and accidents in the area. The girls noticed a smell that they did not recognize, but it did seem like something was burning. The group ventured closer to the source until they discovered the charred body of a woman. Immediately, they headed back from where they came from and contacted police. The front of the woman's body was severely burned to the point where her face was unrecognizable. Nearby was an empty bottle of alcohol, two plastic water bottles, a passport holder, boots, some clothing, a purse, and a matchbox. Just a couple days later, by chance, police found two suitcases which actually belonged to the same woman. Although the contents weren't all that notable, there were no items inside that could lead to the identification of the woman. Medical officials determined that she had passed away from carbon monoxide poisoning and inside of her lungs was suit which suggested that she was still alive when her body was burning. Furthermore, her neck was bruised and after testing her blood, it was found that she had consumed anywhere between 50 and 70 sleeping pills. Authorities later located the hotel that she was staying at before she died. Hotel employees said that they last saw the woman on November 23rd. Police later discovered a notepad which had some obscure dates belonging to the woman. They were able to quickly decipher the dates as moments where the woman visited other locations in Europe. She also used about eight different fake passports and aliases during her travels. Another odd behavior was that the woman seemed to change rooms as soon as she checked into her various hotels. The employees described the woman as beautiful and was estimated to be about 5 foot 4 inches tall. The case leaves many questions unanswered. Due to her peculiar travel tendencies, many people believe that she was tied to some sort of secret crime ring. Some suggested that she may have even been a spy involved in the Cold War. There were some records that were declassified from the Norwegian Armed Forces that highlighted the parallels in the women's movements to the trial locations of the Penguin Missile. A fisherman in Stavanger even claimed that he saw the woman and then a shoe salesman believed that he sold her some rubber boots. In 1991, a taxi driver contacted police saying that he was the one that drove the woman after she checked out of her last hotel. He claimed that shortly after picking her up, an unknown man got in as well to join the trip to the train station. This man was never identified. Then about five days before her body was discovered, a hiker said he saw her with two other men on the hillside of Flayen. The hiker noticed that the woman seemed a bit withdrawn and worried that she was some sort of hostage. So he reported the sighting to police, but they said to just forget about it as it was probably nothing. Investigators later developed a theory that the woman may have been an escort based on her travel patterns. She always seemed to go back to the same point eventually. This could very well have been her home. She made an effort to remain anonymous and the sightings of her with different men were all points that could support this theory. There was some evidence at the sight of the woman's body that made it seem as though someone else was there. So it seems that the two prevailing theories revolve around murder or assisted but due to details such as the bruises found around her neck, some people believe that it was the former. Mozart's decline in his health caught many people off guard and has since developed a certain mystique around itself. In order to talk about his actual death, we must first take a look at what happened from September to December of 1791. Mozart's condition was gradually getting worse since he arrived in Prague in August of the same year. As a result of his declining health, he had to return home to Vienna in September. When he arrived, he was still fighting off some ailments, but at the very least, he was able to work on his music to an extent. Another month passed and Mozart wasn't getting any better. He began telling his friends and family that he may have been poisoned. But just like that, his health abruptly got a bit better, only to get worse after a couple of weeks. From November 20th onwards, Mozart was bedridden. He was frequently vomiting and parts of his body began to swell. He kept exclaiming that he was in constant and immense pain. Ultimately, his body succumbed to the conditions and Mozart died on December 5th. 
Medical officials did not perform an autopsy, but one doctor named Edward Von Loebs stated that there were no signs of foul play or poisoning. Despite having a respected medical official saying that Mozart died of natural causes, the public couldn't help but speculate on the possibility that Mozart was actually poisoned. Some people thought that Mozart may have been poisoned with aqua tofana, which was a lethal substance created in Sicily in the 1630s and primarily consisted of arsenic and lead, but also included substances such as mercury and chlorine. It does have a distinct odor. However, if one were to mix it with something like wine, it would be tough to detect. But who would want to poison Mozart? He didn't exactly have any enemies. Plus, if he was poisoned by Aqua Tofana, he would have died in three days and not months. But this doesn't rule out the possibility that he may have ingested a different poison. Others propose that Mozart was suffering from an extreme deficiency of vitamin D. There was also the possibility that he died from trichinosis after eating a dinner that had undercooked pork chops. All kinds of different theories were being thrown around. But one of the more mundane and commonly agreed upon theories suggests that Mozart had a chronic kidney disease that went untreated. If true, it would explain the signs of immense fatigue that Mozart displayed from his 20s and 30s. The disease could have resulted in uremia, which killed him over the course of several months. The case of Harry Horse and Mandy Horn is one that has sparked much debate since its inception. Harry Horse, or Richard Horn, was a cartoonist and author, with Harry Horse being his pen name. Richard's wife Amanda, or often referred to as Mandy, developed a terminal illness and for her last two years of life, Richard had been nursing her. Richard was given an extended leave of absence from his Sunday slot in the weekly newspaper in order to spend more time with his wife. On January 9th, 2007, two of Richard and Mandy's friends decided to go to their home, but they claimed that Richard was acting a bit strange. One of the things he said was, it's a wonderful night for a killing. His wife Mandy also asked the two several times to not leave. They told her that they couldn't stay, to which she kept insisting and begging. Ultimately, the two left. Then at 9.40am the next day, those two friends headed towards the airport to get on a flight to return home. But they had to stop by Richard and Mandy's again since one of them had forgotten their jacket. When they arrived, they knocked on the door expecting Richard to come out and greet them, but nobody came. They waited a bit longer and still they received no response. The door was not locked, so they decided to just step inside, and what they found sent waves of confusion and shock down their spines. The couple's two pets, one dog and one cat, had been stabbed to death, and not far away was Amanda with well over 30 stab wounds, and Harry with nearly 50. But the most grotesque part was that Harry's male organs had been mutilated. Since Richard and Amanda were lying next to each other on their bed, many believed that this was some sort of twisted Romeo and Juliet pact. However, it didn't take long for discourse to brew. News outlets began to state that it was much more likely that Richard took a large volume of various substances before proceeding to stab Amanda to the point where the knife broke. He then took his own life in a crazed state of mind. It was known that Richard had issues with his mental well-being, but many people do not think that Richard was capable of such a thing. And even more baffling was during the autopsy, medical officials could not find any signs of drugs within Richard. Just how was he able to inflict nearly 50 wounds on himself, then proceed to mutilate his own member? Some suggested that the two friends may have played a role and are not being entirely truthful with police. The combination of Richard's already poor mental health as well as the tragic reality of losing his wife nearing, Richard may have just snapped mentally. This could very well have been an episode of psychosis and nothing more, but let me know what you think. And oftentimes, whenever this incident is being discussed, the topic around a video game that Richard developed is also mentioned. The title of the video game is Drowned God Conspiracy of the Ages, which came out in 1996 and is a science fiction adventure game. But that is an entirely different rabbit hole that can be talked about for hours. 
Many members of the public and investigators have obsessed over the strange death of Josh Maddox. His daily struggles and liveliness were traits that many were able to relate to, making the case all the more intriguing. Josh grew up in Woodland Park, Colorado and lived nearby some woods and hiking trails. His sister Ruth described him as a friendly guy who loved the outdoors. He also enjoyed hiking, fishing, and camping with his friends. Ruth was quoted saying, He was my best friend and he always inspired me to strive for greatness. Josh would tell me that one should never say anything bad about anyone else, ever, and I tried to be more like him. Josh was one of the nicest people I have ever met, and I am very proud to be his sister. He loved to read and was a brilliant writer. Josh was a wonderful person with a bright light that enriched the lives of everyone around him. Josh's other sister, Kate, had similar words. His IQ was off the charts. He spent most of his time writing fictional stories and playing music. He had an interesting and unique sense of style. People in his high school class knew him for being that awesome kid who wore a top hat and brought a briefcase to school instead of a backpack. There was this subtle sophistication about him that made him interesting and a standout. Josh and his family also faced many hardships. For example, Josh's older brother Zach took his own life the same week he was supposed to graduate high school. Josh basically idolized his older brother and the loss was very hard on him. On May 8th, 2008, Josh left the family home in order to get some fresh air and go on a walk. While this wasn't a frequent occurrence with Josh, it also wasn't unusual of him to go out and venture around either. However, Josh never returned from this walk. His family was worried when he didn't return, but they thought that he was just hanging out with friends or found something interesting to occupy himself. But that's when Kate remembered something that Josh had told her. He always told us that he was going to have a great adventure and he may not talk to us for a while. When he said a while, we thought maybe a few years. Kate thought that this may have been Josh taking off for that adventure he spoke of. Everyone began to freak out and his father Mike said, I went to work one day and came home and he wasn't there. The next day, he still didn't come home. I called all of his friends. Nobody's seen him. Nobody knows where he is. I didn't know what to do so I called the police. It was five days after Josh's disappearance when police were contacted, which makes it May 13th. At the time, Josh was considered an adult and police suggested that perhaps he had just run away since there were no signs of foul play. They also proposed the idea that Josh may not have gotten over the death of Zach yet. Years gradually passed with no sign of Josh. While most were beginning to think that the worst had happened, Kate tried to stay optimistic. She said, Since Josh was 18, it has been reasonable to assume he may have decided to leave town to start a new life. As one of his two older sisters, I have always chosen to believe that this was the case. I have expected Josh to return home to my father's house at any time with a wife and small children so that they can meet their grandparents and two aunts. Josh had always been known for his musical and literary talent, so maybe we would find him playing music with a band on tour, or catch him writing successful novels under a pen name so that he could keep his preferred lifestyle of solitude in the woods. Josh's father Mike had different thoughts though. Mike searched the nearby campgrounds and wilderness in an attempt to locate his son. He even stopped by several homeless shelters and while he did hope that Josh simply ran away, he worried that Josh may have taken his own life. In addition to the distress that Josh's absence caused, Mike and his wife divorced shortly after their son went missing. In the summer of 2015, a construction crew was in the process of destroying a cabin near the old Thunderhead Ranch, which wasn't far from the Maddox home. The cabin had been abandoned since 2000. 2005. It was August 7th when construction workers entered the cabin to inspect the insides before they demolished the structure. Inside was a chimney with a large table set in front of it. A couple of men moved it and examined the chimney and that's when they saw it. There was an entire body shoved inside of the chimney. The body was upside down in the fetal position wearing only a sweater. 911 was called and investigators were able to extract the body. They contacted Mike and a woman named Pam White. Pam was the mother of another boy who went missing named Lucas. Authorities were confident that the body was either of Josh or Lucas. Mike would later confirm that the body was of Josh. This was obviously a major revelation, however, it just brought along more questions. And the fact that Josh was nearby the Maddox home for so long was greatly upsetting for the family. 
So why was Josh inside of that chimney? If you recall, Josh was only wearing a shirt, but the rest of his clothes were scattered around the fireplace. His pants, underwear, and socks were all there. This just makes things all the more stranger. It was tough to believe that Josh took everything off except for his shirt, walked outside, and then jumped into the chimney. Immediately, people began pointing their fingers at foul play or the use of substances to explain the peculiar position Josh was found in. Since Josh's body was so badly decomposed, medical officials struggled to test for substances, so investigators set their sights on locating any signs of trauma. There were no wounds or marks that indicated that there was a struggle. It may have been possible that Josh died of hypothermia, but that still doesn't explain why he took off his clothes in the first place. One other possibility proposed by an investigator named Al Bourne was that Josh may have been strangled. His bones would not be able to show any signs of this if true. It didn't take very long for investigators to start forming a list of possible suspects. One of the suspects had his name hidden for quite a while, and it would have stayed that way if not for a Reddit post that was made in 2015. The true identity of the user is unknown, but their handle was Gentleman Gina. The original post is still available online if you would like to take a look at it yourself. And being that it is quite long, I will be cutting it down some. I went to high school with this skinny dorky hippie named Andy, who played guitar in a band. I was never good friends with him or anything, but a year or so after I graduated, one of my good friends, Josh, started hanging out with him and then went missing. Last I heard, Andy was telling another friend, yeah, me and Josh have been spending a lot of time together. We're planning a trip to New Mexico. Turns out that in addition to becoming a lot scarier looking, Andy had indeed headed down to New Mexico, where he found himself shooting the shit with the caretaker of a disabled guy. One day, he got invited over to their apartment. The caretaker gets in the shower, and when he comes back out, the disabled guy is stabbed to death and Andy's gone. When Andy got arrested, he also claimed to have killed a woman in Taos and stuffed her body in a barrel. The cops had indeed found a woman stuffed in a barrel in Taos but already had somebody in custody for it and decided to stick with that guy instead. Years later, I found out that the caretaker had died in a bar fight, and without him, the cops didn't have much in the way of evidence somehow. So that case against Andy was dropped too. Andy, or Andrew Newman, had mental health issues since he was in school. At one point, he was in Houston hitchhiking and visiting various homes begging for food, water, and money. Eventually, he came upon a home that let him in and provided him with food. The two that had let Andrew into their home were just teens, so they called their dad, who then offered to drive Andrew to the next county over to get closer to his destination. But instead, he actually drove Andrew to the police station where he was arrested. Andrew was facing several charges not long after, and he attempted to escape jail on September 12th, 2009. Then in 2010, he was sent to the New Mexico Behavioral Health Institute located in Las Vegas. So Andrew himself is an entirely different rabbit hole with a lot of information, however most of it is unrelated to Josh. The reddit post continued and said, several of us went to the cops and said, yo, Josh who went missing was last seen with Andy who's a murderer, maybe you should check that out. Despite a fair amount of pestering, nothing ever really came of it, and by nothing I mean that the police mostly didn't even return our calls, and once accidentally cancelled the bulletin on Josh because he's a alive and well living in the next town over. Except for the fact that in addition to Josh having last been seen with Andy immediately before his stabbing spree, people called in to report having heard rumors that Andy was bragging about having quote unquote put Josh in a hole. Look, I get that they didn't find enough evidence to arrest Andy or anyone else, but they went ahead and demolished a cabin despite all this. Josh's body was cremated. As far as I can tell, nobody even bothered to call Andy to ask if he knew anything. It's not that I want somebody to blame, I'm not trying to throw a tantrum because give me answers. All I'm saying is, I wish they had done some police stuff, open an investigation, try to track down some leads, interview some of the folks who've been calling in tips for the last 7 years, maybe check for some DNA or something, I don't know. Don't just say it was accidental, dust off your hands, and call it a day. Andrew Newman's charges were eventually dismissed and he was let off, but he continued to have run-ins with the law. As far as I know, he was never brought in with the focus of tying him to Josh's death. 
On June 13, 1977, at Camp Scott in Oklahoma, three Girl Scouts aged between 8 and 10 were murdered in cold blood. Lori Farmer, Michelle Goose, and Denise Milner were eager to get to the Girl Scout camp for two weeks of fun. One of the camp volunteers named Michelle Hoffman recalled the parking lot filled with excited girls on Sunday, June 12th. Hoffman vividly remembers Denise Milner arriving at the camp. Being one of the few African American girls on the trip, she was a little nervous. Hoffman went over to introduce herself to Denise and her mother before getting on the bus to go to the campsite. The camp was about 410 acres with the vast majority of it being dense woods. Hoffman walked Denise to her tent which was Kiowa number 8. Each of the tents were named after Native American tribes and several girls were assigned to each one. Inside this tent, Denise met her campmates Lori and Michelle. All three girls bonded quite quickly and before you knew it, they were laughing with each other. The first day was relatively mundane as the organizers just wanted the attendees to get used to their new tent mates and adjust to the new environment which they will be staying in for the next two weeks. Hoffman grew attached to cabin number 8 and went to say goodnight to the girls once it got dark, but they were already asleep. Now, on this particular night, there was a really bad thunderstorm. One of the campers wrote the following in her diary. It was the darkest dark I had ever known. I couldn't tell if my eyes were open or shut. The very next morning at 6am, one of the counselors named Carla White got up to make the final preparations for the day's activities. After doing so, she decided to take a shower which was located down a trail. She briskly walked towards it but saw something strange. At the base of a tree just 100 yards from some tents were some sleeping bags. Carla got closer and realized that inside of these bags were the lifeless bodies of Lori, Michelle, and Denise. Lori and Michelle were completely tucked away inside of their sleeping bags while Denise was laying over the top of them. Carla frantically twisted around and ran for help. The director and nurse returned and confirmed that the girls were deceased. The two-week camp had been called off and police were there to investigate shortly after being contacted. Lori and Michelle had died by blunt force trauma while Denise was strangled. All three were also raped. Investigators determined that the actual attacks happened inside of the tent and the bodies were then moved to the tree. The situation was far too grave for the camp to continue, so the director ultimately sent all of the kids home. One of the girl's parents were in Dallas, so her grandmother had to come by to pick her up. Obviously, the girl didn't really understand what was going on and was disappointed that she couldn't stay at camp. She asked her grandmother what happened and she said, Oh honey, three girls were killed at your camp last night. When she returned home, she wrote in her diary, I came home from camp, three girls got killed. Once she grew up, she shared that she didn't even know what the word killed even meant at the time. Police spent the entire day sweeping the woods for any sign of the culprit and as the weeks passed, they interviewed dozens of different people. It wasn't until June 23rd, 1977 when police publicly named a suspect. He was a 33-year-old convicted burglar and named Jean Leroy Hart. Jean escaped prison four years prior and had been on the run ever since. There was a cave that wasn't too far from the campgrounds where police found items left behind. It is believed that Jean used this location at some point before or after the murders. Ten months after Jean became the prime suspect, authorities were able to capture him. He was living in an old shack at an isolated home in the Cookson Hills. This was approximately 50 miles from the camp. Now, it's during the trial where things get very interesting, you could say. One of the very first things that Jean said in court was, I want you to know one thing, I didn't kill those Girl Scouts. And there was a surprisingly high amount of people who sided with him. The community even organized a hog fry dinner event where people could donate money to help pay for Jean's legal fees. There were also t-shirts made that said, Stop the Mays County Railroad, which was alluding to the possibility that Jean was used as a scapegoat by the police. Being that Jean was also of Native American descent, the Cherokee Tribal Council decided to donate $12,500 US dollars to help out as well. One particular aspect brought to the trial was the cave. There were a pair of glasses, some tape, and photographs that were believed to be owned by Jean as he worked in the photo lab when he was in prison. 
There were also various types of DNA found on the three girls. However, DNA testing wasn't introduced yet, so there were more or less useless. The offense attempted to use a footprint that was found to link Jean to the murders, but this print did not match Jean's shoe size. Then on March 20th, 1979, Jean was declared not guilty. But here's the thing. While Jean was not found guilty for these murders, he still had to serve 300 plus years in prison for his previous charges of rape and burglary. Just two years after Jean died, he suffered a heart attack while exercising in prison. The verdict is a hotly debated topic. After Jean was declared not guilty, police sort of just gave up on the case. They were 100% certain that Jean was the culprit and had put all of their resources into proving Jean was guilty and they failed. To them, they watched a killer get away. But there is one more detail that I haven't mentioned yet. If you recall, there was a volunteer named Hoffman. About two months before the murders, Hoffman was at the camp for a special event. When she stepped inside of her tent, it was an absolute mess. Someone had broken into it. Hoffman left behind a box of donuts which had been completely emptied, and on the floor, she noticed a few notes. There were about four pages, and on the first couple of them, the word kill was scribbled over and over. Then on the remaining pages, it said, we're on a mission to kill three girls. Hoffman reported this to the director, and apparently a group of girls came forward and admitted to writing the letters, but it seems like such an odd prank. And not to mention, it's a suspicious coincidence that a couple weeks later, three girls were indeed murdered. The DNA obtained at the campsite was later tested in 2008, but they were too degraded to be useful. But in 2022, with new advancements in DNA analysis, the sheriff's office urged the families to invest towards another test. The cost for such an analysis was over $30,000, which the family and sheriff's office did not have. Fortunately, the community came together and provided the money through a fundraiser. The test results said that there was a strong likelihood that Jean was involved. Typically, these kinds of tests are very accurate, and saying that there is a strong chance virtually means that it is a match. But since it isn't technically a 100% match, officials can't exactly go out and say, oh, it really was Jean. It does seem that the vast majority of investigators and the public are of the opinion that Jean was the true culprit. But let me know what you think in the comments. Private First Class Jerry Irwin worked as a missile technician at Fort Bliss in El Paso, Texas. It was February 28, 1959 when he headed back to work after finishing a one-month leave in Idaho. Jerry was passing through southern Utah when a jarring flash of light zoomed across the sky. Jerry had to pull over and watch the light pass and disappear over a hill. What was thought to be an aircraft was traveling way too low and Jerry believed that it was going to crash. He quickly scribbled, have gone to investigate possible plane crash, please call law enforcement officers, onto a piece of paper which he left on his steering wheel. Before leaving, he also wrote stop on the side of his car with shoe polish in order to get people's attention to the note. After about 30 minutes, someone finally encountered Jerry's car and the note. And the person just so happened to be a fish and game inspector who promptly called Cedar City Sheriff's Office. Authorities searched the wilderness, but failed to find any signs of a plane crash. But eventually, they did stumble upon an unconscious Jerry. He was unresponsive, so he was immediately sent to the nearest hospital. But the odd thing was that medical officials couldn't find anything wrong with Jerry, so why couldn't he wake up? He was left to rest and the very next morning, he woke up. Immediately, he started questioning the nurses if anyone survived the plane crash from last night. He was surprised to hear that there was no crash. Investigators and news outlets bombarded the man with questions, but Jerry claimed that he couldn't remember a single thing after leaving his car. He was eventually discharged and doctors said that there was absolutely nothing wrong with him and that he was completely healthy. While Jerry appeared fine on the surface, mentally he was fixated on returning to the location where he believed there was a plane accident. One day, he acted on these impulsive thoughts and returned to the road where he had left his car. Jerry said he noticed a note wrapped around a pencil within the jacket, but he never bothered to read it. Then, all of a sudden, Jerry realized that he had left base without informing anyone. He had more or less gone AWOL. He did eventually return to his superiors, and he told them everything that had happened. 
He was reassigned, but did not face any drastic disciplinary repercussions. But then, just a few weeks after this incident, Jerry completely disappeared, and to my knowledge, he was never seen again. As Jerry's story spread across the US, UFO enthusiasts began coming out of the woodworks and stating that what Jerry had experienced was an abduction, while skeptics believe that Jerry had simply lost his mind and ultimately succumbed to the wilderness. This entry takes place in New Zealand on June 30th, 1999. On the Great Barrier Island, a man named Colin Michael Good, aged 51, was found dead in his home. He was found decomposing in his bed along with his deceased dog. There were two rifles inside of the home, but they were not the cause of Good's death. Good was a known cannabis grower and led a reclusive life. He was last seen in April of the same year. Authorities recalled that Good had filed a complaint before his death about an assault on his property by mongrel mob members. The mongrel mob was a gang based in New Zealand. Good claimed that these gang members stole over 1200 USD worth of cannabis from him. Based on what I could find, it seemed that the police ignored this claim and did not bother investigating it. The strange part of this case is that it is unclear how Good died. Upon discovery, his right hand was missing, which was enough for authorities to declare his death as a homicide. The man who tipped police off to the possibility that Good may be dead died from an overdose in 2002. This man was interviewed before his death, but it didn't seem like he was involved. Detective Superintendent Andy Lovelock said, Our forces have worked extremely hard to get to the bottom of the matter, but unfortunately, due to a number of difficulties, we are unable to arrive at an outcome. Langville refers to an apparent ghost town that was not only unpopulated, but also disappeared overnight. The town was actually referenced in the 2016 remake of Ghostbusters, but being that this is such an obscure location, few people caught it. But nevertheless, it seemed that the film had sparked a renewed interest in the town. If you try and search for photos of Langville online, you won't find any. But according to local legends, Langville really did exist and for whatever reason, it just vanished as recently as the early 2000s. If you look for threads and discussions about the town online, it also seems that you are limited with what information is out there. This could very well be some sort of Mandela effect. Many locals are adamant that there was a town named Langville, but just as many if not more are skeptics who claim that Langville is only fictional. Snea Phillip was the name of a 31-year-old doctor working in Manhattan on September 10th, 2001. She has garnered internet attention for the peculiar conundrum around her death. You see, there is disagreement on whether Sneha is dead or still alive somewhere out in the world. She was initially part of the 9-11 victims list, but she was later retracted and her official date of death was changed. Additionally, the details of Sneha provided by friends and family compared to police are remarkably different. The last documented trace of Sneha was when she was talking with her mom over instant messenger in her Manhattan apartment on September 10th. It isn't exactly known where she went off to from there. People have claimed that she used the chaos of the 11th to escape her complicated life, while others believe she was simply another casualty. Sneha's husband, Rond, stated that she didn't return home after work on the 10th. Since it was normal for her to stay out overnight, he expected her to be back on the next morning. However, when the 11th rolled around and Ron heard the news of the World Trade Center, he began frantically calling Sneha's family to see if they knew of her whereabouts, but nobody had heard from her. While Sneha's friends and family believe that she died in the attack helping others get to safety, police have a different idea. Due to her increasingly complicated private life, police believed it may have been possible that she disappeared of her own free will that day. Sneha did not receive a contract renewal at the Cabrini Medical Center due to quote-unquote alcohol-related issues. She was also suspended from State Island St. Vincent's Medical Center, where she had recently obtained a new job at. Reason for the suspension was for substance abuse and not showing up to meetings. Furthermore, it was rumored that Snea and Ron were having issues with their marriage based on various court documents. If you recall, I mentioned that Snea often stayed out at night. 
well on several occasions she also brought home women that she had met at lesbian bars. A police report from Sneha's brother mentioned that he walked in on her and his girlfriend having sex one month before her disappearance. Legally, Sneha was also in the thick of it. She had been arrested and had to spend one night in jail for filing a false complaint towards one of her co-workers. Sneha claimed that a woman had groped her when the two went out. And finally, before she disappeared, Sneha and Ron visited court so that she could plead not guilty to that false complaint. Afterwards, people reported seeing the couple having a massive argument. Ron denied having such a fight at court, and Sneha's family said that she did not have any romantic relationships with women. And the brother of Sneha, who I mentioned earlier, later came out and said that police made up the entire part where he saw his now wife sleeping with Sneha. Her friends added that Sneha did not have any issues with alcohol or substances, but they hinted at a low point in her life where she was very depressed. Ultimately, a surrogate court judge removed Sneha from the list of 9-11 victims in 2004. They said this particular lady was known to be missing the day before. They had no evidence to show that she was alive on September 11th. A different judge officially declared Sneha dead on September 10th, 2004. Sneha's family was both angry and confused as the only scenario that could have played out in their minds was that Sneha died trying to help others. But despite being removed from the list of victims, she was included on the memorial. Many people are of the opinion that Sneha did pass away at the World Trade Center since her passport and credit cards were left back in her apartment. She didn't leave with any items that would have indicated that she planned to disappear. Ron actually hired a private investigator to try and figure out just what happened to his wife. And here is the biggest revelation in this case. Around 2021 to 2022, the New York City Medical Examiner's Office was granted permission to use new DNA technology on various body parts from Ground Zero that may belong to unaccounted for victims, which is well over 1,000 people. Now, it should be mentioned that these body parts are mainly just tiny bone fragments. Medical officials have tens of thousands of these fragments, and possibly one of them could prove that Sneha did indeed lose her life that day. On June 11, 2005, a man named Todd Guy, but who seemed to have everything going for him in life, mysteriously disappeared from a party only to be found dead in a lake weeks later. Todd was 22 years old at the time and worked for Hager Distribution Inc. in Wyoming. It was around 7.30 p.m. on Saturday, June 11th, when Todd left the apartment that he shared with his cousin. He went to visit the Half Moon Bar and Grill to hang out with some of his friends. The group stayed at the bar for about two hours before leaving for an all-night keg party, which was about two miles north of White Road in Casanova, Michigan. The party began to turn sour a little past midnight as various attendees began fighting each other. The thought of a potential all-out brawl made Todd decide to leave the party. He traveled on foot along alone and called one of his friends to let them know that he was on his way back home, which was about an hour or so away. People at the party who noticed Todd leave stated that he appeared totally fine and not impaired at all. But his sporadic phone calls that were made between 12.47 and 12.57 a.m. would suggest otherwise. In those phone calls, Todd said things such as, I've had enough, I'm in a field, I couldn't breathe. One of Todd's friends was worried when she received one of these cryptic calls, so she immediately called him back. The phone was answered, but all she could hear was what sounded like heavy breathing or loud gusts of wind. Those calls were the last trace of Todd as he never returned home that night. A search consisting of over 1,500 police officers and volunteers followed, but no matter where they searched, they couldn't find a single sign of where Todd may have gone. Fast forward three weeks to July 2nd, a couple was out by Ovid Hall Lake and noticed something bobbing around in the water. They were curious and wanted to find out just what it was. As they got closer, they realized that it was a body. Police were promptly notified and they later confirmed that this was Todd Geib. This was a truly baffling discovery. Several different people from the party stated with the utmost certainty that they saw Todd leave in the direction of his home when he left the party. Yet, he was found about two miles in the opposite direction. But this gets weirder. When Todd was found, he was floating upright in the water. Medical officials discovered two types of antidepressants in his body, those being amitriptyline and disipramine, both of which Todd was not known to be taking. He was determined to have drowned to death, but his family is of the opinion that Todd was murdered. 
Four years later, there were new discoveries made in regards to Todd's death. Medical officials found that he died about two to five days before being found, despite being missing for several weeks. But the most vital piece of information was that Todd had no water in his lungs, ruling out the possibility that he drowned. However, Michigan State Police refused to reopen his case. A different group of investigators who worked for the NYPD in the past came up with the possibility that Todd was abducted, held captive, and murdered before being left in the lake. One of the more interesting parts of this case was that Todd consumed two different antidepressants which he was not prescribed. Additionally, the vast majority of doctors would not prescribe this particular combination of medicine since these two paired together could induce more frequent hallucinations and possibly even seizures, along with a plethora of other side effects. It was looking more and more like somebody had drugged Todd. When Todd was found, there was little to no buildup of biofilm or slime around his body. One of the detectives that was part of this new investigation team said, There should be insects in the clothing, even in the mouth, in and on the ears, in the folds of the skin. That's where flies will typically lay their eggs. They've evolved to be attracted to dead things within minutes to hours to a day. If a body was there, it would be colonized with some type of aquatic insect. The detectives recreated the environment in which Todd was found and used five different swine carcasses. In all five scenarios, there were aquatic insects within the first day, and within no more than three days, there were even insect eggs. By the time three weeks had passed, there was a thick layer of biofilm around the carcasses. The Utsurobune incident takes us back to the early 1800s, specifically 1803. A round, saucer-like object washed ashore on the coast of Japan. Locals began to gather around the vessel and they claimed that a beautiful woman dressed in odd clothing stepped out with a box in hand. Nobody could understand what the woman was saying. The story took place in what is now Ibaraki Prefecture and even caught the attention of one professor named Tanaka Kazuo, who was experienced in the field of applied optics research. What sets this story apart is not only the date in which it was documented, but the amount of historical evidence that accompanies it. There is a trove of nearly a dozen documents, each providing valuable information on the Utsurobune incident. Professor Kazuo traced the Utsurobune all the way back to a shipwrecked Russian whaler which may have been the source of this legend, however that isn't known for sure. The professor also found a trail of documents linking the ship to the Shofukuji temple's legend of Princess Konjiki. However, as more details within the documents were uncovered, the legend becomes even more confusing. Some of the documents varied in their descriptions of the ship as well as the woman inside. Some claimed that it was 3.3 meters high and was made of rosewood and iron, complete with glass and crystal windows. And within the vessel was the discovery of inscriptions that were far too abstract for any researchers to decipher. Professor Kazuo remained skeptical about the documentation of the supposed alien aircraft, but nonetheless finds it immensely interesting. Whether it only serves as a decorative piece of history or possibly real documentation of extraterrestrials, the allure remains. One of the more interesting aspects of this particular case is that it predates American UFO sightings by well over 100 years. In a tragic incident on August 16, 1980, the life of 21-year-old Mary Carter came to a horrifying end. By her side were her two children. Waiting for a bus at the intersection of Madison Road and Erie Road in Cincinnati, Mary and her children were saddened to hear that the bus they were waiting for did not have their desired destination. Not long after, a seemingly kind-hearted man offered the trio a ride in his pickup truck. Accepting this ride would later turn out to be a grave mistake. At around 1.45 p.m., the distress of Mary's children caught the attention of a woman in Cincinnati's East End. The children exclaimed that they were unable to wake their mother. The woman then followed the kids to the lifeless body of Mary in a ditch. This particular area was known for its escorts. The woman immediately rushed the kids to a nearby fire station, where the firefighters then alerted police. Mary's autopsy revealed that she was strangled to death, but surprisingly, no signs of sexual assault were found. 
It's speculated that the murder took place in front of her two small children, sparking outrage among detectives who feared that the kids were now forever scarred psychologically. Desperate for leads, law enforcement turned to the public for assistance. Eyewitness accounts describe the truck the trio was seen in as a midnight blue 1976 or 1977 Ford pickup. It also had a 2-3 to three inch white stripe on each side, a black steering wheel, and a light blue interior. The suspect was a white male aged 25 to 35 with blonde or white hair and a dark mustache. He was wearing a white short sleeve shirt, white pants, and brown shoes. Despite releasing a composite sketch and photo of a similar truck, the investigation hit a dead end. Over 100 cases involving blue pickup trucks were investigated, with the hopes that Mary's killer would be exposed. But he was never found. One detail that raised suspicion was that Mary was in the middle of a divorce. Her ex-husband was questioned, but due to a rock-solid alibi, he was dismissed of all suspicions. Investigators later learned that the night before her murder, Mary sold a washer and dryer from her old house. This was a potential lead that could pinpoint the killer. However, efforts to identify the buyer yielded no results. Over the years, an age progression sketch was released, but Mary's assailant continues to evade arrest. In the town of Emelson, Poland in the year 1978, there was an event that would forever etch the name of an unassuming farmer named Jan Wolski into local history. On May 10th, 1978, Wolski was working through his daily farming duties. He was in the middle of manning a horse-drawn cart when he found himself in front of two quote-unquote short green-faced humanoid beings. These two so-called aliens then jumped into Wolski's cart and communicated in an unknown language. Wolski, initially mistaking them for foreigners, steered the cart towards a clearing where a jaw-dropping sight awaited him, an enormous pearly white UFO hovering about 16 feet above the ground. This is when Wolski started suspecting that these two were aliens. Wolski described the craft as a featureless vessel as long as a school bus. It just hovered in the sky, devoid of conventional lights or windows. The craft featured peculiar black drill-like protrusions which emitted a noticeable hum. Wolski claimed that he was actually taken aboard the UFO. Inside, he underwent an examination involving instruments that he had never seen before. Returning home with his unbelievable tale, Wolski eagerly shared the experience with his family. Obviously, his family was a bit skeptical and wanted to visit the location and see the so-called UFO for themselves. Their investigation revealed dew-covered grass which didn't exactly convince Wolski's family, but nevertheless they were slowly believing him. Wolski's son claimed that they discovered extraterrestrial footprints later on. Just like with most UFO reports, if we look at them critically, it's tough to believe that they're anything more than just far-fetched tales. The absence of concrete evidence coupled with the fantastical nature of the encounter invites skepticism but the Emelson abduction remains an intriguing mystery. There is even a memorial built in honor of Wolski's UFO sighting in Emelson. In Polish, there is text saying, On May 10th, 1978, in Emelson, a UFO object landed. The truth will astonish us in the future. In the 1998 World Cup Final, Brazil's collapse stunned the world and left such an indelible mark that the government had to step in and launch a formal investigation into the match. A mere five days before the game in St. Denis, the reigning world champions overcame the Netherlands in a penalty shootout, marking their most formidable challenge in an otherwise dominant tournament. Ronaldo, a two-time FIFA World Player of the Year, played a key role in securing their spot in the World Cup. The stage was set for what should have been one of the most captivating matches in football history as Brazil faced host nation France for the title. The South American juggernaut appeared unstoppable in his quest for a record-extending fifth trophy. However, their dreams unraveled just hours before the highly anticipated match. On the day of the World Cup final, the Brazilian squad had lunch in Lazini just outside of Paris. Upon returning to the team hotel, Ronaldo, sharing a room with Roberto Carlos, broke down in tears. Carlos later revealed that Ronaldo was overwhelmed by the pressure and couldn't stop crying. Around 4 o'clock that afternoon, Ronaldo began convulsing uncontrollably, foaming at the mouth. His doctors and teammates shortly came to his aid. They all assisted Ronaldo into falling asleep. 
One of the team doctors disclosed that Ronaldo had been taking a certain painkiller due to an aggravating knee injury on June 16th. Upon waking up, Ronaldo had tea and his teammate Leonardo informed him of his past convulsions. It was during this time at the clinic that manager Mario Zagallo removed Ronaldo's name from the starting lineup, replacing him with Edmundo. The situation then took a complicated turn when CBF president Ricardo Texiera entered the dressing room an hour before kickoff. What exactly was said in that dressing room is unknown, but Ronaldo arrived 20 minutes later and Zagallo reinstated him in the lineup, removing Edmundo. Zagallo later elaborated on his decision, stating that if he had benched Ronaldo and Brazil lost, he would be criticized for his stubbornness. The official explanation from CBF and players suggested Ronaldo, feeling immense pressure, fell ill but declared himself fit just 40 minutes before kickoff. Obviously, being such a high-profile event, there were many conspiracy theories, the first of which suggests that Ronaldo had a peculiar condition that he was trying to hide. This July 12th seizure appears to be an isolated event in his career, considering he has been playing at a high level for a very long time. It raises eyebrows to suggest that he had suddenly succumbed to pressure. One report from an ESPN employee recounted when the hotel director heard shouting from the doctors saying, he's dead, he's dead. So it's likely that some sort of medical emergency did in fact happen that day. Some seem to think that Ronaldo covered up a pre-existing condition, which worsened when doctors prescribed him certain medications. Another theory suggests that Brazil was actually bribed. Some sources believe that they were offered 15 million euros as well as the right to host a future World Cup if they threw the match against France. Ronaldo was the sole person who did not agree with the terms and thus sat out. However, he changed his mind after Nike informed him that his sponsorship was on the line if he did not play. One of the more prominent theories is that Nike added unjust pressure onto Ronaldo in the finals match. However, Nike later came out and said, with regards to rumors circulating about presumed pressures Nike put on the Brazilian national soccer team so that Ronaldo would play, Nike wants to emphasize that the report of such involvement is absolutely false. Peter Scott Ivers was born on September 20th, 1946, and from a young age, he was captivated with music. While mainstream fame eluded him, he has a sort of small, loyal community who loves his music. He was born in the state of Illinois, and his early days were shaped by his mother, Merle Rose, who was a devoted homemaker, and his father, Jordan, who was a physician that was battling lung cancer during Peter's infancy. Faced with the grim reality of Jordan's illness, the family made the decision to move to Arizona, hoping that a change of scenery may help with his recovery. Unfortunately, fate had a different plan, and Jordan succumbed to his illness in 1949. After Jordan's death, Merle Rose found a new partner in life with Paul Eisenstein, who was a businessman from Boston. Instead of taking Paul's last name, Merle opted for a fresh start and randomly selected Ivers from the phone book as her and Peter's new surname. But down the line, Paul also chose to adopt this new family name. Merle loved music and exposed Peter to it at a very young age, which had played a noticeable influence in shaping him. In 1969, Peter took the bold step into becoming a solo artist. His journey began with the debut of Night of the Blue Communion, which was an album with lyrics penned by Tim Mayer. Peter's musical discography grew as the years went by, with tracks that briefly entered the top 100 singles billboard charts. Then in 1981, he got a taste of commercial success, after writing a song with John Lewis Parker that became widely popular amongst R&B listeners at the time. However, on March 3rd, 1983, Peter was found bludgeoned to death in his Los Angeles apartment. In the aftermath of Peter Ivers' untimely death, LAPD officers dispatched to his residence failed to secure the scene effectively. This lapse allowed a stream of Ivers' friends and acquaintances to walk around in Peter's apartment, leading to the contamination of crucial evidence. The oversight even extended to allowing one individual to depart with blood-stained blankets from Peter's bed. This person's name was David Jove. 
During the investigation, suspicions converged on David, as he had what could be described as a complex relationship with Peter. However, several of Peter's friends had doubts that David was involved. One detective made the following remark after examining the clues. I couldn't say with certainty that he had done anything, but of all the people we knew, he was the one person we couldn't rule out. Additionally, conflicting perspectives emerged within the Los Angeles punk and new wave community arguing for David's innocence. Complicating the case, at the time of his death, Peter had a long-standing romantic involvement with film executive Lucy Fisher. Approximately five weeks after the tragic event, Fisher took matters into her own hands and financed a private investigator, but despite the investigator's efforts, his search yielded minimal results. This was due to a number of reasons, such as the botched initial handling of the crime scene, a scarcity of evidence, and a lack of witnesses. The investigator was not convinced that this was a simple break-in. He said, I do not believe it was just someone off the street that Peter brought in because he was a nice guy. There's no way he brought in this unknown person and fell asleep trusting them. I'm not buying it. Room 1046 takes us to the Hotel President located in Kansas City, Missouri, where one of the guests was mysteriously found dead in his room. It was January 2nd, 1935, when a man named Roland T. Owen stepped inside of the Hotel President after 1pm. He specifically requested that he receive a room that was facing the hotel's inner courtyard. Other guests and employees described him as a man in his 20s or early 30s, and he looked sort of like a brawler. He had what appeared to be a cauliflower ear and a scar on the side of his head. Before heading towards his room, Roland complained to one of the guests about a different hotel he stayed at the previous night. He mentioned that they charged him $5, which was not worth his experience. Roland oddly carried no luggage, but it did appear that he was intending to partake in some sort of important meeting as he was neatly dressed with a black overcoat. Employees of the hotel immediately thought that Roland was a bit strange. Whenever a maid visited his room, it was extremely dark with only the desk lamp to provide light. One of the maids named Mary claimed that when she went inside room 1046, there was a man sitting in the dark which made her feel uncomfortable. She offered to leave and return later in the day, but the man told her to proceed with the cleaning. Mary took note that the man appeared to be rather agitated. He seemed extremely stressed over something and was careful to always stay in the dark. When Mary asked if she could turn on the main lights, the man yelled no. A different maid was in the middle of cleaning room 1046 when Roland commanded her to not lock the door as a friend was going to stop by in just a couple of minutes. That same maid returned later in the day to inspect the room once more. She noticed Roland lying on his bed fully clothed. She thought that he was sleeping so she didn't want to wake him, but she saw a note on the desk that said, Don, I will be back in 15 minutes. Wait. The next morning, she walked by Roland's room and overheard Roland having what seemed to be a phone conversation. He said, No, Don, I don't want to eat. I am not hungry. When the maid went to offer new towels later in the day, she noted that there were two men inside that room. After knocking and offering towels, one of the men bluntly told her that they didn't want them. This voice was not Roland's. The woman staying in room 1048 right next to Roland's room later informed police that she heard what sounded like several men and women arguing with each other. They were loud and were constantly cursing. She grew extremely frustrated over the commotion and was about to call the front desk, but in the end, she decided not to. Now, it may have been possible that what the woman heard was not actually coming from room 1046. There was a large party being held in room 1055 that same night, which may have been the true source of the noise. The elevator operator also reported some rather odd activities that same night. He remembered taking a woman that frequented the hotel with different men to a bunch of different floors in an attempt to locate a certain client that she described as very prompt. The operator spent over an hour taking the woman to different floors and rooms, but they never located her client. Fast forward to 11pm on January 3rd, a man named Robert Lane noticed someone in the street in front of Hotel President trying to flag down help. The description given by Robert matched up with Roland. Robert also stated that the man was seriously hurt. There was this large gash on his arm, and he suspected that Roland may have also been internally bleeding. The man asked Robert to help him get a cab before saying, I'll kill that guy tomorrow. The next day, the hotel phone operator noticed that the phone to room 1046 was not hooked. 
so she asked a bellhop to stop by the room and check on it. However, when the bellhop reached the room, there was a do not disturb sign outside and the door was locked. Regardless, the bellhop knocked several times on the door, but no one came out. Then suddenly, someone in the room said, come in and turn on the lights. But again, the door was locked, so the guy couldn't get inside. The bellhop eventually gave up and just yelled, hook up the phone, before returning to the lobby. But after an hour went by, the phone was still not hooked up. Another bellhop named Harold Pike was sent to the room to check on the guest again. Harold also received no answer after knocking repeatedly, so he ended up using his pass key to get through the door. When he stepped inside, his eyes immediately moved towards the nude man lying on the bed. Harold just rushed towards the phone and placed it on his hook before leaving and locking the door. Then, just a few hours later, the phone in room 1046 was yet again off its hook. The first bellhop, Randolph, was sent to fix the issue. Again, there was no response from knocking, so he used his passkey to get inside, and this time, he found Roland on his hands and knees just a couple of feet from the door. He went to flick on the lights, and that's when he noticed a massive amount of blood. Roland himself was also in terrible shape. Randolph rushed back to the lobby and called police. When officials arrived, Roland was clinging to life. It was clear that he had been tortured for a prolonged period of time. Investigators estimated that the bloodstains had been there for hours at the very least, meaning that Roland was being tortured well before Randolph's first visit to the room. Shortly after entering the hospital, Roland slipped into a coma. On the way there, he was also falling in and out of consciousness, and when questioned as to what had happened to him, Roland simply said, I fell against the tub. That same night, Roland died in the hospital. It was only after his death when the hotel employees learned that Roland T. Owen was not this man's real name. Police rushed to put out a sketch with the heading, Do You Recognize This Man? Police were able to find the hotel that Roland mentioned he stayed at previously that he complained about. But it turned out that the staff never encountered anyone under the name Roland Owen. But they did recognize the person in the sketch. They stated that this man checked in as Eugene K. Scott. He also shared that he was from Los Angeles. However, there was no information on any men named Roland Owen or Eugene Scott in LA. Within his room, police discovered that all of Roland's items and clothing had also been taken. Again, he didn't bring any luggage, he only had a brush, comb, and toothpaste. But nevertheless, they were all missing. Investigators did find a few items though, such as a hairpin, safety pin, unused cigarette, a bottle of diluted sulfuric acid, and a tie label. There were also fingerprints on the phone, which were initially thought to belong to a woman, but this was later ruled out. They also did not belong to the bellhop that touched the phone. The exact owner of the prints was never identified. And no matter how deep the investigation got, police just couldn't figure out who Roland really was. Then, all of a sudden, another strange occurrence took place. Preparations were being made for Roland's burial when an unknown man called police telling them to postpone the ceremony as he wanted to pay for a proper funeral. And shockingly, the funeral home responsible for Roland's burial did receive an unmarked envelope with cash inside. It was more than enough to cover all of the expenses. Additionally, 13 roses were sent to Roland's grave with a note that said, Love Forever, Luis. Then, one year later, a random woman encountered Roland's sketch in a magazine and claimed that he was her son. According to her, this guy's name was Artemis Ogletree. The woman said that Artemis left home at the age of 17 in 1934 in order to hitchhike to California, but the man appeared to be much older. Artemis's mother also stated that she received several letters from her son and a phone call from someone claiming to be his friend. All of the letters were from Roland, and the phone call claimed that Roland was in Egypt. The letters were also sent after his death. And down the line, the identity of Roland was confirmed to be Artemis. But even after this revelation, we still have no clue why he was killed or who did it. Rabies is such an interesting yet terrifying disease. 
the single-stranded RNA virus can be carried within a warm-blooded mammal and gradually creeps along the subject's nerves before reaching the brain, causing physical and behavioral irregularities. And next thing you know, you're dead. After symptoms begin to show, it has a fatality rate of over 99%. I think I want to talk about this medical mystery in a dedicated video later on, so for now, we'll just take a look at some of the outliers where people have actually survived this disease. If treated shortly after exposure, and before any symptoms begin to arise, the host can definitely be saved. One case of a survivor takes us to 1970 Ohio, where six-year-old Matthew Winkler woke up to the sensation of a bat biting his thumb on October 10th. And before we continue, I think it's important to state that the rabies vaccine is sort of strange in that it is administered after contracting the virus. Matthew was transported to the hospital where doctors began giving him this vaccination. About three weeks later, Matthew began to have pain in his neck. Then a heavy fever and dizziness followed. Then on November 4th, he slipped into a coma after he displayed a significant loss in strength and cardiac irregularities. But by the end of the month, he was out of the coma and he was actually able to walk again. However, Matthew did need to attend a variety of therapy sessions in order to retain his previous speech and intellect. There seems to only be about 20 to 30 documented cases of people overcoming the disease after displaying symptoms of the infection. About 30% of those people were able to make full recoveries. In 2004, there was the controversial treatment known as the Milwaukee Protocol, which involves chemically inducing the host into a coma before pumping them full of antiviral drugs as well as other substances. By 2012, 35 patients were treated with the Milwaukee Protocol, but only two of them made full recoveries. While some thought that the Milwaukee Protocol could be some sort of a godsend, it is far from it. Nevertheless, it still shows some promise in a disease that was previously known to be essentially 100% fatal. There is a lot of debate on whether the protocol should be improved upon or ditched entirely. Rabies itself is such a mysterious disease. If you examine the wound in which the virus enters the human body, you can see virions during a 10 day period. But once that window closes, they disappear and the incubation process begins. And this is where things just become really weird because this process can take anywhere from a couple of days to years to finish, and nobody knows why that is. Those virions make their way to the spinal cord and then eventually to the brain. The virus is somehow able to remain in a sort of stealth mode, you can call it, until it is prepared to unleash its attack on the brain, and by then it is already way too late. Your immune system's defenses become quickly overwhelmed. For now, there is no surefire cure to rabies after symptoms begin to arise. In front of several witnesses, double amputee and single father Doug Cleaves was shot dead by a masked shooter in 1985. Doug had recently gone through a divorce with his wife Charlotte. The ordeal became all the more toxic when the topic of who would keep their son was brought up. Very cruel words were exchanged, which included accusations that Doug was an abuser of cocaine. But despite these accusations, the court ultimately granted Doug with the custody of his son Robert. Doug was a construction worker, and shortly after closing the book on the custody proceedings, he found himself in an electrical accident at work. This accident forced Doug into a position where he needed to have his legs amputated. His wife Charlotte saw this as an opportunity to obtain custody of Robert, so she petitioned for a change in custody. In the end, the court denied Charlotte's motion. Since Doug had to remain in the hospital, caregivers were looking after his son. In September of 1985, Doug was allowed to leave the hospital. His sister Susan had recently quit her job in order to help Doug transition back into everyday life as well as help care for Robert. So after leaving, Doug and his son moved into an apartment with Susan in Anchorage. Doug was a very ambitious man and wanted to get as close to his normal life as he could and he didn't particularly enjoy the rehabilitation process. While he was frustrated, he was not going to let this life-altering injury define who he was. One of the nurses who assisted Doug said he was difficult to work with because he wanted to move forward so quickly, and he was angry, which is just a normal part of that sort of horrific life-changing injury. His life changed in split seconds so dramatically. Of course he was angry. 
He was grieving the loss of his limbs, the loss of a lifestyle. Nurses get that, we totally expect that and respect the process. But just as he was beginning to get into the swing of things, life had other plans. It was October 19th, 1985 when Doug was hanging out with his sister, girlfriend, and neighbor. Doug's son, Robert, had just been sent off to spend the weekend with his mother. The group had crab legs for dinner and watched some TV. They were having a great time until around midnight. That's when somebody approached Doug door and began knocking on it aggressively. Susan went to see who it was and after cracking the door open, she saw a masked man standing on the other side. In that split second of seeing the man with a hunting rifle in hand, she tried to slam the door shut, but the man had stuck his firearm through the crack and was now leveraging the door open. The man easily overpowered Susan and in seconds was rushing into Doug's home. And this is where things get interesting. The man straight lined it all the way to Doug as soon as they made eye contact. Doug was lying on the floor without his prosthetics. He immediately started begging for his life saying, hey, don't shoot. I understand what's going on. Don't shoot. We can work this out. But the man did not care. He shot Doug five times before fleeing the area. Police arrived on the scene at about 12.20 a.m. Susan told them that the man was wearing a ski mask, a tan-colored trench coat, and combat gloves. He was on the thinner side and between 5 foot 6 inches and 5 foot 8 inches tall. But because of the physical description of the shooter, investigators thought that there was a slim chance that they were actually female. In the month of October alone, there were over six shootings in the area, which took Doug's death out of the limelight, and thus this case quickly faded from the public's view. So it seemed as though Doug knew who the shooter was, or at the very least, why he was being attacked. One of the more prominent theories suggests that the incident was a result of a substance deal gone wrong. If you recall, Charlotte did accuse Doug of using cocaine. She also shared that Doug sold marijuana, although it doesn't seem like there is much evidence, if any, to support this. Doug was known to occasionally smoke marijuana, but he was never known to be a user of hard substances. Another commonly mentioned theory relates to money. That accident that Doug lost his legs in was on the premises of a construction site. So because his employer was liable, he was going to be receiving a very large payout. Doug had already begun talking to his sister about his plans with the money. He wanted to put it towards an air taxi business in Alaska. Doug planned to hand this business down to Robert when the time came. And if it wasn't clear by now, Charlotte really despised Doug. And some have proposed that Charlotte is responsible for hiring a hitman in order to obtain custody of Robert as well as the money that he was about to inherit from Doug post-death. Some people do think that accusing Charlotte is a sort of grasp of straws, which could be true, but it's always important to investigate those that could have something to gain when it comes to a murder case. Robert was ultimately placed under the care of his mother and she was not suspected of having any involvement in Doug's death. Then in 1989, an Anchorage homicide investigator informed the public that they had a very solid case built against a suspect that they believed was Doug's killer but they wanted the absolute best evidence to make sure that the case was foolproof so they did not want to press charges just yet. And to this day, they still have not charged anyone. There were rumors going around sometime in the 1990s about fake social workers abducting children. It is unclear how this story came to be, but it seems that similar events have occurred all around the world. One such event occurred in late February of 2018. In Queenbee in Australia, a mother of two reported a random encounter with a man and a woman. After contacting the police, they made the following statement to the public. The man and woman claimed to be FACS caseworkers and produced what appeared to be an identity card. They stated they were there to check on the welfare of the children. The mother stated the children were asleep and told the pair she could call them to return when they woke. However, the pair stated that they would wait. A short time later, the mother presented the children to the pair in the lounge room. After checking the children and their bedroom, the pair left the home. The woman became suspicious of the visit and contacted Queenbean FACS, who confirmed they had no record of the visit from any of their caseworkers and the matter was reported to police. The man was white, somewhere in his 30s, slim, 6 feet tall, dark hair, and had a large nose. As for the woman, she was also white, in her 20s, 5 feet tall, medium build with curly hair. Both of them were wearing formal clothing. Ever since this encounter, there has not been another like it in that specific area. 
We can take a look at an incident from 1990 where a woman named Elizabeth Coupland was in a similar situation. Many like to point to this as the beginning of these fake social worker reports. Two individuals approached Coupland's residence in Sheffield, England. Filled with concern for her children's safety, Elizabeth let the two visitors into her home. They proceeded to inspect her kids, one of which was two years old and the other an infant of less than six months. Following their examination, the two visitors departed, leaving Elizabeth with lingering concern. But then just a few days later, one of the women reappeared, accompanied by a male partner. And they had some distressing news. They said that the children had to be removed from Elizabeth's home and placed into foster care. And immediately, this sent waves of fear, confusion, and anger through Elizabeth. She was skeptical to say the least. She threatened to involve the police, which caused the pair to flee the area. Curiously, the NSPCC denied any knowledge of these visits, asserting that none of their representatives had visited Elizabeth on that specified day. This infuriated Elizabeth even more. A group of people had just attempted to walk off with their kids by impersonating people of authority. Police treated the incident with gravity, conducting a thorough investigation that failed to uncover any evidence of misconduct by government officials. Nevertheless, this incident marked the onset of a series of similar encounters during that time. In that same year, Operation Child Care was launched in South Yorkshire. The claims from Elizabeth and others sparked the need for investigations into those who were pretending to be social workers. It aimed to tackle reports of child abductions and abuse supposedly done by social workers or folks pretending to be them. Detective Superintendent David Foss was the man leading the show. He had 23 different police departments and agencies all teaming up for this massive project. Foss later said the trickiest part was people falling for the media drama, swallowing allegations without any real proof. He also mentioned later on that sure, some complaints might be legit, but most of them were just blown way out of proportion. This was a statement made by one of the officers investigating the issues. There have been no arrests. The bottom line is there is more than one team involved. There were a few reports that we felt were worth investigating, but a lot of the reports were malicious by attention-seeking people. Even with all the complaints from Elizabeth and other anxious parents, the police didn't really have the information to investigate particular people of interest. Ray Wire, the sexual crimes consultant with Operation Child Care, had his two cents about how these allegations played out. Pulling something like this is a seriously risky move. Plus, no babies actually got snatched, though some kids got checked out. What the heck was happening? There are way easier ways to get a hold of a baby. After poking around claims all over South Yorkshire and beyond for years, they wrapped up Operation Child Care in 1994. The cops rounded up over 250 reports of fake or bogus social workers, but they figured only 18 were worth a second look, and only two of them were actually legit. But even with Operation Child Care throwing in the towel without any arrests, worried parents in the UK weren't letting up on the claims. Anne Wiley, another young mother, had a story similar to Elizabeth's. This time, it went down over 200 miles away in the Scottish town of Hamilton. Back in October 1994, a stranger showed up at Anne's door wanting to examine her toddler. Anne later told police, It struck me as odd right from the get-go because no one usually comes to my back door. This lady claimed she was my new health visitor and came to review his medical records. He had asthma. I asked her, you got any ID? And she said, oh, I must have left it in the car, which my regular health visitor never does. I peeked at the car and there was a guy in there smoking, which was weird because you wouldn't expect health visitors to do that. So I asked her my son's name and she hesitated. But then she whipped out this file, and I don't know if it was my son's, but she seemed to know all his medical history, how long he'd been in the hospital and such. She chatted with my son, but it was pouring rain. So I said we'd all better head inside. I took my son in and she was gone. Anne described this woman as being in her 20s, around 5 foot 4, with a slim build, light brown hair, and a small mark under her right eye. Another encounter involved 35-year-old mother Lenny Stewart from Edinburgh in April 1995. According to Stewart, a woman tried to snatch her 4-month-old baby. 
The intruder was a fake health visitor there to check on her baby. Lenny said the smartly dressed lady grabbed hold of her infant daughter and tried to make a run for it. Stewart had to put up a fight, claiming she threw a punch to get her baby back. The whole incident got reported to the cops and was initially tied to other attempted abductions in the area. However, the police later backed off this claim, saying there were sightings of a sketchy woman around but no actual kidnapping attempts. Neighbors stayed on high alert in the days and weeks that followed, but stayed skeptical about Stewart's story. Just a few days later, a spokesperson from Lothian and Borders Police said the following, We're not on the lookout for anyone related to the incident. Case closed. There were some people who accused Stewart of making up this story as a way to grab attention, but Stewart obviously wasn't having it. She had to put up a public fight against these rumors. She said, As far as I'm concerned, I'm sticking by my story. No hoax. It all went down just like I said. I'm not going to be hit with wasting police time. I've heard whispers about it. The investigation's done. And if you want more info, go ask the police. There was a moment when the cops seemed to be toying with the idea of slapping charges on Stewart for filing a false police report, but that eventually just fizzled out. Same goes for any of her own stories about a weirdo trying to snatch her kid. Many people think that the whole thing never actually happened, but that didn't stop it from being another headline-grabbing incident in the UK. There are dozens of additional incidents that are similar to the ones we just went over, but none have resulted in an arrest that has tied to any sort of underground organization or anything like that. On the morning of Monday, November 16th, 1987, two men were out hunting and wandering through the woods down south from Eureka, South Carolina. For those acquainted with this specific region of South Carolina, you'll know that there is a stream of water known as Shaw Creek. While navigating through the wilderness near the creek, the hunters made a shocking discovery. In contrast to the soil, there were white skeletal remains positioned face down with their legs crossed and arms outstretched. This individual was left undisturbed for years. There were no signs of any clothing or personal items. A police officer showed up about 30 minutes later and noticed that the remains seemed to be deliberately arranged. Upon investigation, it was found out that the remains had been there for quite some time as roots had grown over the bones of the fingers. This was also supported by the absence of any insects around the body. It suggested that decomposition had finished quite a while ago. But exactly how long, officials weren't entirely sure. Their guess was anywhere from one to five years. The police quickly extracted the remains for further examination that morning, but realized some of the bones were missing. The South Carolina Law Enforcement Division, also known as SLED, assisted in searching the area and continued to help in the following weeks and months to identify the remains. Investigators brought along a heavy-duty metal detector to the creek hoping to find some clues, and they were able to unearth a single item, a brass shell casing, likely from a shotgun. The casing was actually buried further underneath the body, and interestingly, it was missing several characteristics that are seen in newer shotgun shells. And as time went on, officials uncovered more details. The victim had distinctively high cheekbones, suggesting a possible African background with potential influences from European, Indian, or Caribbean roots. She was on the taller side, ranging from 5 foot 8 to 5 foot 10 inches tall. She also weighed about 150 to 160 pounds. The victim also had a healed up broken nose, some patchwork on the right knee, and they even pulled out her first molar on the lower right when she was a kid. By the time she passed away, she was missing at least four other teeth and had a noticeable overbite. A big deal for investigators was finding cocaine in her hair. Initially, authorities thought that this was going to be a big breakthrough for identifying her, but as time went on, it mostly pointed towards missing escorts and people dealing with substance problems in both South Carolina and Northern Georgia. At first, the police thought she might be a migrant farmer who vanished from a nearby farm. In the area, there was this farm owner who had gotten fines for breaking rules about migrant workers before. Even though he didn't have any known workers around that time, the police kept an eye on him. Not as a suspect, but as a possible lead to figure out who this woman was. Maybe she worked there years ago and suddenly disappeared. 
In July 1989, a facial reconstruction was created, but to this day, she is still unidentified. However, investigators soon learned that they were slowly zooming out on a much larger picture as they would go on to find three more victims over the next six years. All of these cases were tied to each other due to their striking similarities. It is very likely that they all met their ends from the same culprit. On November 10th, 1986, a woman named Jacqueline Council, often referred to as Jackie, dropped off her youngest child at school. This was the last time she was ever seen alive. That same day, her family reported her missing, but it took a very long time for any real progress to be made. About one year later, the remains of a young black woman were found near Shaw Creek. However, authorities did not know at the time that this was actually Jackie. Then in January of 1993, a third body was found. And this is where we take an even darker turn. Unlike the previous two victims, this one was intentionally set on fire. Pretty much everything that could have possibly helped in IDing the victim was destroyed. Iken County Coroner Sue Townsend provided an estimate placing the presence of the body within the wooded area between two and five years. The fire was also determined to be a post-mortem burning, while the cause of death was a wound to the back of the neck. Authorities do believe that this was most likely a stab wound, however, there is a remote possibility of it being a gunshot. This third victim was also never identified. The fourth victim is a woman named Aristine Durden, who was born on February 6, 1960. Initially, police didn't think that she was actually tied to the Shaw Creek killer, but later on, this opinion changed. Ristine was last seen on March 13, 1989. Due to some geographical circumstances, some investigators didn't think that this fourth victim was related to the previous three, but Ristine was eventually linked to them due to her similar profile. Ristine was also a young black woman and was abandoned without any clothing near a body of water. While it is more or less 100% agreed upon that the previous three victims are all related, there is still some debate on whether or not Ristine was a victim of the same culture. Culprit. Fast forward to March 15th, 1994, the Iken County Sheriff's Office caught wind of a potential person of interest in what was evolving into a serial killer investigation. The man's name was Frank T. Potts. He was a migrant worker with a footprint across the southeast. He was known for adventuring and he has gone as far north as Illinois and Pennsylvania, making friends in every state along the way. In the eyes of his neighbors, Frank was a pretty nice guy, always ready to lend a hand to friends in a bind. He eventually acquired some land in northern Alabama where he built a cabin. And what Frank's friends didn't really know about him was that he harbored a dark side as well. In the early to mid 80s, he faced imprisonment for the egregious crime of an 11 year old girl in Florida. Remarkably, he was released after serving a mere six years of a 15 year sentence. Following his release, Potts resumed his occupation as a migrant worker, traversing the eastern regions of the U.S. A concerning incident in 1992 thrust him back into the eyes of law enforcement. While in Alabama, Potts was caught by a game warden for hunting without proper equipment or a permit. Rather than facing the consequences of these violations, Potts chose a more provocative course of action. He resorted to kidnapping the game warden, holding him at gunpoint. Furthermore, Potts, a convicted felon, was not allowed to possess a firearm, and the particular firearm that he had was an illegal one. It isn't exactly clear how this particular situation ended, but the game warden did survive. In 1994, Potts faced arrest in Florida for the conviction of yet another 11-year-old girl. Following a conviction on this charge, he was handed a life sentence, requiring a minimum of 25 years in confinement for the recurrent offense. However, this was not the end of his disgusting crimes. During a search of his 40-acre property in Alabama where he had constructed his cabin, law enforcement unearthed the remains of a young man who had disappeared in April of 1989. He was identified as Robert Earl Gines, who was a fellow migrant worker accompanying Potts. For the murder of Robert, Potts received a second life sentence. But this sentence would only be served if his previous sentence got vacated, which was highly unlikely. Before we end this entry, let's briefly go over the details once more because I did sort of hop around a lot. The initial Iken County Jane Doe was discovered in 1987 along Shaw Creek. They were undisturbed for a duration of one to five years, indicating a time of demise between 82 and 1986. The next victim is Jackie Council, who went missing on November 10th, 1986. 
her remains surfaced in 1991, followed with their identification in 1999. The third victim was Ristine Durden, who vanished on March 13, 1989, from Georgia. Then in 1993, the remains of the victim who was burned were discovered. Two of these murders took place in the mid-1980s, while two others just a few years down the line. To this day, investigators have not been able to identify the culprit. Duncan McPherson is a former professional hockey player whose remains were discovered on a mountain after he mysteriously disappeared years earlier. Known as the happy guy by his friends and family, Duncan's life revolved around hockey. Growing up in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, he shared the typical Canadian kid's love for the game, but he was a bit more of a standout. He was tougher, more defensive, and way more skilled than the other kids in the neighborhood. As the years rolled on, his skills got even better, earning him the name McPherson. And before you knew it, Duncan had a real shot at going pro. By the time he hit 17, McPherson was already on his hometown team, the Blades. Even though the Blades didn't quite make the playoffs in 83, Duncan left the coaches seriously impressed. Fast forward to the 1984 draft, Duncan was selected in the first round as the 20th pick. And despite being offered this opportunity with the New York Islanders, Duncan decided to stick with his hometown team a little while longer. But he did eventually go pro when he joined a minor league team in Springfield. Unfortunately, his time with them was tough. Injuries kept him on the bench more than on the ice. He messed up both knees and tore his rotator cuff not long after joining. To make matters worse, he got the boot at the end of the 1988 season, leaving him unemployed. Facing career-threatening injuries at the young age of 23 was a daunting experience for McPherson. Realizing that he hadn't earned a college degree, he understood that his options were limited and turned his focus toward European leagues for a potential comeback. A few weeks into reaching out to them, he received a call from Ron Dixon, the owner of a British hockey league based in Dundee, Scotland. Dixon expressed interest in hiring McPherson as the head coach for the Tayside Tigers, with the added perk of playing hockey part-time. Uncertain about Dixon's credibility, McPherson cautiously agreed to meet in person to discuss the terms and finalize the contract. In the midst of these developments, McPherson shared with his parents and a few friends a somewhat perplexing claim that the CIA had approached him for recruitment. Whether or not this was a legitimate recruitment is unclear. However, this sparked various conspiracy theories among the public years down the line. McPherson agreed to meet Dixon on August 12th, 1989. Leaving on August 9th, he borrowed a vehicle from his friend and former teammate, George. McPherson mentioned to George that he planned to spend a day or two at a ski resort in Austria before the meeting with Dixon. He was always interested in snowboarding, so McPherson saw this as the perfect opportunity to hit the slopes. Heading to the Stubai Alps, McPherson spoke with an employee at a popular ski resort on August 9th. He informed the employee about his plans to go snowboarding on the mountain. Unfortunately, that marked the last time anyone saw McPherson alive. Despite the foggy weather which kept most skiers and snowboarders at their resorts, McPherson was undeterred. A bit of bad weather wasn't going to stop him from enjoying the slopes. When McPherson didn't show up for their scheduled meeting, Dixon grew concerned and reached out to Duncan's family to figure out what had happened. His parents immediately sensed that something was wrong. Duncan was eager to get back into hockey and finalize the details of the contract with Dixon. The problem was that they didn't initially know where Duncan was. Austrian police weren't very helpful initially, suggesting that as a grown man in Europe, he could change plans without informing anyone. About six weeks later, the McPhersons decided to head to the Stubai Alps themselves to search for Duncan. They learned that he had borrowed George's car, which was found in the resort parking lot with most of his belongings inside, including his passport. Now, taking the situation seriously, Austrian police initiated an extensive search for Duncan. Despite their efforts, neither the police nor the McPherson family could find any trace of Duncan. Over the next 14 years, the family made nine trips to the Alps, desperately searching for any sign of Duncan or clues about what might have happened to him all those years ago. Unfortunately, their efforts proved fruitless. However, everything changed in 2003 when an employee at the Stubai Glacier Resort spotted a glove protruding from the snow. Initially mistaking the glove for discarded trash, the employee soon realized that they couldn't be more wrong. Picking it up revealed McPherson's frozen body. 
Immediately contacting the authorities, they uncovered the 23-year-old's remains beneath the snow. The frozen ice had remarkably maintained his body and the clothing he wore years earlier. An ID card in his jacket pocket confirmed the body as that of Duncan McPherson, with his broken snowboard still strapped to his back. After retrieving McPherson's body from the frozen ice and snow, authorities found signs of trauma. His left femur was crushed, and his leg and forearm were severed from his body. Additionally, he had two broken bones. Officials concluded that these injuries were consistent with an encounter with machinery. The resort conducted an investigation into Duncan's death, determining it to be accidental. The prevailing theory was that he had veered off trail during his snowboarding adventure, fell into a crevasse, and met his demise. Various theories circulated about McPherson's death. Some speculated about a CIA involvement in a secret mission. However, the most plausible scenario suggested that a resort employee plowing snow on the glacier that evening accidentally ran over Duncan. It's conceivable that Duncan may have sustained an injury, leaving him immobile, possibly a broken leg or a fall into a small crevasse. The snow plowing machinery, unfortunately, broke McPherson's snowboard in the process. When the resort worker realized that they had accidentally run someone over, who possibly may have been alive at that point, they shifted Duncan's body into a much larger crevasse and covered it with snow. A Canadian pathologist later verified this account, stating that the injuries sustained by McPherson were likely a result of both a forceful fall and an encounter with a machine. So if this was indeed how Duncan met his end, who was responsible for it? Linda Gibson, described as a lively and easygoing 21-year-old by her younger brother, Clayton Gibson, was loved deeply by her family. Clayton said she was real shy, she loved her family, and we love her too. Linda was the best sister in the world. The Gibson family had deep roots in the Somerset, Kentucky area where Linda had spent her entire life. In 1994, Linda resided with her four-year-old daughter, Stephanie, in close proximity to the family. On July 3rd in 1994, according to Clayton, Linda was looking after her younger half-brother, Cody Garrett. Describing Cody as a sweet and innocent four-year-old, Clayton mentioned that Linda's daughter, Stephanie, was under the care of Linda's mother on that particular day. Clayton explained that together, the half-siblings went for a walk to the nearby grocery store. However, they never returned home. According to a press release from the Pulaski County Sheriff's Department, Linda and Cody were last seen walking along Bourne Avenue near the Dairy Mart. The following day on the 4th of July, their family reported them missing. It took four entire days for the Pulaski County Sheriff's Department with assistance from the Somerset Police Department to locate their bodies. The bodies were discovered in a remote area outside of Somerset, concealed by tall weeds. The investigation suggested that Linda and Cody had been murdered elsewhere and their bodies were then dumped in the field. The details surrounding any evidence left behind remained unclear. Clayton, however, believed that DNA was present as Linda was the kind of person who would have fought back against her attacker. In the weeks leading up to July 3rd, Clayton revealed that Linda had confided in him and their father about feeling threatened. Despite their father pleading for information to help Linda, she would only cry and not disclose details about the person she feared. Clayton said, The way we lost her was terrible. She was only 21 and she had been used and abused, and that little 4-year-old baby didn't do anything to nobody. It was tragic, the way we lost them. Cody was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. However, according to a press release by the Pulaski Sheriff's Department, the ongoing investigation has identified potential suspects and investigators are focusing on those leads. Lake Okeechobee resides in Florida and has been the site of various stories revolving around ghosts, treasures, and monsters. For example, one day in 1956, a pilot was flying over the lake and reported seeing some massive tracks in the mud. He thought that this could only have been made by a dinosaur. Tales like this one are abundant in the area, but most people discredit them as random babblings from the locals. But underneath all of those far-fetched stories lies one mystery that is relatively believable, that being the Lake Okeechobee skeletons. This story can be dated all the way back to the early 1900s where fishermen reported catching human skulls. Some even reported that during low water, the lake looked like a pumpkin patch with the amount of skulls that were there. In 1918, the water was said to have reached an all-time low, and those that witnessed it reported hundreds of skeletons from adults to children. 
children. How did all of these remains wind up in one location? Some people suggest that this may have been the result of a violent hurricane in the area. If this is to be believed, then the hurricane was likely pre-1900s as the 1926 and 1928 hurricane victims were all recovered and buried elsewhere. But then again, if it was a hurricane from that long ago, there weren't enough people living in the area where hundreds of remains would be left in the lake. Other suggestions revolved around battles held in the area such as the 1837 Battle of Okeechobee, but there were not enough casualties in that fight to match up with the amount of remains. According to a number of anthropologists, it may have been possible that the lake served as a burial site for an old civilization. There was also a legend that suggested over 200 Seminoles decided to commit mass suicide instead of being captured by an army, so in their final seconds of life, they flung themselves into the lake. But just like with all the other theories, that's all it is, a theory without much evidence to go off of. The exact date of this event is unknown, but sometime in 1987 in the Qinling Mountains in China, there was a small village with about 1,000 residents that mysteriously vanished. But along with all of the people, the cats, dogs, and livestock also disappeared. Being such an obscure location and event, sources and information are either unreliable or scarce. Some of the local news outlets were even known to fabricate stories in an attempt to get readers. One elderly man who lived just outside of the village said, A large number of troops were dispatched to the site. They moved the whole village somewhere else overnight and persuaded the people to come along. Locals began calling the event Operation Nightcat, claiming that the government had hauled off the entire population of the village in order to be tested. While some may think that the idea of the government being responsible for this is a slight bit far-fetched, others believe that it is the most viable explanation. There were several other events that were said to be covered up, or at least there were attempts at hiding, such as an incident in 1996 that involved a failed rocket launch that resulted in the deaths of approximately six people. The rocket had veered off course after liftoff and tragically crashed into a nearby village. Now, the articles that I used to research this topic were translated from Chinese, so there may be some inaccuracies. But apparently, the village that the rocket struck no longer exists, nor is there any sort of memorial for the victims. Along with the theories regarding a cover-up, there are almost an equal amount of UFO theories. There were rumored to be sightings of bright lights in the sky the night the village went missing. But aside from the words of a few locals, there really isn't any evidence to prove either of these theories so far. On one spring day in 1996, five junior high school students in Ichikai, Japan were heading home after a group activity. Their usual route led them down a town road bordered by a bamboo grove. On their walk, they noticed a peculiar looking blue futon bag sealed with a black cord. Now, this isn't their first encounter with this bag. They seen it previously in March, but only now decided to investigate it. Just as a joke, the students had speculated about a body inside the bag due to an unusual smell. With a stick, they prodded at the bag, sensing that it was soft yet heavy. They noticed that the bag was torn in two places. With the stick, the students peeled back the openings, and that's when to their shock, a pale human hand emerged. A strong, unpleasant odor overwhelmed the students. They sprinted off to the nearest house and shared the discovery with the adults inside. After confirming the finding, the homeowners contacted the police. The bag was on a road that was frequently used and it was close to residential homes and, ironically, adjacent to one of Ichikai's garbage collection sites. Police estimated that the body was left there for about a month, and they were surprised that it wasn't disposed of in a nearby pond that was fairly deep. And because of this detail, police believed that the perpetrator was likely unfamiliar with the area and not a local resident. During the initial on-site investigation, the police had a hard time examining the body because it was severely decomposed. All they could confirm was that it was a male. Unfortunately, medical officials couldn't figure out the cause of death due to the advanced decomposition, but they did find bruises around the hip and lower back as well as missing front teeth. 
Due to the condition of the body, the police treated it as a homicide and made it a top priority case. The man was estimated to be between 40 and 50 years old. He was relatively tall for a Japanese man at 5 foot 11 inches and weighed about 127 pounds. He had straight gray hair that almost touched his shoulders and his blood type was O. The man was dressed in a dark blue jacket labeled Modern Sportsman Club. Underneath, he wore a large gray business shirt, a multicolor tie from Elaine Delon, and dark gray business pants. He didn't have any shoes, but his socks and underwear were from high-end luxury brands. In one of his pockets, there was a green and red handkerchief from Christian Dior as well. There were no items on him that could lead to his identification. Along with his missing teeth, the rest of them were in bad shape. Medical officials believe that he had periodontitis. In total, nine of his teeth were missing due to decay, and those that remained had cavities reaching the nerves. Medical staff noted that the man must have experienced significant pain in his life due to his dental issues. What struck investigators as peculiar was that despite his apparent wealth suggested by his clothing, he should have easily been able to afford necessary dental treatment. One of the items that police found a bit more intriguing was a clothing tag on his pants. It read, Tonori Yamamoto. When authorities approached the locals in an attempt to identify the man, none of them recognized him. After this, the case quickly went cold. The lack of DNA on the body and the absence of fingerprints on the bag contributed to the mystery, leaving investigators with very few leads. To spread awareness, various posters were distributed in the area and the case was covered in TV reports, all with the hope that someone might recognize the distinctive clothing. And at some point, authorities were more or less confident that the clothing tag Tonori Yamamoto was a fake. Yamamoto was a very common name in Japan, whereas Tonori was pretty rare. It's uncommon for adults to write their names on clothing tags except for dry cleaners and laundry services. So in an attempt to explore this lead, the police contacted thousands of dry cleaning services across Japan's Kanto and Tohoku regions. Despite the efforts, only one witness came forward after the posters were displayed. The witness recounted, I heard the sounds of fighting and screaming, followed by glass breaking. I saw some someone suspicious with blood on his hands, clothes, and face. There was the sudden noise of a car taking off and then breaking. A car was parked in a spot where nobody usually parks. That person in the wanted poster with the blazer and necktie was probably the same individual. But this witness never provided exact details such as locations and admitted to not actually seeing anything later on. So police were basically back at square one. Police were able to track down the blue jacket that the man had to 73 stores across Japan. And at the time of the body's discovery, the store had only sold 33 of these jackets. The man's pants were also extremely rare. There were 53 stores in Japan that sold those particular pants, and they have only ever sold 93 pairs. Then the futon bag where the man was in was available in 126 stores, but no sales records could be found for it. Another very strange aspect about this case is that the victim appeared very affluent, but the police never received any missing persons reports that matched the man, and the absence of his shoes hinted at the possibility that he may have been killed at home. In April of 2006, the police collected the man's DNA and compared it against Japan's DNA database, but unfortunately, no matches were found. Seeking further clues, the police exhumed his remains to create a facial reconstruction. With this sketch, police put up new billboards and posters in the area, urging anyone who might recognize him to come forward. Then in 2017, the police successfully traced the clothing tag to a dry cleaning service in the Wakaba ward of the city of Chiba located in Chiba. A prefecture. The owners of the dry cleaning business acknowledged writing the name on the clothing tag, but unfortunately, this revelation did not significantly aid the police in identifying the man. Chiba was situated two hours away from where the body was discovered. Another dry cleaning service in Ichihara, also in the Chiba prefecture, asserted that they had cleaned the pants in the past as well. Based on this information, the police strongly suspected that the man had ties to Chiba prefecture or had resided there at some point in his life. In a final effort, the police reinstated billboards and posters for the third time in the neighboring prefectures. And that's sort of where the case just left off. Sergei or Corpse 21449 was a moniker and pseudonym for a homeless man in Moscow, Russia during the late 1980s. 
Sergei was well known and liked within Moscow's homeless community, yet none of the information that he shared with everyone proved helpful in narrowing down his actual identity. On October 2016, a bystander reported the discovery of a deceased person wrapped in a blanket within a structure at Arbatskaya Square in Moscow. When police arrived, they found that the body was stiff and beginning to freeze. The person was wearing a black fur hat, two sweaters, a red t-shirt, two different socks, and a single black shoe, and they were missing several teeth. During the autopsy, medical officials estimated that the man was between 50 and 60 years old. He also had several distinctive features, including a concave-shaped nose with a scar and protruding ears. He also stood at about 5 foot 7 inches tall with a round face, gray hair, a dark blonde mustache, a gray beard, and he also had light gray eyes. There were also additional scars on his right shoulder, forearm, left knee, and forehead. The coroner noted that one of his legs had developed gangrene from frostbite suffered earlier, determining his death as natural with the time of death being the day before. When authorities attempted to identify him, they realized that this man was kind of locally famous. After learning of his death, the homeless community held a small wake for Sergei, although no one knew his real name. It was revealed that Sergei often shared details about his past and background within the homeless community. According to her, Sergei was from Tajikistan. He also studied philosophy at a university, but he never named which school and he also dropped out after a few courses. From there, he started a business where he ran a kiosk selling various items. Sergei also got married and settled in an apartment on Arbit Street. He also served time in prison after getting into a fight. This was one of the first major clues that police received. They started sweeping through old records, but they found no evidence of anyone matching Sergei's description serving a prison sentence. Sergei also later divorced and his ex-wife remarried a police officer. The couple then evicted Sergei from the apartment, which forced him to live on the streets. The lead investigator in Sergei's case considered him to be transient and speculated that he may have suffered from dromomania, an uncontrollable urge to constantly change locations rather than settle in one place for an extended period. The case did eventually go cold and Sergei was buried in a special sector in the cemetery for unidentified or unclaimed bodies. Nearly four decades have passed since the discovery of a man's skeleton on the side of the highway. The remains were found in 1985 by an individual who had pulled over along I-195 West in Fairhaven. During the initial investigation, there were little clues about the identity of the skeleton. Now retired Massachusetts State Police Detective Ken Martin said, The biggest clue we found was a tax stamp on a pack of cigarettes, which indicated the person was from Rhode Island. In an effort to get the appearance of the victim when he was alive, investigators crafted a cast of the victim's face. Detective Martin said that the image did help with gathering a number of leads, but none of them were worthwhile. After exhausting everything, the case hit a dead end. Unbeknownst to investigators, four years before this discovery, a man from Cranston had disappeared without a trace. His name was Keith Olson. Keith Olson was reported missing by his family in April 1981. Investigating his disappearance, authorities discovered that Olson had been dating a woman whose ex-boyfriend had connections to the mafia. He was last seen leaving a residence with two unidentified men. As time passed, Olson's family reluctantly assumed that he was deceased and that his body would remain undiscovered. However, it wasn't until Bristol County District Attorney Thomas Quinn III initiated the Unidentified Bodies Project that the skeleton discovered on the side of the highway would be connected to Olson's disappearance. Detective Quinn stated that detectives opted to send the unidentified remains to a forensic genetic genealogy laboratory in Texas. This confirmed that the remains were of Keith Olson, and it also turned Keith's girlfriend's ex into the prime suspect. However, he died in 2019, and it may seem that all hope is lost, but police believe he had a partner. They are still actively trying to figure out the identity of this accomplice in order to get Keith and his family the justice that they deserve. On September 12th, 1992, hunters at Norway's Hardangervida National Park stumbled upon a skeleton. Following their discovery, the police initiated an investigation. 
The skeleton was estimated to be of a person that was aged between 22 and 27. The cause of death was unknown. However, law enforcement speculated that the deceased, likely an inexperienced hiker, had gone off course and ultimately died from the exposure. This conclusion was drawn from the lack of items an experienced hiker would carry. The police estimated the time of death to be in the summer of 1991. Despite inspecting the remains, officials had trouble determining the gender of the subject, as the hip bones resembled those of a woman while the skull looked like a male's. An anthropologist conducted a facial reconstruction and the image was circulated in Norwegian newspapers. The investigation found no evidence of homicide or suicide, which made the idea of the victim dying to the elements all the more believable. The person's possessions included a 1,000 Norwegian krone banknote from 1991, plastic bags containing items such as rye bread, baking powder, small wine bottles, and water bottles all of which originated from Germany. Additionally, a roadmap of southern Norway purchased in Oslo was found. Another item was a 14-inch tall makeshift bear, which was clearly very worn out and had been repaired several times. This bear led to the individual being named Teddy Bjorn Manin. Teddy Bjorn had on Levi jeans, a brown leather jacket, hiking boots, and a poncho from Germany. The police suspected, like many other foreigners in the area, that the person might have carried a backpack. However, no such item was recovered. It's possible that it was scavenged by local wildlife. Teddy Bjorn's DNA was later retested with modern technology in 2022, which did confirm that the person was male. Now, the interesting thing about Teddy Bjorn is that he actually potentially ties into a piece of lost media as well. So in 1998, there was a German talk show called Fliege, where a female guest appeared to talk about her son, who went missing when he went on vacation in Norway. The TV station where the show appeared on has no records of such an episode though, and the actual talk show host himself also cannot remember such a moment. To some, this may seem like a major stretch, but authorities Authorities think that this missing episode is the best shot they have at identifying this man. Now, assuming the episode is real, why hasn't the woman come forward to identify the man that is likely her son? She obviously cares very deeply for him, to the point where she's going to appear on a talk show, so it's probably safe to assume that she's keeping up with unidentified remains to some degree in Norway. All that being said, there's a high likelihood that she has passed away in the years after that episode went live. On April 30th, 2009, a scout leader was supervising various scouts and children aged 6 to 8. They were volunteering to pick up trash, which was a task organized by a nature conservation group. The cleanup took place in the Vestkoen Forest in Copenhagen, Denmark. During the activity, one of the boys discovered a bone protruding from the ground. Recognizing it as a human bone, the scout leader, Mads Anderson, decided to tell the kids that it was an animal bone to prevent causing alarm. Upon returning to their base, Anderson disclosed the true nature of the discovery to the parents, prompting them to contact the police for further investigation. The police excavated the body from the ground, and while it was partially a skeleton, there was enough decomposed flesh remaining for them to extract usable fingerprints and discern visible tattoos. The individual was identified as an Asian male, estimated to be between 40 and 60 years old. Medical officials could not determine an exact time of death, but they estimated that the man had been buried for several months. He had a rather thin build and he was about 5 foot 2 inches tall. He also had short dark hair, and police labeled his clothing as special, but they never elaborated on what they meant by this. The man was missing most of his teeth, and in fact, he only had one left, thus making the use of dental records for identification rather difficult. Authorities then proceeded to try and match up the man's fingerprints into someone in their database, but this yielded no results. Along with sharing the fingerprints with Interpol, Danish police released two photos of a tattoo that said LVE. Some Danish newspapers suggested that LVE might be the name of a city or town in Cambodia, leading authorities to consider the possibility that the man was actually Cambodian. Others, however, proposed that the tattoo likely intended to convey the word love. But despite the public's involvement in trying to figure out what the tattoo meant, no conclusive results emerged. On January 9th, 2015, two hikers contacted police after discovering a body outside the town of Puerto de Samido in Spain. 
The body, wrapped in a blanket, was left near a narrow creek. After unwrapping it, the police found the man to be naked with one leg missing, which was likely taken by animals. The man measured in at about 4 foot 4 inches tall. He sported a beard and was estimated to be between 45 and 60 years old. The man also appeared very skinny. One of the most notable aspects of the man were his disproportionately long limbs and fingers along with a small head. His chest protruded outward, possibly because of pectus carinatum. His autopsy revealed more interesting details. Despite his visible ribs, it was determined that he was not starved. Furthermore, his well-shaved beard, facial hair, and well-maintained skin indicated that he had been properly cared for during his life. DNA sequencing revealed that the man may have suffered from a mild case of cocaine syndrome. Individuals with these conditions typically experience intellectual disabilities and require assistance in daily living. Given the man's good hygiene and absence of signs of malnutrition, the police inferred that he likely had at least one caretaker throughout his life. No evidence of violence was found on his body and a medical examiner concluded that the cause of death was a heart attack. Given the rarity of the condition and the distinctive physical features of the man, the police initially believed that his identification wouldn't take very long. Authorities began questioning the residents in the area where the man was found, but they couldn't really find any details about him. It seemed as though none of the locals even recognized the man. This forced the police to broaden their search to neighboring towns. Despite the expanded efforts, no one could identify the man or recall anyone with similar features. Extensive searches through local hospital records and assisted living facilities yielded no matches. With no success, the police concluded that the man was either not a local or that his family had kept his birth and existence a secret. The man was buried in a local cemetery with a blank tombstone after authorities failed to obtain more information to build on the case. Chung Eun Kim was a woman whose body was discovered on February 14, 1988. Police immediately suspected that foul play was involved. There was a high likelihood that she had died of asphyxiation. During the initial stages of the investigation, a man who is now deceased reportedly confessed to her murder. Surprisingly, despite this confession, he was never formally charged. Kim was originally from Korea, where she then moved to Georgia less than a decade before her death. And she has only recently been identified. Before October of this year, her identity was still unknown. Kim was initially discovered by a man searching for cans. He jumped into a dumpster and found himself on top of a closed duffel bag. He opened it up and immediately jumped back and ran to his car to call police. He believed that he had just discovered a body. It was rumored that there was another person who smelled what seemed to be decomposition about a week before this man found the body. Kim was wrapped up in bedding and tape before being shoved into a duffel bag. The autopsy presented challenges due to the condition of her body. Her face was unrecognizable and it was difficult to determine her race at first. Her exact cause of death was unknown, but investigators believed that asphyxiation was most likely. It may have even involved the pillow found with her remains. However, there were no signs of trauma. Early forensic sketches were acknowledged by investigators as not entirely accurate. Despite this, they did prove helpful. Some people submitted information suggesting that the woman may have been from Korea. In 1991, investigators received a phone call from a man named Johnny Young who had been a person of interest in the case since 1988. In the call, he confessed to the murder. He added that the two were also acquaintances, but this was never verified. Johnny was tracked down in New Jersey, but he denied making the phone call in the first place, and he has since passed away. Unfortunately, the remains of the victim were reportedly cremated before samples could be retained for future DNA analysis. But nevertheless, she was still identified in October 2023 as Chongun Kim, who lived in Hinesville, Georgia. This was thanks to the blanket that she was found with, which was very nicely preserved. Kim emigrated from Korea to the US in 1981. Investigators weren't able to find any evidence that proved Johnny was the killer, so they are actively looking for more leads to build on this case. This entry refers to an unsolved murder case that occurred in Inokashira Park located between Mitaka City and Musashino City. The body was meticulously cut into 20 centimeter pieces with a level of skill that is only seen in medical professionals. 
Despite some key details surrounding the crime, the incident remains unresolved. On the morning of April 23rd, 1994, a Tokyo Park worker made a gruesome discovery in Inokashira Park. While emptying the trash cans, he came across plastic bags containing severed human body parts. Police arrived on the scene and carefully examined the contents of the bags. They counted 27 pieces in total. Along with being cut precisely, the parts were also drained of blood and the bottoms of the bags had small holes poked through. The knots tying the bags also had a very unusual technique used specifically by local fishermen. Most of the fingerprints were damaged but some partial prints did remain. Investigators eventually identified the victim as a 35-year-old male architect referred to publicly as S. The victim's torso, chest, and male organs were not among the body parts found, and they were never discovered down the line either. One theory is that the culprit had put those parts in different trash bags. If this is the case, janitorial staff may have already collected those bags and brought them to the waste disposal site the day before the rest of the body was found. S was known to be an active member of a local religious group and had last spoken to an acquaintance late at night on April 22nd. His movements and communications after that point are unknown. One unreliable witness claims seeing a man matching S's description being assaulted by two unknown men near his apartment. Aside from this already shady report, there really wasn't any really good evidence out there, and eventually the case went cold. Annalise Michelle was a young woman who lived in Germany and underwent nearly 70 exorcisms in the year prior to her death. Annalise was born in 1952 in Klingenberg, Germany in a devout Catholic family. At the age of 16, she experienced her first episode of unconsciousness, which was followed by a sensation of weight pressing down on her chest. Despite consulting with medical experts, no definitive cause for her episodes was found. In 1970, Annalise's symptoms persisted, leading to the prescription of anticonvulsant medication. Two years later, another seizure struck, which just led to new prescriptions for Annalise. But despite all of the medical assistance that Annalise was getting, her condition remained a mystery. Then in 1973, Annalise's life took a disturbing turn. She said that she began to hear eerie knocking sounds in her bedroom, which her sister also heard. There were also haunting whispers which really freaked Annalise out. Annalise's mother witnessed her terrifying transformation. Her eyes began to turn black and hands morphed into grotesque claws. She was also often seen staring menacingly at a statue of the Virgin Mary. In September 1973, Annalise Michelle visited Dr. Luthi, who was a neurologist, and described experiencing horrific visions of demon faces that were tormenting her. Annalise said that she felt as if there was a devil inside of her, and she reported smelling something that had the aroma of burnt feces, which was something that many around her would also report about later on. When the doctor noticed all of the medication that Annalise was taking and not being able to identify what was wrong with her, they advised the family to consult a religious official. However, Dr. Luthi later denied ever making this recommendation. Regardless, Annalise's family searched for a priest and eventually found one named Father Alt. In November, in November, Annalise met with a psychiatrist who diagnosed her as a neurotic with possible epilepsy. Another neurologist found that she had epileptic patterns and prescribed her with Tegretol. In July 1975, Annalise's behavior worsened. She barely slept and prayed feverishly all night. And this is where her spiral gets really, really bad. She began to eat insects and even consume her own waste. She destroyed rosaries, crucifixes, and holy pictures on the walls as well. Her strength was even described as being close to superhuman. Her family claimed that Annalise threw her sister as if she were a rag doll and effortlessly squeezed an apple with one hand until fragments exploded throughout the room. At this point, people were beginning to think that she was possessed, so Annalise's family sought help from an experienced exorcist. Her first exorcism happened on September 24th, 1975, and some of her sessions were even recorded. In total, there were a little over 42 sessions, and it was believed that Annalise was dealing with at least six demons. In May 1976, Annalise's condition worsened significantly. She started banging her head against the wall and biting herself and others, prompting her family to tie her up to prevent self-harm. Annalise, despite being very frail and likely weighing under 80 pounds at the time, showed surprising strength when restrained. 
The situation became more concerning when she refused to eat, describing it as not being permitted to eat. As June 1976 rolled around, Annalise's face appeared sunken, and she even declined a doctor visit despite having a high fever. On June 30th, Annalise underwent another exorcism where she said, please, absolution. The following morning, her family discovered her lifeless in her room. Despite initially seeking medical help, Annalise eventually declined any medical attention, placing all her faith and hope for recovery in the exorcisms. At the age of 23, after enduring 67 exorcisms, she passed away due to starvation, weighing only 68 pounds at the time of her death. After her death, her parents and the two priests faced charges of negligent homicide, leading to a trial in 1978. The defense presented eyewitness testimony and submitted recordings, an idea that the court may not have taken seriously. From a non-religious standpoint, Annalise had the legal right to refuse medical treatment. This treatment could have included tranquilizing, force feeding, and electroshock therapy, all potentially against her will. A family friend testified that in 1976, months before Annalise's death, Annalise begged on her knees for them not to suggest medical attention to anyone. One doctor that visited Annalise stated that she had no external injuries, while a religious official reported several bruises, a swollen cheek, and black eyes. An autopsy revealed that Annalise had a healthy brain with no damage that could cause epileptic seizures. The court seemed rather nonchalant about the unusual dilation of Annalise's pupils and the absence of ulcers on her body, which are typically found in starvation victims. Ultimately, the court sided with the prosecution, handing down a six-month prison sentence to the four defendants, which included Annalise's parents and two priests. The sentence was suspended for three years, and they were also required to cover all court costs. The court determined that Annalise was incapable of making decisions for herself and should have been compelled to undergo medical care. Let me know what you think in the comments. Was Annalise really possessed or was she suffering from some sort of mental illness or other condition? On the morning of January 14, 1997, officials in the Tama City suburb of Tokyo responded to complaints of a manhole overflowing with sewage between two local stations. Upon arrival and removing the manhole cover, city workers encountered a sight that stopped them cold. What appeared to be a plastic mannequin figure bobbing in the bitter sludge was actually a real person. It was a woman estimated to be between 20 and 40 years of age. The overflow itself had been induced by dislodged flesh clogging drainage pipes below. An ensuing autopsy of the remains was regrettably unable to conclusively determine time or exact cause of death. However, there was clear damage to the body, including a broken nose and fractured skull, which were suffered at unknown points in time. Through dental records, investigators ultimately identified the body as 39-year-old Fukiko Yagihashi, a local kindergarten teacher who had mysteriously vanished on February 28, 1996. The night before she disappeared, Fukiko left work and went grocery shopping around 7pm at a Tama City store. It was unusual for her to miss work, so her family reported her as missing. Fukiko's house looked normal and tidy. Police also found her groceries, which included some strawberries and natto, untouched in her fridge. And there were two notable things that were missing, her purse and a diary from around 1990 to 1991. Before disappearing, Fukiko had over 7.5 million yen in savings, which is over $50,000. She had talked about visiting her hometown, but no money was withdrawn before or after she disappeared. This has been an extremely tough case to investigate. It's unclear if Fukiko had walked off alone or with someone, willingly or unwillingly. As for the old missing diary, if she was kidnapped, perhaps the culprit took it because it mentioned him. There's also the possibility that Fukiko wasn't killed the night she disappeared. While her body was found in the same clothes, her long hair had been cut short. 
Additionally, while her father stayed in her house from March 1st to April 6th, he got six strange silent calls. Since Fukiko lived about 200 meters from the manhole, some have suggested a local acquaintance killed her. Due to the location of the body, a city worker was also suspected since special tools were needed to open that manhole. The only suspect who was referred to as Mr. K fit this profile. He lived nearby, worked for the city, and knew Fukiko. Despite a weak alibi, he was eventually ruled out. Nearly three decades later, Fukiko's killer's identity is still unknown. This next entry takes us to Japan during the 1990s. One Tuesday morning, a 52-year-old fisherman named Haruo Otsu fell severely ill after drinking a few small bottles of vitamin juice when he was headed towards his local fishing spot. The beverages were purchased from a vending machine and, tragically, he passed away in a hospital the following night. Authorities soon determined the man's sudden decline in health was due to toxins added to his drinks by an unknown individual. Otsu was just one of over 40 citizens across Japan who were either killed or harmed after ingesting spiked drinks over recent months alone. This spread an immense amount of hysteria amongst locals as there was no observable pattern to see which drinks were poisoned. The most common poison used was Paraquat, which is a powerful weed killer. Many of the victims, like Otsu, drank beverages that had been laced with Paraquat. In almost all cases, the poisoned drinks were placed near or inside vending machines. And just in case you aren't aware, these vending machines are extremely common in Japan. There will be streets and neighborhoods that even have these machines. The random nature of the killings and the police's failure to catch the culprit or culprits have spread fear across the country. This also led to a wave of copycat crimes. Psychologists have identified a new type of criminal known as Yukihan in Japanese who thrives on the thrill of committing crimes. They relish the imagined suffering of their victims and feel no remorse, explained Professor Susumu Oda, who's a mental health expert at Tsukuba University in northeastern Tokyo. Soft drink companies have not disclosed any sales figures, but they claim that their sales have not been significantly impacted by the poisonings. Additionally, there are no plans to redesign soda bottles in the way that drug companies in the US created tamper-proof packaging following the Tylenol poisonings. In fact, those soda companies tend to place the blame on the victims, arguing that they should have been more careful. They point out that the seal at the base of the bottle cap must be broken first. If only consumers were more cautious, they would have noticed that the seal had been tampered with, stated Takio Mizuchi, a spokesperson for the Japan Soft Drinks Bottlers Association. In many cases, poisoned drinks were placed directly inside the vending machine's dispenser slots. Victims would insert their coins, see two bottles in the dispenser, and assume they had just gotten lucky, not considering the possibility of tampering. As a result, Mr. Mizuchi's organization has printed 1.3 million stickers to be placed on vending machines, warning customers to be cautious. As time went on, the reports of tampered drinks gradually went down, but one detective was quoted saying, The number of cases may decline from now on, but I don't think this is over. The culprit or culprits responsible for poisoning the beverages was never found. Count Xavier Dupont de Ligones is sought for the murders of his wife Agnes Hodinger, their children Thomas, Anne, and Benoit, as well as his stepson Arthur. The family resided at 55 Schumann Boulevard in an affluent neighborhood in Nantes, located on the Atlantic coast in western France. Their neighbor, Estelle, provided various services for the family, including alterations to their clothing and ironing. She frequently interacted with the family and remembered their home as vibrant and bustling. Xavier was a prosperous businessman and was known for his ease in communicating with people and his quick sense of humor. Agnes was employed at a Catholic school while their 21-year-old stepson, Arthur, attended a private Catholic college. 18-year-old Thomas was a shy individual, but he was passionate about music. 16-year-old Anne was a mail-order catalog model who also excelled academically. 13-year-old Benoit also attended the same school as her, while also having a keen interest in music. Around 2 p.m. on Monday, April 11th, 2011, Estelle noticed that the family's residence was locked. On their mailbox was also a note that instructed the mailman not to leave any mail. The blinds on their windows were also closed, which was very strange because the family always left them open even during vacations. 
After two days had passed, Estelle grew concerned and contacted the police. On Wednesday, April 13th, local law enforcement arrived to inspect the house. Noticing the locked front door and closed blinds, they enlisted a locksmith to gain entry. Once inside, they discovered that everything in the house appeared to be in order. While some bedrooms lacked sheets and a few closets were opened, the police concluded that the family had likely left voluntarily. No conspicuous signs prompted them to initiate a formal investigation at that time. Estelle was still concerned about the family and noted that all the cars except for one were present. And despite those worries, the police dismissed any wrongdoing. The following day, letters from Xavier and Agnes reached friends and family, explaining Xavier's recruitment by Americans for a covert mission against an international drug ring. Although some found the letters perplexing, the couple's esteemed reputation led many to believe their story. Xavier's brother, Bruno, trusted him based on their long-standing friendship and shared noble backgrounds, which held significant importance to Xavier's prestigious family. Xavier and Agnes, who met in the early 1980s when he was 20 and she was around 17, quickly fell in love. However, Xavier's desire for adventure led to a breakup and he embarked on various travels. Upon his return a year later, he discovered Agnes was pregnant with someone else's child. Surprisingly, Xavier chose to marry Agnes and adopt this child, which greatly defied societal norms in the area. While many of Xavier's friends and family believed the story in the letters, Agnes's family was a bit more skeptical. On April 15th, the police returned to the house for a more thorough investigation. They discovered missing photos, but nothing else suspicious. Despite the findings, or rather lack thereof, Agnes's family persisted in pressing the police, convinced that the family hadn't simply left. On April 18th, the police made their third visit, followed by a fourth the very next day. It wasn't until the sixth visit on April 21st when a police lieutenant discovered something odd under the terrace in the garden. The police dug beneath the terrace and uncovered large plastic trash bags tightly bound with tape. Inside were several bodies wrapped in blankets and duvets with small religious icons like candles or crosses placed beside each one. The first grave held the bodies of Agnes, Arthur, Benoit, and Anne, along with the family dogs. Thomas's body was found in a separate grave. However, Xavier's body remained missing, making him the prime suspect. An international warrant was issued after he was declared missing, but many friends found it impossible to believe that he could be a murderer, insisting they knew him well enough for such an act to be inconceivable. During the autopsy, officials discovered sleeping pills in the viscera of the children. Agnes, however, did not have any substances in her system. She did have a sleep apnea machine to help her fall asleep, which was shut down at 3 a.m. on either April 3rd or April 4th. Authorities think it's highly likely that she was the first victim. Following her, the children were all killed. All of the victims also died of gunshot wounds. The bullets belonged to a 22 caliber rifle. And surprisingly, when authorities asked the neighbors if they heard anything, they said that they didn't. Investigators believed that they had a highly intelligent killer on their hands. According to police, Xavier was fleeing around this time period. It did not appear that he was going very fast though. He was also not hiding. He withdrew money with his bank card and was recorded on security cameras. He also went to several restaurants and used his credit cards there as well. There was speculation that he was preparing to take his own life as family murderers sometimes do. Police believe that his flight may have been a goodbye to his past life. Some of the areas he visited were places that he and Agnes lived during the first years of their marriage. Other areas were places where their children had been born. All in all, these locations were places where he had spent happier times in his life. The last known stop he made was to Roquebrune Sir Argens, and he spent the night of April 14th at a Formula One hotel. Surveillance cameras showed him crossing the hotel parking lot carrying a bag. At the bottom of the bag was a long object. Investigators believed that it was the rifle he used to kill his family. The area where Xavier was last sighted was surrounded by cliffs and mountains, leading some to speculate that he may have walked into them and committed suicide. Initially, police were pretty fond of this theory, but after investigating the location, they found no trace of him. Despite the police's conviction that Xavier took his own life, many others entertained the idea that Xavier may have deceived everyone and managed to escape.
Megumi Yashiki and Narumi Takumi were both 19 years old when they disappeared in 1996. On May 5th, 1996, during Golden Week, two friends, Yashiki and Takumi, decided to explore the abandoned Hotel Subano in Uozu City. The hotel was located about 37 miles east of Himi City, where the two lived. Over the years, the hotel had fallen into despair and was known as a haunted spot among locals. In the early 1980s, the hotel's manager had disappeared after the hotel filed for bankruptcy. During the asset-inflated bubble economy that followed, the property and buildings were sold at auction for 35 million yen. However, with the bursting of the bubble, the hotel was abandoned and became a hangout for some local gangs and delinquents. Yashiki and Takumi had previously explored the abandoned hotel twice, and this time they came prepared. Yashiki brought a flashlight from her car, while Takumi had grabbed batteries and a pen light from her workplace. On their way to the city, they stopped at a park which was a popular hangout spot for young people near Fushiki Port. Around 10pm, they refilled their car at a gas station within Uozu City. The route to the hotel took them through a mountainous terrain after a stretch of road on National Route 8. Their last communication came in the form of a pager message from Takumi to an acquaintance of hers. It simply said, we are in Uozu. Two days after their last communication, Yashiki and Takumi's families reported them missing. In June 1997, a monthly magazine published an article about their disappearance. The article noted the absence of any personal belongings such as bloodstains or clothes around the abandoned hotel. For years, the disappearance of the two young women remained a mystery with no apparent leads. However, a breakthrough came in late 2014 when investigators learned about three potential witnesses. Police interviewed these subjects who provided a startling account of the events surrounding the disappearance. One witness recalls seeing a car with two women inside plunge from a parking lot into the sea at midnight on a major holiday in 1996. One of the witnesses said that they attempted to approach the vehicle to speak to the occupants, but the car abruptly reversed and plunged into the water. When pressed about their delay in coming forward, all three witnesses admitted to being scared and hesitant to report the incident. Acting on this new information, authorities initiated a search operation involving metal detectors and divers. Their efforts were rewarded when the submerged vehicle was located at a depth of approximately 8 meters. It was successfully retrieved from the seabed on March 4, 2020. Upon examining the car's contents, investigators discovered a credit card belonging to Yashiki. DNA analysis of the remains found inside the vehicle confirmed the identities of both Yashiki and Takumi, bringing a tragic end to the long unsolved mystery, or at least that's how it may seem initially. While police stated that they did not suspect foul play, many members of the public disagreed. There was speculation that the two young women were raped and murdered, and it was rumored that the three witnesses played a part. Some witnesses even said that these three witnesses were right outside of the abandoned hotel. Yashiki's father grew to distrust the police and said, I don't trust them or the witnesses at all. I don't know who they are. I have asked the police, but they won't tell me. Every year, around 15,000 people disappear in Poland. However, it is rare that a missing person receives such extensive media coverage as Ivona Witzterek. Her smiling face is recognized by essentially everyone in the area. There are numerous photos, CCTV recordings, and maps showing the route she took on the night she vanished circulating online. Hundreds of people are still working on her case, including police officers, friends, personal detectives, and even online sleuths who only know this girl from a photograph. One of the most striking aspects of the case is the sheer volume of information available. Ivona had recently graduated high school and eagerly awaited her university admission while planning a vacation to Spain. On July 16th, 2010, she attended a party with friends before heading to a club in Sopat. Now, it should be mentioned that she had only met these friends that she was with a month before, and at the party, an argument ensued, but the cause of this is still unknown. 
Frustrated with the argument, Ivona left with no money and a dying phone battery. She waited until dawn before embarking on a 3.7 mile journey home. She opted to walk barefoot due to the discomfort from her new heels. During the journey, Ivona texted a few people, including one of her friends named Adria. Adria was one of the friends that Ivona was with at the party and Ivona was a little bit frustrated when Adria didn't choose to join her. A little past 4am, Ivona made her final call to Adria. She she mentioned her dying phone battery, shared her location, and she said she was on her way to Adria's house instead. Because she had a bit to drink and likely didn't want to face her mom in that condition, Ivona said she planned to go to Adria's place, especially since Adria's parents were away. At that time, Adria was almost home and assured Ivona she'd leave the keys outside. Interestingly, Adria was standing close to Ivona's apartment, a fact confirmed by Ivona's stepfather who claimed to have overheard Adria talking. Because of this, Ivona's stepfather thought that Adria and Ivona were together. However, Adria clarified that he might have heard Ivona due to the speaker being on during their phone conversation. In the surveillance footage from Yalikovo Beach, it's evident that a man in a plaid shirt carrying a towel on his shoulder is walking at a distance behind the girl. To this day, his identity remains unknown, but investigators are confident that he isn't connected to Ivona's disappearance. In their opinion, the girl likely safely traversed the park and seaside boulevard, reaching her residential area. It's presumed that someone may have been waiting for her there, someone familiar who might have approached her, invited her to a car, or engaged in a conversation. However, what's certain is that she didn't make it home that morning. Her mother believed that she was at Adria's, while Adria assumed that she had gone home since the keys were left untouched. It only dawned on everyone that something had gone wrong on July 17th around 5 p.m. Investigators didn't take the case too seriously at first, thinking that Ivona had simply gone to a different party, and by the time they did take it seriously, they had already lost a valuable window to investigate. Unfortunately, any articles or sites with information about this case in English were extremely lacking, or at least the ones I found were, so I ended up translating a Japanese site. So there may be some minor details in here that are a tad confusing or worded poorly, but I tried my best to sort of fix those. In 1993, Mayumi Arashi, a 26-year-old married woman, welcomed her first daughter into the world. Soon after, she became pregnant with her second child. At barely over 5 feet tall and only weighing 86 pounds, Mayumi was a very slender woman. To provide the best care for her growing family, she decided to move back to her parents' home along with her children. This new arrangement allowed for her parents to assist her in raising her kids and provide her with the support she needed. Mayumi felt more at ease and secure in her familiar surroundings, and she dedicated the following months to nurturing her body in preparation for the arrival of her second child. Mayumi's family resided in the Sumida district of Tokyo. While living at her mother's house, Mayumi received care not only from her parents, but also from her elder sister, Yoko, who worked as a nurse at a nearby hospital. After after the birth of her second child, Mayumi opted to stay with her family for a while to recover from childbirth due to physical limitations. However, she never returned home after venturing out one fateful night. On the evening of September 2nd, 1994, at around 7pm, 27-year-old Mayumi informed her family that she was heading out to meet a former classmate from her school days. She left in a hurry and never told anyone where her exact destination was. The following day, Mayumi's sister Yoko grew concerned when her sister failed to return home overnight. She attempted to reach Mayumi by calling the classmate she mentioned, but the classmate denied having any plans to meet Mayumi the previous night. Yoko's surprise deepened as she tried various means to contact her sister, all to no avail. Mayumi's family made the collective choice to finally call police. Upon receiving the missing person's report, the police immediately initiated an investigation. Based on Yoko's description, Mayumi was last seen wearing a white printed t-shirt and a pair of casual trousers. She left her home carrying a handbag containing her keys, wallet, and credit cards. Since both of her children were at home when she left, it seemed unlikely that Mayumi intended to travel far. Notably, Yoko recalled receiving several phone calls from a man named Mr. A after Mayumi's departure. Each time he called, he asked if Mayumi was home. Yoko, who recognized Mr. A, simply informed him that Mayumi had left the house and was not currently present. 
Yoko later went through Mayumi's wardrobe in search of clues and she found a note that said, I betrayed my husband. I am dating Mr. A, but I was betrayed by Mr. A. This may be my betrayal of my husband. Punish me. I'm very sorry everyone. This Mr. A character quickly turned into a person of interest. Yoko and the police decided to visit him at his residence and confront him directly. He acknowledged having met with Mayumi on the morning of her disappearance, but he claimed that they parted ways shortly after. In a rather unsettling remark, Mr. A said, If Mayumi is indeed dead, I will end up in prison. However, when questioned, he didn't elaborate on this statement. In 2011, a show had a segment revolving around Mayumi's disappearance. Yoko was the first to be interviewed, then the father was interviewed in a different area. According to him, they didn't know anything about an affair prior and on the day that Mayumi went missing, it looked as though she was a bit preoccupied. But the most intriguing part was that during the father's interview, there was a piece of paper behind him stuck on a shelf that said, Don't believe what Yoko says. It should be stated though that there seems to be some debate on whether or not that note on the shelf is fake. Some people even suggest that this entire case is a hoax. Reason for this is because the story comes across as rather incomplete. Alyoshinka refers to what is believed to be a prematurely born female baby with many deformities. It's said that she was born in May of 1996 in Kalinovi, Russia. However, others believe this to actually be an alien. The remains were lost, but there are photos and video available online. Alyoshinka was a grayish fetus that was about 10 inches in length. Its head was hairless and had a couple of dark spots on it. Its eyes also occupied the majority of its face. Not much is known about how the remains went missing, but some people claim that they were stolen while others state that Alyoshenka's own species stopped by in a UFO and took it. One doctor that claimed to have seen the body said that it looked like a 20 to 25 week old human fetus. A study was later conducted on the Atacama skeleton which is similar to Alyoshenka in appearance. The study showed that there was an extremely high number of bone and muscle mutations. On the night of October 30th, 1982, James Adamski, who was an 18-year-old senior from Depew High School in New York, headed out for a Halloween Eve party at a local bar. He was wearing an American Gigolo costume and the bar was hosting a pay once, drink all night event. After enjoying the party, James left the bar in the early morning hours of Halloween day. He planned to go on a two mile walk back home. During his journey, he walked alongside a girl for a while before parting ways. The last known sighting of James was him walking alone on Transit Road around 3.30 a.m. When James failed to return home the next morning, the police were notified, triggering an extensive search led by Lancaster Town Police and volunteer firefighters. Despite weeks of persistent efforts, no traces of James were found. After two months of searching on December 26, 1982, rabbit hunters stumbled upon James's body in a wooded area, approximately four miles from his last known location. Strangely, he was still in his Halloween costume, buried in a makeshift grave covered with twigs and leaves. The police determined that James had been deliberately bludgeoned to death, sustaining severe blows to the forehead. Laboratory analysis of the twigs found at the scene failed to yield any fingerprints. During the investigation, the girl who had walked with James was interviewed, but she was eventually cleared of suspicion. One of them led to an argument that had occurred earlier at the bar and that James, along with others, was significantly intoxicated. Despite this information, no arrests were made and many leads turned cold, leaving the case unresolved. Despite that earlier argument, the police don't see it as a likely trigger for violence and murder. The prevailing theory is that James might have hitchhiked during his journey and whoever picked him up could be the culprit. Adding to the mystery is the fact that James was described as a friendly and easygoing young man. Friends and family spoke highly of him and doubted that he was able to get into a fight. In 2017, the Lancaster police raised the reward money to $11,000, but only two leads have emerged since then, both leading to inconclusive results. The body in the cylinder refers to a man found sealed in a metal container at an abandoned World War II bombsite in Liverpool, England. 
The container was discovered in 1945 and is commonly believed that the body was resting there for well over a decade. There is some speculation as to who the man is, but it is unknown why they were in the container. During the summer of 1943, American soldiers were clearing a World War II bomb site in Liverpool, England. While removing debris, a bulldozer unearthed a large metal cylinder partially buried in the rubble. One end of the cylinder was sealed with a steel plate while the other end was opened. The bulldozer accidentally crushed the open end during the operation. The cylinder remained unnoticed for several years, serving as a makeshift seat for locals and a playground for children. On July 13, 1945, three boys were playing with a cylinder, rolling it through the streets. One decided to see what was inside, and that's when he found part of a human skeleton. The police were called, and they used an oxyacetylene burner to open the cylinder. Inside, they discovered a complete human skeleton along with various items. The police removed the remains and took them to the mortuary. The remains belonged to an adult male approximately 6 feet tall. It's estimated that the man was between 25 and 50 years old at the time of his death, which is just an insane range to give. The left base of the skull was absent, and there was a sort of cut on his left ear, but this doesn't mean there was foul play involved. Both the head and torso were also separated upon discovery. There were also several items with the remains. These items included two diaries, seven corroded keys, and random papers. The diaries were dated 1884 and 1885, but were essentially illegible. There was also a postcard, brooch, handkerchief, a golden ring, and a number of less items strewn about. After extensive research, the coroner stated that it was impossible to establish a cause of death due to insufficient info, but when questioned as to when he believed the man died, he said it could date to the 1880s or earlier. Police eventually came upon an identity that may have been the man in the cylinder. This person's name was T.C. Williams. He ran a paint and brush manufacturer in Liverpool, but in March of 1884, he declared bankruptcy. The theory that police came up with was that TC left his family after their financial ruin and was sleeping in that cylinder. At some point, that cylinder was sealed and he died of asphyxiation. Apparently, TC's wife was buried somewhere in Liverpool, but there are no records of TC himself ever being buried. For now, it seems that TC is the most likely identity for the man in the cylinder, but this is not yet confirmed. An interesting photo from Canada, possibly taken in 1894, could be the oldest known image of Bigfoot. The photo, which shows signs of age, including a crease in the upper part, depicts a lying Sasquatch in the snow with its arms outstretched, showing its hairy hands. While the creature's face is covered by fur, some details can be seen. Snowshoes are visible at the left edge of the image, and what appears to be a fence and a building can be seen on the right side, partially hidden by the crease. The Sasquatch's feet are cropped out of the frame on the right side. The authenticity of the photo is still being debated, with some questioning its truthfulness and others supporting its legitimacy. The photo was taken by trappers in the wilderness of Western Canada, and on the back of it there is the following text. Year 1894, Yalakom River around Liliot BC Forestry, Hudson Bay Company. Allegedly, this photo was confiscated by Hudson Bay and one of the trappers actually stole it back. This led some to believe that Hudson Bay was trying to conduct some sort of cover-up in regards to Bigfoot. Ireland's Vanishing Triangle is a label referring to a number of different disappearances involving Irish women from the mid to late 1990s. The reason these cases were grouped together is due to the commonalities that they all seem to share. One such detail is that all of the women disappeared in the same general location. This area came to be known as Ireland's Vanishing Triangle. The victims' ages ranged from the late teens to 40 years, and if these were indeed all connected, then whoever was responsible made absolutely sure that they left no evidence behind. The women's names are Annie McCarrick, 26, Ava Brennan, 39, Imelda Keenan, 22, Josephine Dollard, 21, Sierra Breen, 17, Fiona Pender, 25, Fiona Sanat, 19, and Deirdre Jacob, 18. 
This list is considered unofficial, so depending on who is speaking on this topic, there may be more or less names included. Annie McCarrick went missing on March 26th, 1993 and was living in Sandy Mount. The last credible sighting of her was when she visited a post office in Enniscary, but there is also a rumored sighting of her at a pub called Johnny Fox's Pub in Glen Colin. The doorman of the business said that Annie was seen with an unknown man. What happened inside of the pub is unknown. Annie planned on having dinner at her apartment the next day with one of her friends, but when they arrived at Annie's apartment, no one answered the door. Her friends began to worry and contacted police. She was declared missing and the investigation went on for half a year with no results. Ava Brennan disappeared on July 25th, 1993, and she was known to have been depressed prior to her disappearance. The last time she was seen was when she had lunch at her parents' home. After leaving, she didn't visit or contact her parents for two whole days. This was enough to warrant a visit from her father, but when he arrived at Ava's, no one came to the door. Ava's jacket was found at a nearby pub, but nobody was able to give any information regarding her when she visited. Rumors began to spread that perhaps Ava was a victim of a man named Michael Bambrick who killed two other women. Imelda Keenan went missing on January 3rd, 1994. She was renting an apartment with her boyfriend Mark Wall and she also attended the Central Technical Institute in Waterford. One day, she left her apartment at 1.30pm and was last seen crossing the road near a doctor's office. The secretary of the office recalled seeing Imelda walking by. As for Josephine, she disappeared on November 9th, 1995. Josephine, also commonly referred to as Jojo, had recently quit a beauty therapy course after realizing that it really hindered her ability to work and go to college. On the day that Jojo went missing, she was preparing to get on a bus back home. However, she missed her ride and had to take a different bus. It is believed that she hitchhiked her way to the location of that second bus. She had several different rides that ended up placing her in Moon, where she was last seen at a payphone calling one of her friends named Mary. Although there was another unconfirmed sighting of Jojo riding in another man's car after leaving Moon, the driver was never identified and Jojo's whereabouts are still a mystery. Sierra Breen is the youngest one on this list. She went missing on February 13th, 1997 and was last seen by her mother Bernadette. Bernadette woke up at 2am in order to use the restroom. When she stepped outside of her room, she noticed that Sierra was missing. And the way the sources were worded, it sounded as though Sierra had voluntarily left the house. She made sure to leave a crack in the window so that she could climb back in. But even if she did leave of her own free will, she never returned home that night. It wasn't until 2014 where a big revelation came for the case. It took nearly two decades for a couple of witnesses to come forward and report their sightings of Sierra on the night she went missing. Then in 2015, with this new info, a 50-year-old man was arrested, but he was later released and never charged for Sierra's disappearance. Fiona Pender disappeared on August 23rd, 1996 and was last seen by her boyfriend. Fiona was seven months pregnant when she went missing. In 2008, there was a small wooden cross with her name etched onto it. It was discovered on Sleeve Boom Way, which led investigators to believe that she may have been buried in the Sleeve Boom Mountains. Deirdre Jacob disappeared on July 28th, 1998 and was living in Twickenham, London at the time. She was studying at St. Mary's University but decided to go back home for the summer. She got off of a bus to walk the rest of the way back and she was just yards away before disappearing. Several witnesses came forward to report that they saw Deirdre right in front of her house but none of them knew why she never made it in. The final disappearance that is often associated with the vanishing circle is that of Fiona Sanat. She went missing on February 8th, 1998, and she was another victim that visited a pub before disappearing. Fiona met up with her ex-boyfriend and father of her child, Sean Carroll. Sean stated that he walked Fiona home after she started complaining about some pains in her upper body and arms. The next morning, Fiona says she was still in pain, so she wanted to see her physician. But at some point on this trip to the doctors, she went missing. Now, Fiona did not have a car, so there were rumors that she may have hitchhiked her way to the doctor's office. When investigators looked into Fiona's home, they noticed that it was essentially devoid of all 
of her belongings. One detective was quoted saying, there was a complete absence of clothing and other personal items, indicating that a teenage girl and her 11 month old daughter were actually living there. Neighbors later informed police that they saw several suspicious looking black bags in front of the house. These same black bags were later found by a local farmer in his fields. Inside were documents and belongings of Fiona's. However, when the farmer found these bags, he had not yet heard of the news that Fiona had gone missing. So he thought it was just somebody dumping their trash on his farm, which was a fairly common occurrence. The farmer burned the bags as a result. In September of 2008, a memorial plaque that was cemented into a wall was stolen. The person responsible was never identified. There was a man that was suspected of possibly being the one responsible for all of these disappearances named Larry Murphy. Larry was a convicted rapist who lived near Annie, Jojo, and Deirdre when they went missing. But there has never been any evidence obtained to convict Larry. It is commonly believed that most if not all of these disappearances were the work of a serial killer. Whether they were working solo or with a partner is up for debate. The Coca-Cola murders refers to a series of poisonings in 1977 where at least three people consumed cyanide-laced Coca-Cola. And yes, this is a different case from the Paraquat murders. In fact, this takes place eight years before that. These mysterious deaths occurred in Tokyo and Osaka between January and mid-February 1977. Despite an extensive investigation, the police were never able to identify the culprit, and the statute of limitations for the cases expired in 1992. The first case was on January 3rd, 1977. A male high school student was walking home from his part-time job when he came across a sealed bottle of coke left on top of a public payphone near Shinagawa Station. He took the bottle with him and drank it at around 1am the following morning. Almost immediately, he noticed the drink tasted strange and quickly spit it out and tried to rinse his mouth with water. Unfortunately, he collapsed and was rushed to the hospital where doctors attempted to save him by pumping his stomach. However, their efforts were in vain and the student died shortly thereafter. The cause of death was determined to be cyanide poisoning. Just 600 meters north of where the student had picked up the contaminated coke bottle, the body of a 46-year-old man was discovered at 8.15 a.m. on the same morning. The man was pronounced dead at the hospital and the cause of death was also determined to be cyanide poisoning. A can of coke was found near his body which tested positive for the deadly substance. A month after the two previous poisonings on February 13th, 1977 at 6.20am, a 39 year old man found an unopened can of coke left on a public payphone at a store where he had stopped by to buy cigarettes. Unaware of the danger, he drank the beverage and immediately fell unconscious. The coke was later found to contain cyanide, the same deadly poison used in the previous cases. The man was rushed to the hospital and survived, but the incident that left him deeply traumatized. Unable to cope with the psychological impact of being targeted in this malicious act, he tragically took his own life shortly after telling his family, I'm too ashamed to face the world after falling victim despite knowing what happened earlier in Tokyo. There are a number of other cases that are sometimes mentioned alongside these three, however, those aren't 100% confirmed to be related. Many people like to believe that whoever was responsible for these poisonings was also responsible for the Paraquat murders and had a role in the group known as the Monster with 21 Faces. The Loveland Frog is a humanoid creature with frog-like features and has captivated Ohio folklore since the 1950s. Standing around 4 feet tall with green leathery skin, this creature has been sighted near the Little Miami River. While its existence has yet to be proven, the Loveland Frog continues to fascinate. In 1955, a businessman in Loveland, Ohio reported a bizarre encounter that ignited the legend of the Loveland Frog. He claimed to have seen three or four frog-like creatures, each about three feet tall, crouching under a bridge. They had a striking appearance with wrinkled heads instead of hair, uneven chests, and wide mouths without lips. One of the creatures was said to be holding a device that emitted sparks. The encounter left behind a lingering scent of alfalfa and almonds. This was the first ever reported sighting of the Loveland Frog. 
Nicole Louise Morin, born on April 1st, 1977, was the only child of Art and Jeanette Morin. At the time of her disappearance, she lived with her mother on the 20th floor of an apartment building in Toronto. Nicole was described as a cheerful and playful child who often engaged in imaginative games with her friends. On July 30th, 1985, around 11 in the morning, Nicole left her apartment to meet with a friend in the building's lobby, where the two intended to go swimming at the pool located at the back of the complex. Before leaving, she communicated with her friend through the intercom, assuring them she would be right down. However, there is some uncertainty about whether Nicole was last seen entering the elevator or walking down the hallway. Sadly, Nicole disappeared and was never seen again. Fifteen minutes after Nicole left her apartment, her friend buzzed the intercom to ask where she was. Jeanette, who ran a small childcare business from home, said Nicole had already left and might be playing with other kids at the back of the building. Unfortunately, it took Jeanette several hours to realize Nicole was missing, and she called the police around 3 p.m. The police quickly started searching the apartment building and the nearby area. While going door to door in the complex with 429 units, the police talked to a woman who claimed she saw Nicole waiting for or entering the elevator. However, after this point, no one knew where Nicole went. The police set up roadblocks in nearby neighborhoods and some police vehicles announced over speakers asking the city to keep an eye out for Nicole. The local Crime Stoppers group helped make and distribute flyers around Toronto. To this day, there's still a five-figure reward offered. Police also questioned a number of local sex offenders in the area, but none of them appear to be involved. Nicole's family and family friends were ruled out as well. It felt like the entire city of Toronto was on the lookout for Nicole. However, a peculiar detail emerged after her disappearance, a sentence in Nicole's diary that read, I'm going to disappear. Given Nicole's age of 8 and her vivid imagination, the police were unsure how to interpret it. Kids at that age often make up stories and perhaps Nicole had read something in a book or seen it on TV that influenced her thoughts organized a search for Nicole's remains using cadaver dogs in her neighborhood once again. According to a local news article, Thursday marked the first time PBMH members searched for Morin's body. The focus shifted to a park based on a potential eyewitness, a woman who claimed two years ago to have seen Morin on the morning she disappeared with a man she knew. There is a possibility that the police overlooked someone Nicole knew at the time of her disappearance or her case might be connected to others. If she is still alive today, Nicole would be in her 40s. On June 1, 1982, Joseph and Peggy Asher made their new home at the Sands Motel in Lake Wales, Florida. Having purchased a motel the previous fall, they had now assumed full control of its operations and moved into the apartment situated behind the main motel lobby. The motel had a history dating back to at least the 1950s, located just about a quarter of a mile south of State Road 60 with an attached restaurant. The Ashers appreciated the tranquility of Lake Wales in contrast to their previous residence in Sarasota. However, their time in the community would take a tragic turn. On the evening of August 10, 1982, the Ashers rented out nine rooms, expecting another routine night at the motel. However, between 9pm and midnight, an intruder armed with a small caliber handgun entered the living area behind the hotel lobby. Astonishingly, without signs of forced entry or a struggle, the assailant shot Joseph twice in the head and Peggy once at close range. The motive seemed to involve robbery. $100 was stolen from a nearby cash box. Strangely, Joseph's money in his pocket and Peggy's jewelry were left untouched. During this disturbing incident, Joseph's mother, who happened to be visiting, heard a commotion from the bedroom. Due to her hearing impairment, she couldn't discern details or possible conversations. Confused and frightened, she locked herself in the bathroom for at least an hour. Driama Barnett co-owned the restaurant nearby with her husband Bruce and they provided an account of the incident to reporters. According to her, Joseph Asher's mother locked herself in the bathroom for an hour before emerging and knocking on motel room doors, desperately seeking help. Surprisingly, the police did not arrive until 12.58 p.m. the following day. An Ohio man staying at the motel had gone to get ice around 11.15 and that's when he noticed Joseph's feet sticking out. At first, he assumed that he had simply fallen asleep there. 
but after he realized that this was a body of a deceased man, he called police immediately. Investigators believe that the murders happened between 10 p.m. and midnight. To date, only one man has ever been considered a suspect, and his name has never been revealed. Deputies claimed he had been stopped for an undisclosed reason and released a few hours before the killings. He passed a polygraph test during questioning, was released, and as far as available information suggests, no other suspects have emerged. In 1980, a woman pretending to be a social worker abducted an infant named David Ezel Blockett. A photo has been age progressed to show what he might look like at 39 years of age. David went missing from his home on December 11, 1980. On that fateful day, a woman named Mary Kelly, posing as a social worker, visited his home. She informed David's mother, Vanessa, about a sponsored event for children at Riverside Regional Medical Center. After discussing it, Vanessa agreed to let Mary take both David and his two-year-old brother, Frederick, to the gathering. Unfortunately, David never returned home. Later that day, Frederick was discovered wandering near Old Mallory Road in Hampton. Someone had placed a piece of paper with his name and address in his pocket. Reflecting on the incident as an adult, Frederick remembered being taken in a car driven by an unidentified man. In a subsequent development, a woman believed to be Mary called Vanessa inquiring about the kind of formula David took. Unfortunately, the call ended before it could be traced. It became evident that the Department of Social Services did not employ anyone named Mary, and there was no scheduled event at Riverside Regional Medical Center. Interestingly, a different mother had a similar encounter with a woman posing as a social worker a few days earlier, but she refused to let her take her baby. It is speculated that Mary may have found David through a local newspaper containing recent birth announcements. Mary Kelly was an African-American woman believed believed to be between 32 and 35 years old. She had a heavy build, large hips, and a medium complexion. She was about 5 foot 4 to 5 foot 8 inches tall and weighed around 145 to 155 pounds. A composite sketch of her has been created. In 2011, David's would-be nephews were abducted. They were later found alive and the woman who took them was determined to have been mentally ill. She was not known to the family before kidnapping the young boys. Authorities hope DNA evidence can be used to identify David's abductor. Several days after David's disappearance, a diaper bag and a leather folder were found near a parkway in Yorktown, Virginia. These items were believed to belong to Mary Kelly and contained some of David's shoes and his blanket. On April 18, 1924, the day started like any other at Chicago's Engine Company 107. However, one firefighter, Francis Levy, seemed a little off. He wasn't his usual self. No greetings, no smiles, just quietly focusing on chores around the firehouse. Later, he shared a strange feeling with his colleagues, a sense that he was going to die. However, they just shrugged it off, thinking it was just a passing remark. Around 7 p.m., a fire call came in for Curran Hall, a few blocks away. Everyone, including Levy, rushed to the scene. Engine number 5 and engine 103 were responsible for battling the flames, while on the outside, the crew from truck number 12 worked on ladders. The four-story building showed some weird anomalies. Some witnesses reported that the fires went downstairs almost like a liquid that was flowing and when it had gotten to the boxes on the stairwell, they exploded. Those fighting inside had to take turns running to the windows to breathe fresh air because at the time, they had no breathing apparatuses. 30 minutes of the fire had damaged the structure of the building too far. First, the roof collapsed, which pushed out the outer walls of the structure, causing the whole building to collapse. Those within the building had been hurt or lost their life. Within half an hour, all rescue agencies in Chicago were called in to respond. Rescuing those trapped under the building became challenging as the collapse knocked out power lines, leaving the search and rescue efforts in the dark. The tragic incident resulted in 20 firefighters being injured and 8 firefighters who lost their lives. One additional firefighter succumbed to his injuries 8 days later. 
A civilian named William Bear also tragically lost his life while attempting to help rescue trapped firefighters. Funerals for the fallen took place on the 21st, 22nd, and 23rd, with 125 firefighters officially detailed to serve as honorary escorts for the services. An investigation later revealed that the fire was intentionally set, which made it an act of arson. The fire's rapid spread, resembling flowing liquid, was attributed to the use of wood alcohol spread around the building and ignited. The individuals responsible for starting the fire were the owners of a sporting goods and novelty shop on the second floor. They were convicted of arson and murder. The tragedy unfolded because the owners sought to claim $32,000 from their insurance company. The following day, the other firefighters at the station noticed an odd stain on the half-cleaned window that Levy had been working on. In the middle of the stain was a handprint, and despite their efforts to clean it, the handprint stubbornly remained. They tried scrubbing, scraping with razors, and using various cleaning chemicals, and even hired professionals, but nothing could erase the handprint. Replacing the window outright was suggested, but many firefighters declined this idea. They felt as though the window had some sort of paranormal energy with it, and they didn't want to tamper with it. Then on April 18th, 1944, two decades after Levy and his comrades lost their lives, a paper boy inadvertently threw a newspaper, shattering the window and finally obliterating the mysterious handprint. Paula Weldon was born in 1928 and was the eldest among four daughters of a wealthy and renowned industrial engineer. While attending college, she contemplated switching her major to botany. Feeling a lack of connection with her peers, Paula sought to make her friends through various hiking groups. One Sunday afternoon, after finishing her work shift, she decided to hike part of the long trail. Despite attempting to invite friends who were unavailable, she dressed for the afternoon weather and set out with no more than the expectation of being being away for a few hours. During her trek, a group of hikers encountered her and answered some of her questions about the trail. After this interaction, she continued north and vanished. The following morning, her classmate informed school authorities, initiating a search on campus. It took a couple of days before investigators realized that she went hiking. They did an extensive search covering 10 miles of the trail and off routes. In the vicinity where Paula disappeared between 1945 and 1950, at least four other puzzling disappearances were reported. The public eventually named this location the Bennington Triangle. A variety of theories mentioned that Paula, who was reportedly in unusually high spirits, might have chosen to run away and start a new life. Some speculated she could have been meeting a secret lover and went off with him, or perhaps she suffered an injury and experienced amnesia. On a darker note, theories suggested Paula might have been depressed and possibly committed suicide, or she could have been the victim of kidnapping or murder. During the investigation, it was found that one of the last people to see Paula alive was a man residing along Harbor Road. He had a heated argument with his girlfriend when Paula walked by. It's believed that he either retired to his shack for the evening or drove his truck up the trail where Paula was headed. He misled the police on multiple occasions and became a person of interest in 1946 and again in 1952 when the case was revisited. Allegedly, he informed at least two individuals that he knew the location within a hundred feet where Paula was buried, but he later dismissed this. With no evidence of a committed crime, no discovery of a body, and no identification of forensic clues, this investigation quickly reached a dead end. Between 1917 and 1928, a terrifying illness swept across the globe. The victims, while alive and conscious, were trapped inside of their bodies. The illness was known as encephalitis lethargica or sleeping sickness. It first emerged in Europe before spreading like wildfire. It had an approximate mortality rate of 50%. Among the survivors, nearly half were left utterly paralyzed. Some were able to retain limited ability to speak, move their eyes, or even laugh, but nevertheless, they were essentially living statues. The exact cause of EL remains a mystery. One theory suggests that it's triggered by a mutated strain of Streptococcus bacteria commonly associated with sore throats. This mutated strain may have provoked an immune system attack on the brain, leading to the devastating symptoms of EL. 
Jack Frost was a 32-year-old resident of Dunmore, Pennsylvania who passed away in June 2011. His cause of death was heart arrhythmia. Despite his overall good health, his sudden death left his loved one shocked and in deep sorrow. As his friends and family eventually came to terms with the loss of Jack and returned to their normal lives, something strange began to happen. Multiple people began to receive messages from Jack's inactive email account in the months that followed. Jack's best friend, Tim Hart, was the first one to report on this. It happened in November 2011. Tim was just chilling on his couch using his laptop when out of nowhere a new email from someone named Jack Frost popped up. Tim opened it and it read, Subject line, I'm watching. Body, did you hear me? I'm at your house. Clean your effing attic. Freaked out, Hart went all over his home thinking someone might be pranking him, but he was the only one there. What made it extra creepy was that the message seemed to refer to a private chat he had with Frost a few days before he passed away. They were in Hart's messy attic and Frost was joking about the clutter. The next email was sent to Jimmy McGraw who was Jack's cousin. It said, subject line, hey Jim, body, how you doing? I knew you were gonna break your ankle, try to warn you, gotta be careful, tell rock for me, great song, huh? You're welcome. Couldn't get through to him, his email didn't work. Nobody really knew what the email's last part meant, but here's the spooky bit. McGraw had busted his ankle two weeks before getting this email, which was months after Frost passed away. Frost's family and friends tried to figure out if there was some logical reason for this, but they ended up closing the case since they couldn't figure anything out. The most obvious theory was that this was all a sick prank. Someone may have gained access to Jack's account. A lot of people who support this theory like to point out something that Jack's mother said in an interview. I saw they made some people happy, they upset some people, but I see it as people were still talking about him. Some seem to think that Jack's mother or someone else chose to fire off these emails in order to revive some attention around Jack. It's very possible that Jack's mother isn't responsible, but the culprit is most likely someone who is very close to Jack's circle. Long ago, a man named John Leary worked as a police officer in Rapid City, South Dakota. One day, he was in a mining accident that took both his arms and one eye. People began to call him a Hooky Jack because of the hooks that replaced his arms. Despite his disability, Hooky Jack continued to work as a police officer for over four decades. He was a brave and respected officer. However, he had very bad luck. In 1926, he was killed in a car accident. And ever since, there are rumors saying that he haunts a certain downtown building that is three stories tall. Apparently, at one point, he used to work in this building as a night watchman. His presence was so famous that at one point the restaurant inside of the building named itself Hooky Jack's. Various employees have reported seeing strange things and some even refuse to go to the third floor where Hooky Jack is said to live. Whether or not Hooky Jack's ghost is real, his story is a reminder of a brave man who had a lot of bad luck. Customers and staff claim to witness billiard balls moving autonomously and hear footsteps from the floor above. Furniture appears to shift without explanation and employees working alone at night occasionally report hearing voices. Despite the lack of actual evidence, there are many people who are really creeped out by the possible haunting of Hooky Jack's ghost. That is going to end this video. Thank you all so much if you actually made it to the end and I really hope you enjoyed the time here. This was the most work I've ever put into a video in the span of a couple of weeks. So if you guys don't see me upload for about another two weeks or so, I might be, that might be because I'm on a little bit of a break. But if you did get to the end here, leave behind a 100 emoji in the comments and I'll drop you a heart. I also want to give a special thank you to all of my patrons and channel members. Thank you so much to Greg, 4L60E, Adventure Ted, Colescent Carnage, Chaz It Up, Cody Grandman, Courtney Von Schriltz, Emma, Flannery Rose, John Thomas, Mars Bar 666, Maui, Owl Youp, Saucy Sofa, Schmapton Schmerica, Steve Shirovsky, Aaron the Artistic, Bad Baphomet, Beck Walls, Bennett Malillo, Bestial Darkness, Cam Haha, Sherelia Hughes, Chris, Commit Felony Feline, Koi Jones, Coyote Lord, Daniel Lemke, Derek Water. 
Waterbury, David Polgarin, David Veltman, Dim Resin, Dip Shizzle, Edwill, Eileen McRudry, Evil Dead Bread, Foley, Gary, Gino Johnstone, Giselle Sweet Moncour, Glitter Fleshgum, Grace, Halo Fan 234, Harley, Harley Deadman, Hide Wari, Jackson W, Jacob Adams, Jacoby Gilbert, J Wrecker 22, J Huds, Joseph Mulligan, Joseph Virgin, Josh Falls, Kent, Kiana, King Mog, Lady Fang, Len, Liss Electro, Mad Dog, Main Adam, Marco Espinoza, McLover, Me4, Michael Myers, Maijin, Morgan Smith, Nathan Brown, Nathan Flag, Nina Brown, Okami Fan 1 Productions, Pedro Elizondo Jr., Ray Booney, Ray, Roanch, Roto, Sally Bunce, Samili Moody, Sarah Cruder, Sarah Richardson, Shane Whitehead, She, Skylar Morris, Sophie Livingstone, Solis, Subtle Spell, Taylor, Taylor Stone King, The Hidden Eye, Teresa Headlam, Tony Swanevelt, Typical Ethan, Victor Chamil, Wilder Than Mild, Zion Edison, Minus Five Stars, Sasha Wise, Synth Runner, Astrid Yessing, Blasphemous Baphomet, Neve, Mam Sheba 101, Alan Amaro, Randvar, Afada Cthulhu, Emma Chacho, and Barely Living Dead Girl. Thank you all so much for your continued support. I really do appreciate it. And if any of you guys would like to support the Patreon or the channel memberships, there are links to them both in the description. Both of them do get you early access to all of the videos with no ads, but with the Patreon, you do get access to the exclusive TCAP Iceberg videos, which I am currently behind on, so apologies. I was supposed to upload the next part to that uh, this month, but because of the 100k video, I had to put that off for a little bit. So thank you finally to everyone who has watched this video, and thank you all again for 100k. It's a number that I just never could have imagined actually hitting. So I hope you guys all have an amazing day. Stay safe, and I'll talk to you guys all again very soon.